The main character named John tremblingly holds a paper in his hand with tests of his brain. He stands with goosebumps running all over his body and sweat dripping from his forehead. The doctor, sitting on a chair, tells him that it is better to try to be cured than to do nothing, but it is clear that these words do not give John faith. He, being in complete shock, loses the paper with the tests from his hands. John stands and looks at the doctor with complete confusion as to how he can continue to live with such an illness. Our main character is sitting in the park near the hospital and talking to his mother. She asks him how the examination went and if there was anything serious there. He, sitting in complete confusion on a bench, replies that everything is fine, his blood sugar is just a little low, and that this is quite normal, but it is clear from him that he is terribly worried and in complete confusion. After he talked to his mother, apparently she handed the phone to his sister, and she asked him when his holidays were because he missed him a lot. He, looking at the dead fly on the wet asphalt, answers him that he also misses him very much and will come tomorrow. Immediately, the joyful father tells him on the phone that they will buy fish, and tomorrow his mother will cook it, and in a joyful voice informs him that tomorrow he will come for him. Quite coldly, he answers his father, Okay, I understand, but he himself thinks that he didn't even think about telling his family about the bad news. John says that he has to get on the bus to get to the dorm. His parents worry about him and tell him to be careful, and his little sister says goodbye to him. The main character hangs up and sits in complete bewilderment what to do next with his life. John begins to get very angry. It is clear that he is in a terrible state. It is clear from him that he has aggression and confusion inside. He is angry and hits his legs with his fists. Afterwards, he sits and holds his head with his hands. He has tears. They mix with the rain. He is terribly upset and sits with a complete lack of understanding why death chose him from such a huge number of people on earth. The little sister looks at the sky and closes one eye as a drop of rain falls on her. He tells Dad that it will start raining soon. Mom picks up the dialogue and says that they can go home since they have already bought everything. A passerby sitting in an establishment sees a family wandering around the market at the moment when it starts to rain. He comes out of the establishment and shouts to John's father to go into the store, take cover and enjoy the short rain from there. His father answers that even if you sit in this cafe, you can still get sick, so it's better for them to go home and not get sick, because it really starts to rain quite heavily and you can easily get sick. A passerby standing at the exit of the cafe has come to terms with Papa John's decision and, advertising this establishment a little, says that the food there is simply excellent, while people dining in this cafe are talking behind him. He walks back in with a smile on his face, Although he has a smile on his face, it is still clear that he is slightly dissatisfied and finds John's family a little boring. He sits down at his table and asks the chef to bring him some refills. Apparently the food in the establishment really is delicious, since he already takes more than one serving. The chef answers him that he accepted the order. He continues to dine on rice with meat. His facial expression shows that he really liked the food and he eats insatiably further talking about how incomparable it is. The veins are showing on his forehead and he's sweating a little. At this moment in the kitchen, the chef kills the animal, apparently for the dish, and blood gushes out. The chief is talking to a woman. Apparently this is his wife or girlfriend. She tells him that things have been going great lately and that everything is fine with them. The dialogue continues and the chief says that all that remains is to pay off the debts. At this moment, apparently the animal does not really want to become a dish and bites the person who decided to kill him. The chef cries out in pain. He looks at his bloody hand because of the bite. It is clear from it that he is dissatisfied, of course. He was bitten quite hard by the animal, and his whole finger is now covered in blood after the bite. Sweat runs down him, and he decides to stop the bleeding with his mouth so that it will somehow stop. Meanwhile, John started bleeding, and his girlfriend, wiping the blood asks if everything is okay with him. Apparently she is worried, but on the other hand, she doesn't mind making fun of him and says that perhaps he is thinking about some vulgarities. Before the bus itself, he asks him if he got caught in the rain yesterday. She wipes away the blood, still grinning at him, whether he is thinking about something erotic or perhaps about her. He looks tired and asks her to calm down. John's sweat drips from his forehead and closes his eyes. In fact, he was remembering yesterday's conversation with the doctor and thinking about why his nose bleeds so often. 
In his head, he thinks that if he had not had brain cancer, he would have become close to this girl. It is clear that he is not indifferent to her. They get on the bus and the guys come behind him, bully him, and one of the main ones stands right behind him. The impudent man takes John by the shoulder and jerks him to the side with a sharp push. Our main character falls to the floor and, unhappy with this situation, says that it is a dog club that humiliates him at the end of each semester. The protagonist's girlfriend rushes at Tim, who acted very rudely to John, but Tim tells her that he doesn't like the way she acts and why she protects him at all. Tim's sixes begin to shout in a joyful voice that she should continue to protect her husband. From the girl's side, it looked terrible. She very impudently answers him that it is better to be his wife than him, and bats away the hand with which Tim wanted to touch her. Tim sixes indicate that she stands up for this little sucker every time, and Tim asks not to interfere because it's none of her business in his opinion. The boys also pester him with the fact that he is not worthy to be called a man, but it is not John's fault that he was born with poor health and body. John restrains his aggression and clenches his fists tightly, beads of sweat already appearing on them. It is clear that this company mocks him year after year, insults him and humiliates him, but he cannot fight back. Tim, with a cool appearance, walks past John sitting on the floor, and John thinks to himself at this moment how tired of Tim he is and how annoying he is. John apparently pulled himself together. He was tired of enduring this and he wanted to stop all this bullying. John looks at Tim with a very angry look and can no longer hold back, thinking that he doesn't have much time left. He roughly grabs him by the cheekbones. John is completely bewildered. Tim menacingly brings it towards him. John can no longer contain his aggression and snaps at Tim with angry eyes. Tim's look shows that he is very dissatisfied with John's actions and wants to do something unpleasant. He takes it and throws the main character onto the floor with all his might, so much so that John falls head on the floor and the phone flies out of his pocket. A phone falling out of a pocket shatters into pieces. We are shown the hospital, the city in which the main characters live. The news reports that people went completely crazy after eating game at a restaurant in the market. Clearly something is wrong with this restaurant. The father is worried about his son. He doesn't understand why he doesn't answer his calls. But at this moment, the mother wants the father to stop calling and just send an SMS because the son is just going home. The father is perplexed and does not understand why the third brother suddenly became so aggressive. Loud screams can be heard, and yet he recently dined in that very restaurant. The doctors are trying to calm him down, but it's clear that this is not working well. The man is incredibly aggressive. Veins have popped out on his forehead and he is behaving very strangely. The father is worried about his brother and says that the only thing they can do is stay there. The mother decided to ask what made him sick. The doctor is at a loss and does not know what exactly to answer, because in a few days he saw a lot of people with similar diseases. The father stands in complete shock and absolutely does not understand what is happening. We are shown some place with a name. Some sounds can be heard there. Now everything is becoming clear. City residents are breaking into this establishment and waiting for an explanation from the chief why after their relatives ate there, they went to the hospital with an unknown disease. One of the people is angry and begins to break down this door with something heavy, shouting in anger that he should open it. The crowd screams in anger and breaks into the establishment. After they broke down the door, they saw blood and flies all over the establishment. Something incomprehensible happened inside. The tables were overturned. There was a complete mess inside. Everything was broken. There was blood everywhere. They decided to go inside, and there a terrible stench awaited them. People were completely confused as to what could smell like that. They all looked together at the door inside the cafe. Sounds are coming from there, as if someone is eating. Absolutely all people have an absolute misunderstanding. One person from the crowd finally overcame his fear and decided to go in and check what was happening there because everyone was interested. Literally a second later, he screams in horror. We are shown a terrifying picture where someone is devouring a person with terrifying sounds. There is blood all around and there is a terrible smell of rotten meat. A dead man is lying. He apparently died a long time ago due to his condition. Flies are flying around and they are mercilessly devouring him. We are transferred to the bus in which the main character John is traveling. And from there we can hear screams that Tim would beat John harder and get rid of him already. With all his might, he hits John in the face with his fist. From this blow, the main character's nose bleeds. Tim takes him by the shirt and with a terrifying look tells him that how dare he bother him. 
John lies in very bad condition and can no longer do anything. John's friend Casey decided to intervene and began to get into the dialogue because she doesn't like everything that is happening now. She shouts at them to leave, but they answer that this is a man showdown and the boss is just teaching him a lesson. Her eyes are filled with anger. She twists the hand of one of the offenders. He begins to scream in pain. He clearly did not expect this. He begins to apologize, begs for mercy, but Casey breaks him more and more. I think this is the least he deserves. The driver is extremely dissatisfied with the situation that is happening in his cabin and asks everyone to calm down, because this is greatly distracting him. But in response, he receives a blow to the face from one of the participants in the conflict. At one unexpected moment, the bus driver does not notice the man and hits him. Along with this, the windshield also breaks. Apparently, the blow was strong. The driver slams on the brakes. All the people in the cabin are in complete shock and are thrown from side to side by such a blow. Casey tries to hold on to the seat in the cabin, but it is clear that she needs to exert a lot of strength to do this. After stopping, the driver immediately jumps out of the car and goes to see what is there in the end. Blood on the front of the car and a broken windshield. That's all that is visible. One of Tim's six screams out the window at the driver with complete dissatisfaction, and the driver is still standing in shock near the bus and absolutely does not understand how this could happen. Tim shouts from somewhere on the bus about what the driver is doing. It's clear that everyone is unhappy with what happened. John tried to hit Tim, but he did it very poorly and only grazed him a little. He looked at him with an angry look. Jack looks into his eyes and breathes heavily, blood dripping from his nose. Tim laughed and looked into the eyes of the main character with a nervous grin, urging him to look at this dog who was still fighting. Raising his hand to strike, Tim wants to deliver the decisive blow. There is a sharp knock on the window. A bloody hand with claws is visible on the surface of the glass. Tim was taken aback and was unable to complete the strike, looking at the picture in front of him. Noticing the people inside, the zombie began to scream more actively. Casey and Tim were scared and sweat started running down their faces. A man sitting on the ground watches a zombie hanging on a bus and watches the people inside the bus. The zombie noticed the victim near the bus and turned his attention to more accessible prey. Jumping off the bus, the zombie attacked the man and knocked him to the ground, sank his sharp teeth into the man's shoulder and began to eat him. The people on the bus were horrified by what they saw and, jumping out of their seats, shouted zombies who began to run away, while others stood rooted to the spot and simply looked at what was happening. Tim reacted quickly and jumped out of his seat and ran to the driver's seat. Once behind the wheel, Tim turned the ignition key. Tim sharply presses on the gas, pushing as hard as he can into the floor. The bus takes off and runs over the zombie and the man with its right wheel, crushing the zombie's head so that he definitely does not survive. Slightly slowing down, the bus travels further along the road, taking passengers further away from the scene of the incident. In the rearview mirror, you can see the silhouettes of two bodies and a trail of blood left by the wheel of this bus. Tim, looking in the mirror, thinks that they got carried away and need to return to the city. A sharp yell from a scared-to-death passenger tells Tip to look ahead. Tim looks forward and is horrified, and a small drop of sweat runs down his temple. In front of Tim, who is sitting behind the wheel in the driver's seat, a zombie's head breaks the windshield and the head penetrates the inside of the bus. Before Tim's eyes, he can see the open mouth of a zombie with its tongue hanging out and sharp teeth. Squeezing himself into a chair, Tim looks at the picture in front of him and now he is definitely convinced for himself that there is a zombie in front of him. Turning the steering wheel sharply to the left, the car makes a sharp turn, and the zombie begins to fly off the windshield. Having caught on the windshield wipers, the zombie does not fly off onto the road, but begins to climb onto the bus. The zombie begins to climb through the broken glass and reaches out with its claws towards the stunned Tim's face. After Casey is wounded by a rapier, the zombie falls immobilized into the interior of the bus. Shocked by everything that is happening, Tim turns back to find out who struck. Casey stands in a combat-ready pose, holding a rapier in front of him, and the shocked faces of the passengers can be seen behind him. Casey with one kick pushes the zombie's body into the open door of the bus, which is traveling at a decent speed. The bus simply rushes through the checkpoint at high speed. John sits in the lotus position on the floor of the bus, and looks at the screen of the phone he holds in front of him. 
the panicked screams of passengers can be heard behind him. John looks at the broken screen and his thoughts are only about one thing. Only with his loved ones, everything was fine. Tim's face was covered in blood and expressed irritation at what was happening in the cabin. A small checkpoint booth was visible in the side rearview mirror. The bus pulls into a deserted stop, and inside the bus people rejoice at their arrival. People slowly began to get off the bus to a stop where there was not a single soul. Tim was the very first one to get off the bus and began to look around, and behind him the passengers got off more slowly, and while they were talking about why it was so quiet. Casey got off the bus holding Jack's arm and walking a little behind him. Someone from the crowd of passengers shouted, pointing his index finger in front of him. Behind the glass doors, one could see the blurry silhouettes of a crowd of people. Someone was squatting on the floor in a crowd of people and holding his head. Having cheered up, the passenger began to joyfully shout that there were living people there. Taking off from his place, he ran towards that crowd of people. The first glass doors opened, letting him through, and Tim looked at what was happening and tried to stop him with words. Placing his hand on the man's shoulder, the passenger said, You won't believe what happened to us. The woman turns around with a terrible look, with red eyes. A passerby can't believe his eyes and looks at the woman in horror. Later, he notices that standing in front of him is not just one zombie woman, but a huge crowd of the same monsters. But it's too late. He can't do anything, and several inhumans attack him, one of which drives its fangs into his shoulder. The loud scream of horror he uttered spreads throughout the entire street, causing all the people to panic. Casey grabs John's hand, trying to get him as far away from the zombies as possible. Everything could have worked out, but the zombie's hand is already reaching for her neck to grab and tear it apart. Just a little more and he would have succeeded, but John manages to push her away, thereby saving her from the attack. Because of his attempt to help, John falls to the ground, hitting the car hard, leaving him in a very dangerous situation. Casey understands that they cannot remain idle, otherwise they will die. She quickly takes the sword out of her bag. John sits exhausted. The only thing he can do now is watch. Without even a second's hesitation, his girlfriend points her sword with great force towards the zombie and wounds his arm. John is very surprised for something. His gaze is not directed towards Casey. He sees a red car in front of him with his toy in the back seat. John decides to move, but with great caution so as not to fall into the eyes of one of the zombies. The front door of the red car is open. John is very happy about this and calls his mom and dad, hoping to see them inside. But coming a little closer, he sees the empty interior of the car and is clearly disappointed by this. A surprise look was directed at the seat of the car. John saw something on it. It was a phone with the screen on. He takes it in his hands and before his eyes, a correspondence with his father opens in which the last message in plain text was a call to escape. John's eyes well up with tears and he is shaking all over. He is overwhelmed with emotions, but having managed to contain them, he loudly shouts Dad, still holding the forgotten phone tightly in his hands. Suddenly, someone's child's hand grabs him by the T-shirt. John turns around and looks through his tears at the back seat of the car. All this time, his younger sister was sitting there, scared and in tears, she said, brother. Seeing her, he begins to cry even harder. John is incredibly happy to see his sister alive and reaches out to her to hug and reassure her. Meanwhile, she tells him that their parents left and did not return. They hug tightly, John strokes his sister's head. She is still crying and asks her brother how he managed to come back. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a zombie tries to attack them. He breaks the glass in the car, the fragments of which fly straight towards them. The zombie begins to reach out with his hand towards them, already climbing part of his body into the car through the broken window. It would seem that there is not much left, but Casey appears and was able to knock the monster to the ground. Her gaze is directed directly at the zombie, holding a sword in her hands. She swings it. At the same second, the tip of the sword pierces right through the monster lying on the road. John, stunned by this whole picture, looks at the beautiful and fearless Casey standing at sunset, in whose hands is the sword that saved their lives. Casey approaches the car and extends his hand towards John, who has been tightly hugging his sister all this time. There are drops of blood on the face and white t-shirt of their savior. She calls John and her little sister to come with her. They did not refuse and ran quickly in her direction. They are in a hurry, so John picks up his little sister and runs for cover. Casey understands that at this rate they will not have time to escape. 
She pushes John in the right direction. With difficulty, they all manage to crawl into the closing garage. At that very second, the garage closes with a roar, creating a safe place where they can hide from the zombies. John looks towards the door with a very tired look. He exhales with a certain feeling of relief. The glances of two guys are directed at them, who also look tired and shabby. There were many people with them in the shelter who began to discuss the horror that had happened. The zombies intend to break the glass, getting inside, and the blonde comes up with the idea to send someone to the zombies, thereby distracting them so that the rest of the people can escape to a safer place. Outrageous cries are immediately directed towards him because no one wants to die and sacrifice themselves to save others. Since no one wants to volunteer, the blonde chooses himself, who he will send to certain death and grabs Jonah's sister by the hand. Naturally, Casey and John were very outraged by this and were against his actions. But the blonde does not pay any attention to this. Like his surroundings, they are going to do something deliberate. The poor girl cries loudly and asks to be let go. John responds to her cry for help, pushes the people who were in his way and runs to save his sister. The blonde scoffs at what is happening and offers to go out to zombie John if he so badly wants them to let his little sister go. The matter does not end with ridicule. Blonde kicks John in the face and tells him that he will die along with his sister. John fell to the floor, clutching his head in pain. Out of the corner of his eye, the blonde saw danger. A sword was pointed towards him, but he quickly reacted and was able to dodge the attack with a large wooden stick. This was a disgruntled Casey who had no intention of remaining idle. Their eyes met. Casey ordered the child to be released immediately. The blonde pushed the little girl and told his friend to hold her so she wouldn't run away. The blonde struck the first blow, but Casey managed to stop him with her sword. The man advises her to give up before it's too late. While everyone is distracted by the fight, one guy offers to take advantage of the moment and quietly throw the girl out into the street, but the girl starts screaming. Other people just silently look in her direction, but are not going to help her in any way. Meanwhile, John, who is lying on the floor, begins to regain consciousness and call for his sister. He still can't get up, his thoughts filled with his bad test results. John sees pleasant and warm memories where their family is all together. They clearly look happy. He remembers the words of the doctor who told him not to give up, because it is better than doing nothing. John is very worried questions arise in his head that make him cry. Remembering the current situation, he falls into powerlessness. John gains strength, his body trembles, but he still crawls towards his little sister. As soon as she saw him, she immediately began to call her brother in the hope that he would save her. John shouts loudly that he is ready to go himself instead of her, but in his heart he understands that he does not want this at all. Surprised glances headed in his direction. Casey was the most surprised of all. John realizes that he must do this to save his sister and with a trembling body gets to his feet. In a confident tone, he orders to let his sister go, assuring that he himself can become bait for zombies. He still manages to convince everyone and return his sister. He takes her in his arms. John reassures his little sister, promising that everything will be fine and she has nothing to worry about. He tells her that he will find mom and dad and will definitely return. But the girl doesn't want him to leave and leave her. John pushes his sister away and tells Casey to take good care of her. Casey disagrees with John's decision to become bait and tries to persuade him. But John silences her by touching his index finger to her lips. He brings his finger to his lips, thereby telling him not to say another word, because it will no longer be possible to convince him. Finally, John hugs Casey and his sister and says that he loves them. Casey looks at him with worried eyes. John grabs his little sister's hand and tells her to always obey Casey from now on. He turns away from them and slowly walks towards the exit. His little sister cries after him. The guys who wanted to throw his sister away to the zombies see him off, shouting at him to go and get lost. The blonde looks at John with a very stern look. John just looked at him calmly. The blonde man swings the door open for John. John crosses the threshold beyond which he is met by a crowd of monsters who will soon pay attention to him. Casey throws the sword to John so that he has something to defend himself with. John catches it and holds it tightly in his hand. The sword gives him confidence. John directs his gaze towards a large number of zombies. Standing against a crowd of monsters, he tells himself that he must return. John begins to defend himself from the zombies, waving his sword, blood spattering everywhere. John was able to eliminate several zombies, but there are still many monsters who intend to attack him. Things are bad for him. 
He has no opportunity for a break. Fighting off one zombie, the next one immediately climbs in. Another monster, which was once human, falls on the corpses of zombies lying on the road. John's sword becomes bent from too many blows and will soon become unsuitable for use. He decides to run away from the zombies a short distance. The ugly creatures began to scream angrily and follow John. A strong hatred for them awakens in John. He looks at them with disgust. One of the monsters has his back to him. Taking advantage of the chance, John points his sword at him. The zombie turns around and looks straight at John with red eyes. John stands in a stupor because of this. The look of the zombie seemed familiar to him. It was his father turned into a zombie. But in front of him stood not his father, but a monster with greenish skin and teeth that could easily bite off human flesh. John could not hold back his tears and move from his place as the zombie slowly came closer and closer. He becomes easy prey and the zombie attacks him. John does not resist and allows the zombies to pierce his neck with their fangs. Other monsters want to bite him too. They attack our character, causing the main character to fall to the ground. He cries and remembers the image of his mother. This image corresponded to the zombie that bit off part of his flesh. John gritted his teeth in pain, tears and sweat mixed on his face. The zombies that used to be his parents continue to bite off his body piece by piece. Lying in a pool of blood, John hugs his former parents. He screams, denying what is happening, does not want to put up with all this. Tears run down his cheek as he realizes his parents are right in front of him. The zombie's hand reaches for his eyes. A little more and sharp claws will plunge right into him. This is exactly what happened. John lies powerless in his own pool of blood. All the people in the shelter are watching what is happening. Casey tries to close the little girl's eyes, but it is very difficult for her to contain her emotions. John's strength is leaving him. He can no longer hold the sword in his hands. It just lies next to his hand. Casey screams pitifully and loudly calls for John with tears. Even more zombies begin to approach the human body, eager to feast on it. The worst day in China has ended. Vultures are circling in the sky. They do not leave the corpse unattended and eat the remaining meat after the zombie. One vulture flies directly towards John with the same intention. Before landing, the bird already extends its claws to begin tearing the skin and meat. Her beak moves closer to John's pale, almost blue corpse. The vulture is ready to tear his skin. But then John grabs the bird by the neck, depriving it of its lunch. He looks at the bird with a contemptuous look, his eyes red. John found the strength to stand up. He bites the bird's neck with his sharp teeth, preventing it from moving due to its strong grip. A splash of blood almost hit his eye. He loosens his grip and throws the already dead vulture onto the ground. The bird's blood makes John vomit. He doesn't like it. All the zombies immediately turn around, and even from their faces you can understand that they are surprised. John gets to his feet. His hair became longer, his body became stronger, his nails were long, but his eyes remained human. John has only one eye left working. He wonders what happened to me. He looks up in bewilderment. John sees a black and white sky in front of him. The clouds turned gray for him. Zombie clothes are also in gray shades. Turning his attention back to the zombie, he comes to his senses. John begins to remember what and how happened. He realizes that he was eaten by zombies. But John still cannot understand how this is possible, because he was eaten by zombies, but he is still alive. He begins to walk and think how it happened. John remembers how he did nothing while the zombies bit him. Casey and his little sister, who saw his brother being killed by monsters, come to mind. John gets the idea that they urgently need to be found. He ran towards the shelter where all the people were supposed to be hiding. But what he saw horrified him. The store was destroyed. There were traces of blood everywhere. John calls his loved ones by name, hoping that they will respond. A sound caught his attention, and he looked in that direction. In front of him sat a fat zombie who was eating someone's flesh. Frightened, John did not want to believe with his own eyes that zombies were able to get inside the store. As he stood, one zombie reached towards his leg to bite him. Sharp teeth pierced John's leg. But John, as if not feeling this, headed towards another zombie. This monster sat with its back to him, not paying attention to him. John trembled from what he saw the zombie had a bandage. A bandage he recognized that belonged to Casey. John was horrified by this but his horror turned to anger and rage, so he attacked the zombies. The other monster that bit his legs had his teeth broken due to a wound that healed very quickly. John yells at the zombie that ate Casey. John wishes that it would be better if the Caseys ate him together. He calls his little sister. He is filled with anger. 
With his bare hands, John tears the zombie's skin from which a fountain of blood gushes out. His furious gaze is directed directly at the monster. John swings to hit the zombie. With his blow, he breaks all his teeth and puts his hand into the zombie's mouth. John reaches in further, telling the monster to give him back Casey's headband. With all his strength, he pulls out his hand along with the zombie headband. The floor is covered in blood. This makes a zombie fall. John tightly grips Casey's pink, bloody bandage that she was putting on her leg. He began to sweat and began to breathe heavily. In confusion, he wonders if he is a zombie. John's attention is drawn to a sound coming from boxes in the corner of the room. He decides to come closer to them. Pushing them aside, John was surprised. He saw a very frightened guy. John called him by name. The guy got scared when he saw John and started screaming zombie. John heard that zombies were very close to them and it was dangerous. The zombies tried to get close to them, climbed onto the cabinet, causing water bottles to fall on them. The guy was terrified. But John was not afraid. He swung towards the zombies. With one blow, he was able to eliminate two zombies who wanted to eat them. John's look was devastated. The guy recognized John and called out to him. John looked in his direction. But the guy was terrified. At the same moment, he is attacked by a zombie. It bit him on the neck, and the last thing he managed to say, looking towards John, was the word monster. Aaron's dead hand pointing at nothing and John standing in the shadows as if paralyzed. All wet from the water and stained with the blood of the murdered Aaron, John is shocked by what he hears. John realizes the meaning of the words of the already dead Aaron. Aaron's hand lies in a pool of blood, which mixes with a puddle of water on the asphalt. The main character takes a step, but his legs feel like they are made of cotton. He can barely stand on his feet. John's legs gave way. He fell on his knees on the asphalt and began to realize the meaning of the words spoken by the corpse. John peers at his reflection, which he sees in a pool of water with blood, and realizes that he has just been called a monster. The figures of people sitting in blood against the backdrop of a scarlet sunset seem to hint to us that the main character is part of them. John's shocked face reflected in a pool of water mixed with blood shows his complete dismay at becoming a zombie. He notices a zombie that furiously continues to eat Aaron's defenseless body. John looks at the zombie, drawing an analogy with himself, and realizes that he is not just a zombie, but a monster. Aaron's face is frozen in a grimace of a silent scream, and his glassy, no longer alive eyes in which John's reflection can be seen. John, with a sharp exhalation, realizes to himself that it's still not that bad and he can still think for now. A scream is heard from the supermarket. The zombies instinctively turn towards the scream. John clutches his head in his hands and screams at the top of his voice. A flying, cylindrical iron stick. The iron stick flew to his head and hit him right on the back of the head. From a strong blow, John begins to lose consciousness, his eyes close. He lies unconscious next to an iron stick. Some company approaches, discussing how noisy zombies are. Clint places his foot on John's head and tells the others that he may already be dead. Michael went wild and smashed the head of one of the zombies with a homemade bat while Clint descended towards the unconscious body of the main character. Clint ties John's ankles with regular rope. Stock dusts off his hands after the work done and tells the others not to get carried away, otherwise they will quickly run out of steam and be of no use. Michael grabs the bound John's legs. Michael drags the main character to the exit. We are shown a parked truck outside a closed store. He threw John behind a parked car. The main character lies on a pile of zombies and someone reports that John is the last one. Clint leaves the room. The others begin to gather and someone gave the command to leave. The main character lies unconscious with the rest of the zombies tied to the bumper of a truck. Clint grinned as he slung the metal stick over his shoulder. Approaching the truck, Clint turned to the rest of the guys and noticed that today the catch was excellent. The car took off and began to pick up speed. John's body jumped up and was dragged behind the car. After all the work done, Clint allows himself to rest a little and drives in the car with his eyes closed. While the main character is unconscious, moments from his life flash before his eyes. He remembers a moment before he was a zombie. John opens his eyes and doesn't understand where he is. He sits down on the bed and looks around the room he is in. The main character looks into another room while calling his parents. He looked into the kitchen. There was no one there, but there was a saucepan on the stove without a lid from where that pleasant smell came. John went to the pan and decided to see what was so fragrant there. 
In a saucepan, tender-looking meat was cooked, which would later turn into soup. The main character involuntarily swallowed at the sight and smell. Just at one glance, he felt hungry. John looks into the pan with fascinated eyes without taking his eyes off the meat. The hand itself, as if living its own life, reaches for the pan. Not paying attention to the fact that the broth in the pan is hot, John, with a sharp movement, puts his hand straight into the pan and grabs the meat. In John's hands, red from the heat, lie pieces of delicious meat. His eyes became crazy, his pupils shrank, his eye color darkened. John, as if distraught, began to eat meat like an animal. The mother entered the room and, looking at her son, who was sitting on his knees in front of the oven, called out to him. John, having stopped gobbling up the meat, not expecting that he would be called out, jerked and began to turn to his mother. The appearance of the main character was terrifying because he had disheveled hair, a distraught look. His eyes seemed to be filled with blood, and his claws were like those of a predator. Mom, seeing this whole picture, did not recognize her son in everything she saw and screamed at the top of her voice as a zombie. As if he had woken up, he came to his senses and he felt bad from the picture that appeared before him. The main character was disgusted. He backed away a little and could not come to his senses. His sister lay covered in blood, saying, Brother, and under her there was a huge puddle of blood, and the blood that was on his hands was also hers. Sweat started pouring out and John felt sick with the realization of his actions. He couldn't believe what he had just done, and the main character screamed at the top of his voice. Moving away from the memories, John woke up, but at the same time screaming his sister's name. The grandfather holds herbs and seasoning in his hand, and the boy is ladle and look at the screaming main character with very surprised eyes. John is all wet and doesn't understand what's happening. The atmosphere around him is like in some kind of bathhouse. The grandfather and the boy were frightened by the sight of John, so much so that the grandfather fell and dropped the leak from his hand, and he fell to the ground. The main character, standing naked under the screams of his grandfather, looks around, as if assessing the situation, but it never dawned on him what kind of place this was. Looking down, he is surprised at what is happening. John is standing in a bathtub filled with water, and there is a whole fire under the bathtub. They wanted to make soup out of it, and all sorts of spices, leeks, onions, carrots floated in the water. John looked at his hand and noted that there was a lot of onions. Hearing a loud roar, John raised his head in fear. The zombies were hanging tied to the beams, although they had homemade gags, but this did not stop them from growling. When he sees the picture, the main character's mouth involuntarily opens, and he simply does not understand what is happening here. Some kind of abandoned building, it is clear that no one has been here for a long time. Someone threw an inhaler after calling out to make sure he was caught. Even without looking in the direction of the flying inhaler, Clint easily caught it right in front of his face. Clint stands with an inhaler in his hands, and behind him the riotous guys are shouting, saying that they used to give out five pieces, but now there is only one. Fred stands. Clint has his hands pressed and looks down at the others, as if putting himself above them and Leo, adjusting his glasses, tells the crowd that the rules have changed. After these words, Fred showed his malicious smile as if mocking. Clint and Michael are surrounded by Fred's guys, but Clint stands calmly. But Michael is already on edge, and suddenly Fred demands as many as 20 zombies from them, and Michael thinks this is a vile act. Standing on the right side of Fred, Leo begins to look at them from under his glasses showing his bright, wheat-colored eyes and explains that medicine is currently the most scarce resource, and if he does not save, then even he will not get anything. Clint was already a little tired of this topic. Standing and twirling his snow-white hair on his index finger, he smiled and asked them to stop lying. Fred looks annoyed at this picture, and Clint, still with a slight smile on his face, closing his eyes, stands winding a curl of hair around his finger, and Fred asked him back in bewilderment. Fred stood in a closed position while Clint, placing his iron pipe on his shoulder, told them that he heard everything. Clint's face changed dramatically. It became angry and had an ominous aura, and he said, I know you want to deceive us. This phrase brought Fred to his boiling point, almost bursting into a scream. He said that how dare he Clint, saying that he was already pissing him off, took off and hit Fred with his pipe. Fred's people did not expect such a turn of events. No one had dared to attack their boss before. Fred's people got scared after Clint's words, 
and one of them shouted that they should not come closer, otherwise they would be killed. Fred's entire team came to their senses and decided to call out to him, but no one could move. Everyone seemed to be standing around him, and Fred, as if bending over a little, held his head with his hand where the blow was struck, closer to the temple. Fred's rage soared to the skies, and his eyes became bloodshot and a pathetic puppy sounded through his clenched teeth. In a rage, Fred raised his hand to strike, his eyes turned white, and preparing to strike, he shouted towards Clint, Die! Fred's fist flew past an unfazed Clint, who made the dodge without any problem. Clint's hand suddenly grabbed and squeezed Fred's shoulder. Clint pushed Fred effortlessly, sending him face first onto the floor. Clint, his hair in shadow but one glowing red eye visible, swung his iron pipe at Fred, who was on all fours in front of him. Dark figures of Clint, who finished hitting Fred's head with an iron pipe against a red background. Fred and Leo's men look on in shock as Fred falls unconscious after being hit by Clint with a metal pipe dripping blood. Out of breath, Clint exhales, taking the medicine, and then says that he is very sorry that he has asthma. Having taken the medicine, Clint puts the pipe on his shoulder and notes, exhaling, that sometimes it even annoys him. Gasoline was poured on Fred's evil people, and they were perplexed. Clint, wiping his pipe on Michael's t-shirt while he is silent, turns towards Fred's people and tells them that now he needs to decide with them. One of Fred's men, after examining himself and sniffing the liquid, suggested that it was gasoline. Clint stands above them looking down, but their eyes are hidden by their hair, asking, did you really think you could outplay me? And on either side of him stand his company with open bottles from which the remaining liquid is dripping. A matchbox and a match appear in Clint's hands. He carefully lights the match. The match lit up in front of Clint's face, who looked quite scary, and he said goodbye, it's time to make a barbecue out of you, to which Fred's people begged for mercy. The figure of a grandfather in a hat who not so long ago tried to cook John appears in the sharply opened door, and he calls the boss. Fred's men sit motionless in fear while Clint, with a match in his hand, turns with a silent question towards his grandfather. The grandfather's head is grabbed by a zombie's hand and dragged away before he could just say that there are zombies there. It was clear from Clint's eyes that he was surprised while someone sighed in the background. A bare-chested John appeared instead of his grandfather and asked all the people in the room about who was in charge here. Clint stood in a tense position, as if ready for anything, and looking at John, who was coming closer, he thought to himself that he was that same zombie. Clint's thoughts left him in shock, sweat pouring down his temples. He remembered how he placed his foot on John's head. From unexpected memories, a lit match falls out of Clint's hands. Clint and Jen look in silent fear at the flying match. Someone shouted that there was also gasoline here, and John's gaze was focused on the falling match into a puddle of gasoline. Something rushed past Clint at an imperceptible speed to the eye, ruffling Clint's hair with the wind. Clint froze, looking forward with his hair disheveled. Behind the motionless Clint, who simply could not imagine that what had just happened was simply impossible, stood John after he quickly caught a match flying into gasoline. From John's clasped hand, small coals fall and smoke comes out. John turns and looks at Clint's back and asks the question that he should explain himself. Clint lowered his head slightly, covered his eyes with his bangs, and thought to himself that he was a special zombie. Clint's hand squeezed the metal pipe and it no longer mattered to him that John, who stood in front of him and looked with a question in his eyes, was special. Clint, rushing from his seat, set himself the goal of knocking the main character off his feet and raised the pipe to blow at John standing in front of him. John easily stopped the metal pipe with his left hand, which was aimed at hitting him in the head. Looking up, John grasped the pipe in his hand without any effort. There was a tense silence between John, who was holding the now broken pipe in his hand, and Clint. The realization of what was happening came to Clint's head, thinking to himself that he was finished. This led him to disappointment. After Clint's pipe fell into disrepair, John threw it straight onto the floor and hit the concrete with a characteristic sound. Clint's company stood behind and only Michael decided to call him, a little afraid and stuttering. The two glared at each other, Clint opposite John. John stands in front of Clint who curses damn it. The main character looks forward with a straight face and makes a remark that he asked a question. John is surprised when Clint suddenly falls to the floor. Clint fell to the floor, bowing at the feet of the main character, shouting that he should not kill him. 
John was surprised by Clint's actions and does not understand what is happening. Clint screams as if begging for his life and says that he shouldn't have stolen it and that he made a mistake while the main character calmly approaches him. When John approached Clint, he fell down, hugging him by one leg and continued to make excuses. I made a mistake for the first time, forgive me. Clint's company was shocked by the behavior of their boss. Clint continued to beg for mercy. I will do anything for you. John looks down at everything that is happening, and words flash through his head about what the hell is happening here. John takes Clint by the scruff of the neck like a cat to put him on his feet while agreeing to their pardon. The main character, turning his head towards Clint's company, says that he needs to talk. Fred's people in gasoline and Leo sit on the sidelines watching everything and shaking with fear. John sits on the floor with his elbow on his leg, and the rest of Clint's company sits in front of him and listens to his story, while Clint sits on boxes to the side. Clint, sitting with his back to the others, greedily drinks water, and John is already finishing his story about how he became such a monster. After the pumped-up story about his life, Clint's company briefly repeated the story, as if clarifying all the details for themselves, but they did not understand how he retained consciousness. John sat and stared into space and was silent while the others tried to digest the information. An empty, crumpled water bottle, which Clint had been drinking to the phrase, God, this is so romantic, fell to the floor. Clint turned around on the boxes to face the main character and crossed his arms over his chest and spoke about sacrificing himself for the sake of his sister and lover and said, summing up, that it was cute. Raising his index finger up and looking at John, Clint said what if he told him that no one he knew was eaten that day. John couldn't believe Clint's words, but he continued and said that if they were eaten, there would be skeletons left. Clint closed his eyes and, putting his hand to his chin, continued to think that if he had not seen their remains, then most likely they were still alive. Clint opened his eyes and looked at the main character. They also became zombies. Clint's words unsettled John and he sat with his eyes wide open. People stood in front of a boiling bath and could not understand why others did not kill the zombies. They looked at the hanging zombies and talked about calling the boss. One of the zombies' rope broke. As people screamed, the zombie fell into the bath fire. The zombie's arms and legs were still tied and he squirmed in the fire, growling. The smell of burning zombie flesh reached the people and they froze. One person started drooling and said, wow, that smell. John says the zombies are screaming. Everyone turned and looked at the back of the departing main character and Clint asked where he was going. John stops and turns his head in their direction and says that he must find them. John leaving hears Clint's words about how he is going to look for them. Under the word or, Clint takes a step towards the main character. Clint smiled softly. Clint, throwing his arm over John's shoulder as if hugging him, continued to ask him to unite with him. Clint's team was shocked and one screamed. Clint, turning his head in their direction, looked with an irritated look, only producing a tisk. John remembered that Clint had knocked him out earlier, and Clint turned his head back to him. Having brushed off Clint's hand, the main character said that he did not understand why he should catch zombies, and also that he did not trust these people. Leaving, John continues, since we don't trust each other, there is no need for such proposals, and Clint, looking at his back, noticed that he was refused. Clint lowered his head until the shadow of his bangs fell on his eyes, and he looked at the figure of John, who silently left the room. Clint, who had an ominous aura about him, turned towards the one who interrupted his conversation. Twisting his hair around his finger, Clint angrily asks who allowed him to interfere in the conversation. From the impudence of such an outburst, Clint angrily hit the man who dared to interrupt their conversation. The frightened people, seeing this, tried to defend themselves against this unfortunate newcomer who had been under Fred's command for relatively little time. Satisfied with his sudden impulse to punch someone, thereby venting his anger and emotions, which had been more than enough in the last few minutes, Clint smiled victoriously. Clint was very pleased with himself, which is why he continued to smile and stare at the back of John as he walked away. John continued his vague direction down the corridor, thinking about the incident involving Clint that had happened just recently. Suddenly, John heard some sounds coming from very close to him. The main character, without thinking for a long time, sharply opened the door of the room from which mysterious sounds that interested him were coming. The protagonist's surprise knew no bounds. It was written in his gaze, which expressed nothing but surprise. 
There was a disgusting smell in the room, the source of which was scattered and dismembered corpses, of which there were a lot. Distracted from his not-so-boring activity, the unhealthy creature drew attention to the sudden guest who dared to interrupt them. Without thinking twice, it pounced on John, who continued to stand like a stone with an unreadable expression on his face. There was a lot of emotion on the protagonist's face, which indicated that he did not expect to see something like this. The stench that was in that little room quickly made its way into every room of this room, quickly reaching Clint and the others. The man who stood behind Clint decided, at his own risk, to joke about this not very pleasant smell, to which the boss rolled his eyes, knowing full well that he was surrounded by a bunch of idiots, nothing more. The guy with red hair, sensing danger, tensed in anticipation of the further actions of his opponents, whom he had not yet seen. Suddenly, a zombie's hand broke through the wooden door that was behind this guy and almost touched his face, passing just a few centimeters from him. With lightning speed, the zombie bit into the neck of the guy, who had no precious time to think about this situation. The relatives of the already dead man looked at this with outright horror and fear, which they had never experienced before in their lives. Following the first zombie that broke through, as according to the script, the rest of his relatives came to do what was destined for them. They frightened cowardly people who were afraid for their useless skins, instilling horror that was reflected on their faces. But out of nowhere, an iron pipe appeared in someone's hands and flew at great speed into someone's face. In front of the face of the guy who had previously managed to say goodbye to his life, splashes of blood poured out from a zombie that wanted to kill him. Clint himself came to the aid of this unfortunate boy, becoming a hero on a global scale. John was also trying to cope with a bunch of zombies that surrounded him. The protagonist's face showed great surprise at the realization of the incredible power these creatures possessed. With all his strength, John pushed away the zombie that tried to harm his life. The tired and distraught protagonist looked at his opponent with a proud and victorious gaze, realizing that his opponent was defeated. The zombie, from such a force of impact, noticeably weakened and sank to the floor, no longer able to resist the main character. But other zombies, without wasting their time, also continued to attack John, not giving him a single minute to rest. John, embittered with his opponents, tired of the recent battle, flew into a rage, deciding to deal with them once and for all. Clenching his fingers into a fist, the main character swung it with enormous force to strike. Taking out all his anger and rage, John hit several standing zombies with one blow. The main character, out of the corner of his eye, noticed the approach of his opponent, who was about to attack him. The zombie sought to kill the main character with incredible speed. But without having time to take even a couple of steps, it flies off at the same speed in the opposite direction. Clint came to John's aid, killing the crazed zombie with the same metal pipe. John was surprised and openly demonstrated it. He did not understand Clint's intentions. Clint on one knee continued to finish off the zombies. Rising to his starting position, Clint smiled at John, putting all his words and thoughts into this small and so necessary gesture. But these were not the last of their defeated opponents. The rest of the zombies continued to approach the main characters. Clint, posing as a great hero and at the same time a savior, prepared for a new battle, covering a rather surprised John with his back. With his back to John, Clint said something to him. John feigned resignation from Clint's position. He wanted to tell Clint something truly important, something that has been tormenting him for quite some time, which is why Clint freezes in anticipation of the question. But suddenly John and Clint hear someone screaming and screaming heading towards them. These were the surviving people of Fred and Clint, who also ran away from the maddened zombies, rushing to help the main characters. Due to the fact that John did not have time to voice what he was going to, there was irritation and rage on his face. Clint quickly took control of the situation, turning on the fool and talking complete nonsense. But the zombies do not wait and continue to approach people, showing with all their appearance their readiness for battle. Now Clint and John will fight side by side, helping each other to survive. The surviving people run to the main characters to help them cope with such a large number of zombies. Zombies surround the main characters on both sides, ready to attack. John is determined and ready for a new battle, knowing that today he will not remain a loser, because he now has a small team that will help him if his life is threatened. Meanwhile, someone is trying to make a hole in the wall to get out of the chaos that surrounded the survivors. 
It was none other than Leo himself, frantically trying to save his worthless life. The surviving people hovered near the room, hearing very strange sounds coming from it. It seemed that there was no end to the zombies. There were too many of them. They continued to attack with the same fury and horror. But John was much stronger than a bunch of these freaks who, without realizing it, were heading to certain death. He scattered them with one powerful blow. But the zombies did not give up, continuing to fight the main character. One of the zombies managed to bite into John's neck in a jump. John, without expressing any emotions or feelings, looked at this zombie who attempted to kill him. But then his face contorted into anger and rage. John grabbed the crazed zombie by the hair and began to pull him away from his neck. With all his might, John threw it aside, amazed at the impudence of this zombie. John then jumps and kicks the zombie in the face, but it continues to scream. But before he can kick him, John stops abruptly, his face expressing complete surprise. The main character has a question. Who could stop him from such an action, which brings a lot of pleasure? Lower your head, Clint. The main character sees his palms clasped together in order to stop him. Turning his head, John notices white hair that belongs to Clint, who has a death grip on the main character. The main characters shout at each other, trying to convince each other of opposing things. Clint firmly holds John's back, wrapping his arms around him, blocking him from making even the slightest movement. The iron pipe, which was abruptly thrown by Clint from the scene he saw, lies not far from them, while the main character continues to hold John. But despite this, zombies continued to attack Fred's people. No one could stop this chaos. There were too many of them. Michael, realizing the danger of the situation, hastened to warn people that they could not cope. Because Clint was distracted for just a second, a zombie suddenly appeared behind him and was about to attack. Damn it, Clint swore, looking at his opponent with a surprised look. But someone's hand grabbed the maddened zombie's head away from Clint in time. None other than John hurried to help Clint, looking him straight in the eyes with a look full of positive feelings. Clint was taken aback by this meaningful look opposite him. John squeezed the zombie's head with incredible strength, preventing the zombie from harming Clint, who in turn seemed to have so many emotions on his face at once. Clint's face was pressed against John's shoulder, causing his face to contort, and behind him, the crack of a zombie's skull could be heard, which had only seconds left. From John's face, one could understand the determination of his actions, which he was going to do to save Clint's life. Pressing as hard as possible on his opponent's skull, John tried to kill the zombie, whose blood was visible, which indicated his imminent defeat. Clint lay on the floor trying to rethink what had happened. Michael and the blonde boy stared in bewilderment at the people in front of them, mentally praying that Clint would be okay. Michael looked at Clint's legs visible from the cave, preparing himself for the best outcome. Clint screamed, slightly shocked by what he had just experienced a few seconds earlier. Staring at John, Clint tried to put together a puzzle in his head, not understanding the intentions and motives of the action of the man opposite him. John looked at Clint with a warm smile as he considered his actions. Out of breath, Michael and the fair-haired guy ran into the room to make sure Clint was safe and sound. Michael asked the fair guy to help him so that he would not stand like a stone. But suddenly he was grabbed by the same zombie who tried to kill Clint a few minutes earlier. John stepped on his foot with great force to prevent an attack on Michael. John looked at the zombie with sadness, realizing that quite recently this was a healthy person who, perhaps, had a family, friends, a job. Michael behind him understood the essence of his thoughts, and the fair-haired guy recognized his father in this zombie. The distraught zombie did not understand his actions, so he grunted something inarticulate and tried to get up to continue fighting. But suddenly, he was covered with a bottle of gasoline, which was shoved into his mouth, which is why he, not understanding this action, looked at everyone with emptiness in his eyes. John looked at him one last time, thinking about something of his own. Suddenly, John lit a match, which instantly flared up and illuminated the cave with a dim light. John remembered his long-ago conversation with this zombie, when he was a healthy person. Realizing that he is doing everything as needed, John slowly brings a burning match to the mouth of his old friend, who has a bottle of a highly flammable substance in his mouth. Everyone around is consumed by flames, which mercilessly take these creatures from the world of the living. Among the fire, the man's face is visible. It expresses horror, which will now remain on his face forever. 
John, Clint, Michael, and the blonde guy look at the fire that is consuming this room and taking these creatures with it. The fair-haired guy, realizing that he has lost the most precious and valuable thing he has, cannot restrain his emotions and begins to cry from the accumulated resentment and pain. Clint silently looks at the fire that he himself wanted to start recently, which would have killed Fred's people. John looks at what he did a few seconds earlier with regret and sorrow. The smoke from the fire continues to reach the sky, as do the souls that it took with it, leaving no chance of survival for the already dead zombies. The heroes continue to look at this. Perhaps each of them is now thinking about the same thing. After mentally saying goodbye to everyone, John turns to face Clint. Clint really wanted to help and morally support John as he passed by, who closed his eyes so as not to show even more emotion. Trying to find words of gratitude and support, Clint looked at John meaningfully. John continued to walk, listening to every word Clint said to him. Seeing no reaction from John, Clint decided to ask him about the most important thing. Clint's gaze expressed the determination of what was said. He longed to understand what exactly John wanted from him. Hearing a question that was addressed specifically to him, John stopped, not believing what he heard, and he was scrolling through possible answers in his head, so he was in no hurry to turn around and answer Clint. In a few measly seconds, Clint mentally fainted seven times, suffered three strokes, cut off his tongue, and managed to say goodbye to his life, not understanding why he blurted out this right now. Without answering his interlocutor, who was eager to know the truth, John looked at him with the most charming and sincere smile that he was capable of. And John, without calculating his strength, shoves Clint in the stomach, as if turning the entire dialogue into nothing more than a joke, thereby relegating this conversation to the future. From such a force of the blow, Clint was twisted in half. A small stream of blood gushed from his mouth, and his eyes expressed a problem on a global scale, which puzzled John a little. Michael and the fair guy were surprised by this trick and were noticeably worried about Clint's condition. John grabbed the surprised Clint's hand to help him. He then slung it over his shoulder so that he could carry it on his own without causing any discomfort to Clint, whom he had nearly injured in the last few seconds. Pleased with this prank, Clint looked at John with a smile and calmness. But suddenly for everyone, the car in which they could safely leave this territory also caught fire, depriving them of the ability to move. This undoubtedly left everyone confused and surprised, so they simply looked at the car. We have nothing to leave with. We are doomed. No one will help us. We will die. The fair guy panicked, realizing the absurdity of what had happened. Unexpectedly for everyone, Clint, who was hanging on John's shoulder, managed to slap the little guy in the face, shouting that he had no right to throw around such phrases. Michael tried to defuse the situation, calming Clint and covering the boy with his back, who, not expecting such a turn of events, began to roar again and John, accordingly, tried to calm the man screaming and screaming, cursing the little one. But out of nowhere, everyone heard a malicious laugh that Leo let out while smiling feignedly. Everyone sharply turned their attention to the new participant in this idol, certainly turning their attention to Leo. He twirled the keys to the car that belonged to him on his finger, hinting that he had a way out right in his hand. Clint looked at Leo with some contempt and distrust of his person, thinking that this could be another setup. Leo hit himself on the forehead, mentally amazed at this caution, but time waits for no one. If he doesn't hurry up right now, then soon only a name may be left of him. Leo turned to everyone present asking for help, clasping his hands together, showing that he now needed them like nothing else. Having found the car that belonged to Leo, he inserted the key and turned it. Wiping beads of sweat from his face, he realized that the car was not working properly or he would run out of gas. Looking at the other cars, Leo tried to come up with something new that would help them get out of there. Adjusting the collar of his shirt, which clearly showed his excitement, he announced to everyone that he had run out of gas. The company looked at Leo with a very unreadable look. They were mentally exhausted and very tired. Clint, with not very good intentions, approaches Leo and expresses a look full of anger and fatigue. But suddenly, Clint's eyes fall on something that will help solve his little problem with emotions. Clint hits Leo in the face with all his might, causing him in turn to fly his entire body into a small motorcycle that was standing nearby. Michael supports Clint's actions, 
while the fair-haired guy is noticeably worried about Leo's condition due to his young age. Clint and Leo shout at each other, thus venting all their hatred and hostility. Clint and Leo are distracted from their conflict by the sound of chains clanking not far from them. While the two were arguing and quarreling, John found a solution to their problem by driving a bus. All those gathered inspect the bus driven by John. Leo is the first to board it. Leo looks inside the bus to make sure it is completely clean and there are no signs of zombies inside. Finding nothing suspicious, Leo, Michael, and the fair guy board the bus in deathly silence. Michael and the blonde guy are trying to remain quiet so as not to continue the conflict that recently occurred with Clint. Leo is noticeably worried about the people who are in the same salon with him. John continues to stand outside and mysteriously looks at the moon, which has recently appeared due to the clouds finally clearing. John looks somewhere into the distance at the horizon and thinks about something of his own. Clint, also standing outside the bus, expresses his gratitude for the quick solution and for saving him, distracting John from his thoughts. John smiles at this and shows that he does this all with good intentions. Clint leaves John with a mysterious smile, entering the bus. Then we are shown other events and we see that a guy named Will is running as fast as he can, trying to escape from the zombie that is catching up with him. The unconscious creature continues to chase the guy in order to commit lynching on the man. Will runs into a trap that he himself invented and built to fight such unhealthy creatures. A whole crowd of zombies is chasing behind Will, trying to catch up with him and kill him. Will falls to the ground, showing the zombie that he is defenseless and unarmed, so that the zombie woman would quickly jump after him and do what she had been chasing him for all this time. The zombie does exactly what Will originally intended, she did exactly the same as a hundred others before her. Will smiles at the genius and resourcefulness of his well-thought-out plan that will help get rid of at least a handful of zombies. The zombie raises his hand to strike to kill the man who lies a few centimeters away from her. At this moment, Will jumps to the side to prevent the zombie from killing him, and meanwhile the zombie falls to the ground. Will looks with hatred at the zombies surrounding him, not understanding how humanity could have come to this. A crowd of zombies, understanding absolutely nothing, go to their target, but are deeply mistaken, thinking that in the next moment they will kill him. With one wave of his hand, the hero strikes a match and throws it on the ground, which has been doused with gasoline in advance. All zombies in an instant find themselves in flames which will take their souls. Will looks at the fruit of his labors, at the fire and at the once healthy people who are now being burned alive. The human settlement Will lives with thanks him for his work and his well-thought-out plan. Uncomprehending zombies continue to scream from the fire. All the zombies burned alive in the fire, leaving behind ashes and clothes. Someone's stew of soup is being cooked in the kitchen, which is about to begin to boil, captivating with its delicious aroma. The village head pours soup and pieces of meat into a bowl. Fred, with a sick smile on his face, drags the little girl by the hand who is crying and resisting him with all her might. Fred and the prefect talk to each other, mentioning something about having a nice day. In the dungeon, there are other very frightened people who do not understand the reason for being here. Fred kicks the dungeon's front door to enter. Mothers hold their babies close to them. They look tired and scared. People are very frightened and do not understand the essence of what is happening and the reason for the visit. Fred drags the little girl towards a bowl of stew, who in turn resists. A girl is forcibly stuffed with a human organ, thereby conducting an experiment on whether it is possible to eat it. The girl, overcoming her disgust, tries to chew what was forcibly shoved into her. Fred and the headman carefully monitor the girl's reaction. Continuing to cry and scream loudly, she was still able to swallow this organ. Fred and the others rejoice over the success of the experiment. This stew is poured into bowls to feed other people. All people pounced on food, which is in such short supply during these difficult times. The girl continues to cry and does not fully understand what is happening in the world now. A wonderful night, a beautiful crescent-shaped moon, its pale light and a cool breeze in the middle of the forest, which develops the crowns of the trees, scattering leaves to the ground. John drags an entire bus on his hump as easily as if a small child were playing with cars. The dead man was suddenly alarmed by something as if his heart was beating faster. He is perplexed by certain sounds that only he can probably hear. Clint notices something strange in John's behavior and tries to ask about it, waiting for an answer from his silent friend. John sharply turned his gaze to the side with his wounded eye. 
Now he certainly paid attention to something more important. The sky is painted in bloody shades. The light and pleasant atmosphere instantly becomes tense, as if the sky is falling on everyone's head. It's not without reason that the atmosphere has become so tense. Crowds of hungry creatures are following the bus without reason. What a horror it is to meet these monsters in the middle of a dark forest. Their skin is already peeling off. It is gray like ashes after a fire. But one thing definitely distinguishes them from ashes. Unfortunately, they will not be scattered by the wind to the four cardinal directions. Clint noticed the threat. He was very scared as such a crowd was approaching them. John demands that Clint and everyone get on the bus without making unnecessary noises. Bus passengers are in a panic. Some have already lost hope for the future and can only wipe the condensation from their glasses. John went to scout the situation for zombies and how they would react to him. The dead were already on their heels, but something haunts them. Their goal. They are looking in a completely different direction. If they were hostile, they attacked our hero at that very second. The creatures passed John by as if they were their own relative. Apparently, they only hunt people, which is both bad and good, since this can be used by pretending to be someone other than a person. John was amazed. They walked around him, continuing on their way, as if he were a spirit to them, unreasonable creatures over whom some virus had taken possession. The danger passed them. It was even some kind of impudence on their part. John was already preparing for battle, and they brazenly bypassed him. Michael can't believe they just left without taking a bite out of each one. Clint calls out to John again, who finally pays attention to him. He decided to mock his dead friend and says that other dead people put themselves above him. One of the subordinates suddenly screams and points in the direction of the zombie. Everyone paid attention to their friend's announcement, and it really was something worthwhile. The dead were heading towards a village inhabited by people, which foreshadowed the worst consequences. The crowd of dead people found a more interesting target than a small bus and decided to wipe even a small village into dust. Leo hopes that they will not be able to decide to follow them, which is why he is shaking as if in the bitter cold. Clint is not happy that the dead are heading to the village and he needs to make a decision quickly, otherwise it will be too late. John knocks on the bus window and asks them to take their seats and secure themselves well. He grabs the steel chain with his blackened hands and prepares all his strength for an instant jerk. John's last phrase makes even the most fearless tense, as he has planned something that should bring them to the village in a matter of seconds. Everyone buckled up tighter because perhaps for them this is a one-way ticket, a destination. John only forgot to hand over the fare but did not forget to take care of their safety, that everyone was wearing their seat belts, and that no one needed to get out. Their eyes had left their sockets. No seatbelt could save them from such a trip. John runs with a bus behind his back. Such strength is very frightening, and the speed is amazing over and over again. The bus finally stopped floating in the air and descended to the ground. The hero has a serious intention and will destroy any obstacle in front of him, raising it to the ground. The dead turned out to be a bad obstacle for our hero, and each of them sets off on his last flight. A cloud of smoke rises into the sky. Now the apocalypse has begun to somehow manifest itself. The flame-like inferno flared up in the hayloft, releasing clouds of smoky smoke. The dead still reach the village earlier, which is not good. People greedily eat meat that is somewhat similar to the meat of the dead. And this is even worse than a regular zombie attack. The absorption of such food bears its harmful fruits, just as the most powerful drug turns the brain into mush and the body into a shell. The stinking meat of the dead attracts with its smell and forces its victim to enjoy food for the last time, gaining unimaginable strength, and the mind is placed in a wooden box and under the ground. One of the madmen between meals turns his attention to someone standing next to him. He smiles like crazy at his guest whom he has not seen for a long time. A madman brings part of his dinner to a certain boss like a servant. The boss does not refuse the local delicacy in the form of dead man's meat, which destroys the very personality in a person. After this, it is better to expect a finale in the form of a rope, soap, and a stool. The mysterious boss turned out to be John's longtime abuser, Tim, and even here he causes mischief by forcing his subordinates to eat zombie meat. The sycophant smelled thoroughly of the roasted meat of the dead, mixing this vile smell with his sweat. Something distracted our badass from his meal, and it might be worth reminding us that zombies are already on our heels. Tim notices that among the flames of the inferno, 
the dead are rising from the lands, eager to absorb more and more flesh. The boss immediately scolded his subordinate. A bowl of soup was smashed into pieces, and one blow knocked down an adult man. First of all, you need to escape from a crowd of zombies, but this is not about Tim who needs to beat up his subordinate. He sends him to close the door from the dead, but realizes that this is the wrong choice and death is inevitable. The monster's fangs are sharpened like a razor, and as soon as they get close to the victim, they will not leave a living place on it. The fat man understands the danger of his actions, but does not even try to run away, and then looks at his future death. He calls Tim, hoping for help from him, but one cannot expect much from such people. Tim pointed his crossbow at his ally. He is a born leader, but also a tyrant. Even if he forces himself to be hated, he plays the role of a villain perfectly. No matter how self-confident and cool-blooded he is, anxiety is visible on his face, mostly for his life. The fat man can only agree with his master's decision, distracting the dead from the boss himself, as Tim sacrifices pawns. The fat man points his hand towards the door, and because of fear, his whole body trembles, as if a current had been sent through his veins. He was captured and he is unlikely to escape from the clutches of death or even do anything at all. He has no choice but to scream at the top of his voice in the hope of salvation. The dead hand grabbed the fat man and the rest of the dead will not be left without lunch, so they will probably break off a tasty morsel from the fleshy man. Screams spread throughout the entire room, but this will not help him in any way, after being bitten by a zombie, either being eaten or becoming the walking dead. The fat man no longer has a future because of his greedy, arrogant, and unscrupulous boss. His eyes are full of sadness. His face is filled with fear and pain. Now he realized that his world is plastic, a world of substitutes. His boss is a rare freak who cares only for his life. The others are just finishing their meal when his ally is devoured by vile creatures and is already heading towards them. Screams and screams filled all the empty space inside and outside the room. Tim continues to despise the fat man, although he briefly delayed the zombies at the cost of his life, and those seconds that he delayed for them could save many lives. Incredibly, John's little sister is alive, but how long will it last, since the zombie is already looking at her, and she can only tremble with fear and cry? Tim's cruelty and terrible temper are striking, which forces him to do the dirtiest things. John seems to have heard his little sister and is rushing towards her at full speed in order to save her from the clutches of the evil dead. He throws the bus around in an attempt to stop it, but it seems like the passengers won't be happy with the ride. The roar that John creates spreads over a long distance. John finally managed to get the attention of his brothers, and maybe now they will start attacking him and he won't have to chase them. John's shadow, which did not appear against the background of the pale moonlight, is gradually approaching his enemies. The dead also glare at him, waiting for the moment to attack and instantly kill. The silhouette has appeared, and the monsters don't even know which monster they contacted. The monsters are already on the way, and John is just beginning to prepare a deadly attack for them. They surrounded him. What would he do? What would come into the head of a reasonable zombie? He grabs the chain, probably preparing to attack the bus, no matter how harmful it would be for the passengers. John instantly spread his legs in different directions and prepared a stance for an attack. He easily swings the chain and the bus will move any minute and destroy a couple of dead people's lives. Even the dead faces of the zombies showed fear, which appeared due to the impending danger. John is so powerful that he sent a couple of already dead creatures to the Guardian of the Scales, where they are destined to burn to the ground. He grabs the chain with both hands, which suggests that the creatures and passengers were very unlucky to be nearby. Here it is, a look that destroys all the hopes of enemies, that burns the retina to ashes. A Ferris wheel for Clint and the whole gang, as well as a wheel of fortune for the mind-dead creatures. Those who were lucky survived. John screamed loudly enough to strike fear into even the most fearless of the dead. Blood, stones, and monster carcasses soared into the sky. That's how strong John was after his transformation. A cloud of dust floats above the ground and blocks the view of the remaining enemies. He lets go of the chain, indicating that the ride is over for Clint. One warrior in the field, one for all the walking corpses. The only one who became a walking corpse and remained intelligent, having received incredible strength, vitality, and immunity to zombie bites. The bus was completely destroyed, as if it had been in the most dangerous accident. John asks the survivors not to be afraid of him, since he is the only peaceful zombie on the entire earth.
People continue to shower him with lantern light and no longer trust him, since it is unusual for a zombie to be adequate. The light blinds our hero, but thank God he is prudent and not like Tim, his complete opposite, an angel and a demon, a cat and a dog, fire and water. John asks to stop shining the flashlight at him, as it really annoyed him, and he would have continued to shine it if you hadn't told him. The flashlight fell to the ground and scattered the light around, which is good in the middle of the night. The man's eyes are full of fear, because of which he dropped the flashlight and is probably holding on with heaviness from minute to minute, screaming to run to somewhere far away from here. The dead gaze in John's once-dead body strikes terror even into the rescued people. Everyone fled in different directions, and it really hurts when people judge you with prejudice, when you are reasonable, and they call you a monster, when those whom you saved run away from you. John remained silent, but he definitely didn't like this attitude, even if they can be understood, but it's also impossible to be so biased. Clint and the whole team have endured a real nightmare, and they are not at all happy with such trips. John steps in his red sneakers towards the village. One of the previously familiar club of our hero's offenders, who bullied our hero, is now asking for help, as far as the situation changes people. He tries to save himself and asks John not to attack him so hopeless and weak. John has one goal, because he understands that if his offenders are nearby, then his only remaining relatives and friends are also nearby, and he should hurry, since his sister is already on the knife's edge. He enters a dark room in a village, shrouded in mystery and darkness. John's gigantic shadow fell on his sister, whose tears even created bruises under her eyes. What horror she experienced. It's hard to imagine what wounds on her soul were lodged deep in her heart. He calls her name, tries to approach, but what will be her reaction when she sees her brother, a massive zombie, in his place? John tries to reach out his hand to his little sweet sister. She reacts like a real person. Screams and screams are typical on her part, since she has already seen a lot, and the dead man is also reaching out to her. He was frightened by this reaction, for sure. He could not expect that the last person close to him would reject him. The hand stops abruptly. The tension has increased and it is unlikely that anyone after this could hold back his tears, which filled his eyes with constant moisture after such an attitude as if the sun was going out. He is in shock. His face is filled with despair. His body is constrained, even in the body of a dead man. Human emotions, feelings, and affection for his loved one do not leave him. The little sister continues to scream and ask for salvation, calling for her brother, who is standing right in front of her. John is full of uncertainty, but still tries to convince his little sister. The pupils shrank to the smallest size, his fear for losing his little sister when she is right in front of him, when he saved her and he can touch her. His legs give way, he cannot react in any other way to how his own sister and his love reject him, and his devotion is amazing, since even his health is at risk when he is so worried about his loved ones. The body aches and the heart is pierced through. This is the most terrible feeling for a person, because no matter how strong you are, it destroys you from the inside. He is already ready to fall. The strength leaves his legs, and a stone falls on his soul, which proves his humanity. John was knocked to his knees. As before execution, his head was put under the blade by the most cruel executioner, a dear man, because he can heal any wound, but also deal the deepest blow, cutting his head off his shoulders. The atmosphere is overwhelming. The soul leaves even the deadest zombie. She is small, defenseless, and a real crybaby, but her willpower can be envied since she did not lose hope for her brother's life and believed to the end, although she saw his death with her own eyes. John justifies her fear by saying that he is similar to a ghost, which is why she experiences fear. He continues to make excuses for her, but all this is for her sake. The poor girl huddled in a corner so that no creature could touch him, so that her brother could save her. How much horror they experienced, John, who was eaten by his own parents, his little sister, who survived the death of her parents and the indirect death of her brother. He hates himself for his weakness and promises himself that he will never hurt his family again. Her tears stopped. She probably realized who was in front of her, and this should make her very happy. Her gaze cleared. All kinds of shock were written in her eyes. The tears froze and evaporated against the backdrop of shock, like a second wind for her. She saw in this dead man John, her brother, her dear one, her only joy, like a sip of water in the desert. Pale, overgrown, but still reasonable, 
a brother who will stand up as a wall for his little sister. She finally decides to take the first steps towards her brother, who has been missing for such a long time. The dew on the cheeks begins to evaporate. The atmosphere is painted with new, brightest colors. The little sister touched her brother as if he were a strange animal, as if he had appeared at the most unexpected moment. And John's face changed. His gray world became colored and his loved one colored it, like that same old song that gives the most vivid old memories that I would like to return to for a few minutes or think about it. Truly childlike joy on her part, the most sincere joy a person can experience. Her shock cannot be measured since she is already talking about herself in the third person. He too tries to hug his dear one with his rotten arms. He hugs her with all his might and promises to never leave her again. Clint puts his hand on John's shoulder and interrupts the long-awaited reunion of brother and sister that might not have happened. He is not trying to distract them from the reunion, but wants to warn them about something very important that should interrupt the celebration of John and his sister. Those who ate the flesh of the dead began their transformation, as evidenced by itching, pain, and a strange cough. One of the Allies notices all the most important things over and over again, the most far-sighted in the whole team. He pointed to the man who was crushed by a stone and his leg was definitely not feeling well. He was trembling all over and holding himself up with heaviness. John entrusts custody of his sister to his friend Clint and asks him to look after her so that he can look after that guy. The girl continues to worry about her brother and does not glance in the other direction so as not to lose sight of him so that he does not get lost over the horizon. John approaches the man with every step in order to examine him and identify what is happening to him. The man's face has already fallen. He is clearly not feeling well, but John still naively questions him in the hope that he is in good condition. His teeth are sharpening, but the man can only talk about meat. His transformation into a dead man continues and the danger is the same. Copious discharge emanates from the mouth, as if the reaction of a bear to honey and a dead man to living meat, the most animal instincts awaken in him. John was shocked. A zombie, a creature from his worst nightmares, awakened before his eyes. Such a transformation is very frightening. The virus alone changes everything in a person, from appearance to personality, which disappears under the pressure of the parasitic virus. Clint pointed out that the man was mutated and shouted after John to be careful. John's reaction was lightning fast. He instantly reacted to the dead man's attack and slammed his face into the ground. Such a blow should leave a seal on the ground, and the stone should split. John looked at the dead man with some anger and was ready to grind him into powder. He orders to take cover in front and move further to reconnoiter the situation further down the road. They agree with his order, and they should hurry up, since he is the boss of the entire gang of dead meat-eaters. Clint calls everyone together to find shelter from the zombies as quickly as possible. Walking corpses are already gathering behind the destroyed wall, and the rest need to hurry. Otherwise, John alone will not be able to save everyone, no matter how strong he is. The dead can still speak, but their words seem to be programmed, and they can only endlessly beg for food, as if their stomach is a pit of burning waste. All food burns within a second. John still holds the head of his enemy, but even after such a blow he shows signs of life, even such a strong blow could not extinguish the torch in his life. John noticed his vitality, which makes each dead person much more dangerous and makes him the highest stage of evolution. The face of a dead man is immersed in the ground where he should have been waiting for a long time, but the evil virus makes a doll out of him for its reproduction, to obtain energy and protection. As soon as you relax, a mouthful of sharp teeth flies at you, biting through metal and crushing stone into dust. John is not so weak and easily stops his own kind, grabbing his head to carry out the execution. He is terribly annoyed by the behavior of the dead, how they attack without even figuring out who their enemy is and how strong he is, so to speak, they get into trouble. With one movement of his hands, John sends the zombies to the next world, quite ironically, to die twice in their lives, where one of the lives is simply a mindless consumption of meat. John is truly special. He is not a human, but he is not a zombie either. But on the contrary, Many factors make him different from everyone else and set him apart in the same way. There are really a lot of dead people already and they were all once people, but their heads were enslaved by a virus and it is unclear whether they are in pain. John notices that the situation is heating up and he needs to hurry to everyone. One of all the madmen has not yet turned, but if he ate meat, 
then he did not have long to live. There are already many rotting spots on his body, and enslaving his mind to the virus is not long and not difficult. He asks our John for help, but where is his boss, whom he trusted so much, yet the man will lie under everyone in order to survive? John has one goal and he needs to move towards his team. No little thing will stop him. Tim is so terrible that he experimented on his subordinates, forcing them to eat the meat of the dead, which leads to even greater devastation and allows the virus to spread more. It's already hard for a man to ask for help. His mind becomes cloudy, as if from the largest dose of a drug. A parasitic virus enslaves the mind to the end, leaving only a shell. His face depicts fear, pain, and despair. His half-rotten face personifies all his emotions. Before and after, a second decided the future life of a once man, now a walking corpse. Now he is like a mad dog who just wants to bite off a fresh piece of meat. John is greatly annoyed by such a terrible virus that plunges this world into the abyss of despair, a virus that separates a person from his loved ones. And so suddenly, he turned to his enemies, showing them at least some respect. The situation is so hopeless for every eater of the dead meat they enjoyed until the end of their deaths. The dead man rushes at John, but only seconds ago he asked for help, and it was him who John should have helped. He, as the arbiter of justice, wonders whether he deserves it or to die without suffering, which is already mercy. A terrifying grimace of a dead man, as it is rare to see one who can open his mouth so wide for his victims. The dead man's face instantly turned to mush, just from one blow from John. John dealt one strong blow to the dead man and with such impudence looking at him and finishing him off with each new blow. A strike with the elbow on the arm with such aggression that he would not be able to attack or eat anyone else. John's terrifying scream, which instills horror even in the insane dead who absolutely do not care about any fear. The terrifying hands of the zombie are already reaching for profit in anticipation of feeding on human meat. Everyone closes the door from the monsters at once and hardly anyone will help them from the outside. They can only hide in a shelter and wait for John to arrive. Michael is already losing hope of survival due to the number of monsters. He asks Clint what to do next. Even if there is no hope for the future, only fate decides their future. They can only wait and hope for a prudent decision of fate, hope for fate, although this is the same thing. Someone unknown instantly rushed past Leo and touched him, whether he was striving for someone and striving so hard, not seeing anyone in front of him. Someone grabbed our Clint and this someone apparently came with bad intentions as he called him a freak. Clint knows this man and their past makes itself felt, since he had to have the hefty courage to come back here and get hit in the head by this man. Clint and the girl were thrown towards the door. The team was shocked by such events. Everyone was trying to help them. It turns out that this man is the father of our Clint, and the woman who is holding him is his mother, and the family is pronounced, since the father is quite angry with his son. The scientist and the whole team are shocked by the sight they saw and stand with their mouths wide open. Clint's mouth began to bleed from such a blow, and everyone else would have wanted to help him. The father points to Clint and orders the mother not to protect her son, since he allegedly wants to exterminate his entire family. Clint cheekily mocks his father, since he rarely thinks about the fact that they are a family, and perhaps the father himself is the root of the problems in the family. The cheeky smile does not leave Clint's face, and he continues to mock his father, since he probably hates him and the feeling is mutual. He likes the fact that he can mock his own father, who apparently has done a lot of things to achieve such an attitude. Someone from the highest building is looking at everyone, shining something. He looks at John's battle with the dead and perhaps is preparing something for John himself. The surprise was a familiar arrow from a crossbow from a familiar freak. John skillfully sends every dead man flying, as if he had devoted his entire life to exterminating walking corpses. The guesses turned out to be correct, and the previously familiar crossbow belonged to our boss Tim, who could not aim at John because he was too fast. A certain beauty is trying to be insolent to Tima and claims that today is clearly not a good day. Tim immediately sensed the impudence in her words and asked what she said. The beauty turned out to be John's girlfriend, whom he lost and whom he loved so much, but sacrificed himself to protect his cute little sister and beautiful friend. She points out that everything bad came back to Tim like a boomerang since he taught people to eat zombies, but now they will eat him. He was greatly hurt by this caustic phrase and she might not feel well after such words, knowing his character and bad temper. 
No one knows what she expects from her words, but her face full of misunderstanding suggests that she does not know what can await her. Tim, like the most evil villain, mocks the girl's words, not realizing that he is in a really dangerous situation, but his self-confidence overshadows his prudence. He began to laugh even louder, which confirmed his incredible confidence. Tim let go of his crossbow and was apparently preparing to strike the beauty or simply hurt her. He grabs the poor girl by the neck and begins to strangle her, like the most arrogant freak, such cold-bloodedness towards the one he loves. Without even a second's hesitation, he will throw the love of his life into the crowd of zombies in order to survive. She's in pain, but he doesn't stop holding her by the throat, saying that she has no right to contradict him, but she just can't stop, and obviously, she's already received punishment from him more than once. He brazenly grabbed her most tender and inviolable parts of her body, like a real freak who only needs to burn in the flames of Inferno, a terrible rapist who ideally plays the role of a villain. The beauty obediently obeyed him and even shed tears, which was painful even to watch, the worst feeling. Tim is so terrible that he took away one of this beauty's legs. This freak cut off her legs so that she would be submissive to him and only him. His insolent gaze pierces and frightens our heroine with his hot breath. Everyone would like to grind him into powder, make a sieve out of him. She finally understands the horror she faces and the danger that awaits her. Grabbing his neck in a death grip, he holds it in the air with one hand, which is amazing, since you need to have a lot of strength to do this. Still, something stopped him, but it is unclear what exactly. Maybe his conscience woke up, which is not there. She begged for death, but he didn't like that, and he threw her on the bed so that she would never talk like that again. She started coughing because of this, and clearly, she didn't deserve such an attitude. No matter how insolent she was, he himself deserved it since you can't be nice by force. He looks down on the beauty who is out of breath from each of his blows. Tim breathed a sigh of relief, probably to calm down and calm his anger. He tries to apologize. What a two-faced freak who needs to wear a straitjacket to treat his narcissism and anger. The girl clutches her chest to catch her breath, since every breath of air is important to her, especially with such a tyrant who will sacrifice the most important things in order to survive. He promises that this will never happen again if she is obedient and never insolent to him again, but at the same time he demands good treatment. How quickly his character changed in a matter of seconds so that she would not be angry with him, since he loves her with all his heart, but if she were an ordinary person, she would be food for monsters. Tim brings his hand to the girl's face, explaining that she should not think about a man who died more than six months ago, and she is only his. Clever girl instantly bites Tim and bites his finger until it bleeds. Perhaps she was greatly offended by those words on his part. Scarlet blood gushes out of Tim's finger in a stream, and he didn't like such impudence from her. Tim turns his evil gaze on the beauty, whom he will definitely kill after this. She slipped past him and quickly tries to grab the crossbow, probably to protect herself from the tyrant. He understood her intentions and quickly decided to stop the beauty so that nothing would happen to her. Her fingers are already on the trigger, but for some reason they are facing the opposite way, and she doesn't look like a stupid girl to grab the gun the wrong way. She pointed the crossbow at herself because she completely doesn't want to be with him and would rather die than suffer with him. The trigger is already moving and foreshadows the death of the valiant beauty, who remained faithful to her beloved even after his death. Tim is furious at such a blatant but reasonable trick. Our heroine is very smart since she bypassed the cold-blooded tyrant who thinks through his every action and takes this world by the tail. The girl did not have time to fire a shot, and her crossbow flies in the opposite direction. One blow to the beauty's hands and her entire well-thought-out plan will go down the drain. Still, the shot was fired, but the arrow flew out the window to other zombies, including our John, although, according to Tim, he had been dead for six months. He is shocked by the determination of the beauty, who is ready to die so as not to be face to face with him within four walls. He was perplexed by the fact that he loved her to the point of losing his mind. He was ready to deprive her of her legs so that she could be his thing. It turns out that her death is one of the outcomes of the plan, and she wanted the arrow to fly towards all the dead so that they would know where to go to find the boss of the whole gang. He was shocked by what his beloved said, and he understood what she was up to and where it would lead. The arrow was fired towards the window and flew towards the dead, which did not bode well. Now the dead will chase after him, 
since the plan of the brilliant beauty worked perfectly and she can only impudently mock him. Tim looked out the window with a face full of fear, as he had many problems that he could not solve. He runs to the window to see the dead people's reaction to being shot at. This coward looked out the window lightly because he was very afraid, but he would find a way out of such situations anyway, due to his cold-bloodedness and lack of any mercy. Something shocked him very much, and this something is very dangerous for him. All the dead are defeated, and among everyone stands John, who put the bodies of all the zombies on the ground and looked exactly at our boss. But what is most frightening is that he caught the arrow on the fly and his same reaction, which made it possible to see this arrow that flew out at a distance of about 50 meters. John's gaze rushed towards Tim, and knowing his speed, Tim would soon have to meet him face to face. He does not believe who caught his arrow, whether it is an ordinary dead man and whether he is very similar to an old acquaintance. John with pathos bent the base of the arrow and presses his gaze on each of his enemies. He realized who this dead man was and he would not care if they met. He runs towards the girl. She naively doesn't understand what could have frightened even Tim himself so much. Tim grabs his beloved by the waist in order to grab her with him and run away. The scoundrel grabbed the beauty and carried her with a quiver of arrows to the exit of the house. His memories began to awaken, since he does not believe that John is still alive, but he was brutally torn to pieces by zombies before his eyes, and it could not have been otherwise. Tim's legs quickly lead him out of the house, so that each time he runs away from John faster and faster. He instantly flew out of the door, where the dead were already waiting for him outside his door. But Tim turned his attention in a completely different direction, and apparently, John was already running at full speed in his direction. Everything turned out to be true, and John is already on his heels, as he literally found himself in the backyard of the house in a matter of seconds. Tim is surrounded, but he does not yet know about the zombies behind him, which is even more dangerous than John, who is not hostile to people. Tim finally understands that in front of him is definitely not a person or even a dead man, since ordinary people and even zombies do not have such power. The freak is completely shocked by the speed and strength of our main character, and also by the fact that he was a previously familiar hero, whom he mocked at the end of each semester even before the apocalypse. The growl of a dead man is heard in the background, and Tim pays attention to it. The zombie is already behind him, and it's unlikely that anyone will have time to save Tim, he is not even afraid that there is a dead man behind him, an old enemy in front of him, and he has nowhere to go. It is unknown what John will do, protect Tim from the dead man, or give the dead man the opportunity to eat him and then kill him too. John effectively and just as instantly destroyed the danger with one movement and spared his enemy. The boss can't even hold his beloved on his shoulders. How can he protect and take care of her? The dead are trying to go into Clint's hideout and feast on every little person in the room. John sends one of the dead into the crowd of his relatives with one of his kicks. Clint's fists are smeared with blood. The battle is even between people. He deals blow after blow to his father, so that he finally understands that he shouldn't constantly interfere with him. A man loses a couple of his teeth for every blow from his son. The scarlet blood that flows like a river from the father's mouth has already stained the whole earth with its color. Mother begs and begs not to continue the senseless family fight, the only one who thinks sensibly in such situations. The whole team is perplexed by what is happening here, since no one expected such a family meeting between Clint and his father and mother. Mother already on her knees asks not to fight anymore and to resolve everything peacefully, which is impossible in their family. Clint believes that he is not worthy of life, and he returned home just to kill him, just to get rid of his parent. She is shocked by what her own son said, but still hopes that everything will end much better than she thinks. Clint pulls out a knife and is clearly determined to end everything here and now. Beaten half to death, the father lies on the ground and does not even imagine that a sharp blade is waiting for him on his throat. Clint is determined to win and is ready to plunge a knife into the heart without any regret and send his father to the afterlife. Suddenly he is stopped by a roar behind him, which our John probably created and arrived right on time. Pieces of wood fly in different directions. Michael tries to cover John's sister and somehow protect her. The finished off dead flew into the doorway and broke the doors themselves against the backdrop of a cloud of dust. Clint understood who stopped him and nervously remained silent, as he could say too much, 
thereby leaving the world without even taking revenge on his father. John himself appeared in a cloud of dust, dead and alive at the same time, a dead man with the mind of a man, the most powerful zombie among all. Clint notices that he came right on time and arrived at the most interesting thing. John looked at his ally in disbelief as he became mad with hatred and became reckless. The crowd of the dead is defeated by one zombie man, who was so strong and fast that he was able to defeat all the zombies in a matter of minutes. Tim is on the verge of life and death, and can only sit in clouds of dust and await his fate. The poor beauty has suffered a lot and only one person is to blame for it all. She tries to open her eyelids, which grow heavier with every new event. The girl languidly tries to pronounce the name of her beloved, whom she lost six months ago, who sacrificed himself to save her and his sister, hoping for their happy life, in which he was mistaken. A wonderful sunset against the backdrop of the apocalypse, where is the sky of a real dystopia, gray from emptiness or red from shed blood? The most terrible dream appeared before the girl's eyes, as she saw memories of how her beloved died, and that beautiful sunset would never seem so beautiful, so wonderful to her again. How she screamed in moral pain when the dead took a bite out of John, when she tried to close her sister's eyes so that she would not see this horror with her children's eyes. While John distracted the zombies, Tim decides to break the glass and run for the hills. The glass broke easily and sharp fragments flew in different directions. Tim grabs the beauty who is holding the girl who wants to return to her brother and breaks out of her hands. She was able to get out of the beauty's hands and cannot understand the danger that lies outside the windows. The girl sees nothing behind her tears and strives for her brother, but he sacrificed himself to save her. The beauty calls on her to return to her and run, run as fast as she can. One of the zombies has already gotten close to a small, stupid girl who doesn't listen to her elders when it's really worth doing. The zombie is already before her eyes, and she can only stand in a stupor, like a deer in front of a truck. John's beloved escapes from Tim's arms and rushes towards his little sister to save her. The scary monster has already struck terror into the girl and she can only drool in front of him. Incredibly, he bit the girl, and apparently she didn't have much time left to live, and all because of one stupid thing. Still, the beauty managed to save the child from the clutches of the monster, and she apparently was able to survive, since the girl fulfilled her duty to John. The girl can only cry emotionally, although she put everyone in danger. The girl probably did not have time to escape and was wounded in some part of her body. The dead man bit her on the leg, the same leg that Tim cut off, so that the virus would not spread throughout the girl's body and completely leave her in a desperate situation. She still continues to believe that John is still alive. The stage of denial haunts her. Her tears can be understood, since she experienced the loss of her leg, her loved one, and her family. She was forced to live with her hater, and it was as if all the worst things happened to her. The girl cannot see dead John in front of her, cannot believe that he is dead, that he was eaten by his parents. Tim saw that she had been bitten, and he needed to quickly make some drastic decisions. His gaze lit up with a golden flame, and he meant it seriously, without any mercy. He snatches the axe from his brother's hands and runs to save his beloved so that she survives. The dead man was killed, but the entire leg was saturated with the virus, which in a matter of seconds already spreads throughout the body, enslaving it. Tim can only cut off the leg of his beloved, and there is no other way, calmly and without hesitation, cutting off the diseased limb to give the opportunity to live on. The veins on the leg have already bulged, and a purple spot has covered the floor of the leg, which means that the virus is already spreading throughout the body. Tim makes a strong swing with the axe so as to be sure to chop off the legs and not regret it. The blood is gushing in different directions, and Tim put all his strength into the blow, even if it is his one whom he loves so much. The severed leg lies further from the body, a bloody puddle has covered the entire ground around. What a strong will she is, since anyone would have already fallen into a painful shock and could not even shed tears. And she cries not even because of pain, but because of the loss of her loved one, who has suffered much more than she has. The clever girl reaches out to the cold body of John, who is unlikely to ever answer her. Still, there is not a drop of life in John. He is dead. Everything is over for him. Now our heroine is drawn to John, who is alive, but no longer the same as before. Having become a zombie, he has not lost his mind, which should be complete happiness for both. 
She calls him to which he does not react, standing in a cloud of dust. Our beauty asks to look in her direction so that John at least looks at her, so that he protects her and warms her under his wing. He only now notices her, hears her words. This is probably the most anticipated meeting during the entire separation. Suddenly, one of the surviving dead pounces on her and she will be in trouble if she gets hit. John instantly reacts to the dead man and will take the fastest step in order to save his only moon among the faded stars. Like lightning, John comes right in front of the zombie and stops its attack. She is fascinated by the speed, because she didn't even dare to dream that she could see him, her beloved, again. She managed to react to John's rapid movement, but she was worried that he had been bitten by the dead man who had once bitten her. The walking corpse has grabbed onto our hero's shoulder and is not going to let go. Blood flows from the bite site, and this irritates John over and over again. The heroine did not expect such endurance, such immunity, speed, and strength, something beyond the limits of reason. Someone hits a zombie and stops his life in this world once and for all. The savior turned out to be Clint, who asks not to interfere with the reunion of the lovers. Two lovers' gazes met after a long separation which changed their lives upside down, which deprived them of the meaning of life and all their efforts were not useless. She tries to recognize in him her beloved John, whom she could not forget six months later. A bright smile lit up on John's face. His world was painted in even brighter colors due to the meeting of the long-awaited person, his loved one. Her most beautiful lilac eyes, like the same lilac that blooms in early summer, in the midst of the summer heat, heat and sun rays. John claims that he heard every word she said, every rustle she made. He sweetly wiped the blood from her cheeks, thereby showing trust in himself and his own as well. He couldn't control himself then, which is why he didn't react to the words as he should. The heroine's eyes were covered with tiny diamonds that flowed down the beauty's tender cheeks, but these were just tears of happiness. The beauty extends her warm, gentle hand to her John's face. The girl still cannot believe that this is her John, that he is standing in front of her and rejoices at her appearance in the same way as she does. She hugged our hero tightly, showing her affection, care, and love, she clearly believed that it was him. Our hero's beloved cries like a child and cannot stop because she dreamed of finally seeing him. Like beauty and the beast, they are complete opposites, which is why they harmonize, making them the most unbreakable couple. John doesn't blame her for anything, showing his love for her by forgiving her everything. He pressed her tightly against his massive shoulder and used it to collect all her tears that she had been accumulating inside herself for so long. Tim is already starting to get to his feet, which means he must do something bad for them. He calls John's life hard and stinking, although he does all the most vile things. Tim grabs his wooden crossbow and prepares arrows for the back attack that is in his repertoire. John, Clint, and the beauty stand together and nothing foreshadows trouble. Tim sees that he has a great moment to attack them and settle everything with John to the end. He gathered all his malice and anger into his fist, his gaze is charged with golden energy, and he is ready to kill. The arrow has already been fired from Tim's crossbow, and it is unknown what John will do about such a move. Clint notices the attack from behind and warns everyone about it so that everyone can escape. John spectacularly catches an arrow in flight that was capable of piercing everyone in one shot. John is so strong that he is able to stop an arrow in mid-flight, even despite its flight. Tim is shocked by what he sees and has no choice but to run headlong. John points out that it's been a while since he and Tim have seen each other, and he's missing a couple of life lessons. After the moment when he sent our hero to be devoured by monsters, John decides to return the arrow back to him, as if it returned like a boomerang without reaching its target. One strong swing and the arrow flies stronger and faster than from a crossbow. The arrow pierced Tim in the left chest, which he could not have expected. The arrow attacks like a cannonball and also drives him into the wall with its force. The dead crawl out of the clouds of dust and want to attack our hero again as quickly as possible and eat everyone in this village. Tim's hand is dripping with blood and he can do nothing but hang on the wall. Everyone remained silent and Clint smirked at his opponent, embodying his dignity. Tim is nailed to the wall like a nail on a hanger. This is exactly what he deserves most, to bleed. He still doesn't understand what's going on here where John gets such power from and what he should do. The situation is very bad for him and he has no choice but to hang in there and hope for all the good. He clenched his teeth tightly as if they would crumble into dust any minute. The boss screams like a real madman, whether he is trying to beg everyone to pity him. 
The beauty is worried about Tim's behavior, as if she is haunted by the life she lived for six months. The little sister runs up to her brother to express all her worries for them, for everyone who saved and protected all this time. John is full of shock, but hugs his little sister, and she talks about all the experiences that visited her head during a couple of hours of separation. John brought something for his beloved sister, and it is unclear what kind of surprise awaits her. She thought that John had brought her the meat of the dead and was amazed at how Tim, a cruel tyrant and not a ruler, raised children here. John was shocked by what his little sister said, how you could do this to a child and why. The girl is a real smart girl, because even when Tim forced him to eat zombie meat, she always refused him, saying that she was not hungry. She had to keep the stinking meat of a dead man in her mouth so that she would not be scolded by the cruel Tim. John is still in shock from the news that the little girl tells him, who is also his younger sister, who should never see such things in her life. Even a small trifle from the old days saved the life of a smart little sister. But this is a dirty trick on the mother, but salvation in a different situation. He was visited by warm memories from a carefree childhood where they did not have to run from a crowd of dead people. My little sister saw her parents who had already turned into zombies, and to see them like this is a real horror for a small child. Her face of joy was filled with sadness. She would never be able to see them again, feel the warmth of their tender skin, hear the fragrant smell of their perfume, and hear the pleasant voice of her father and mother. This will bring tears to the eyes of even the strongest soul, who can chop stones with his willpower, but will cry because of the death of his relatives. The girl could not eat zombie meat not because of her own motives, but because the dead could be someone's parents. John remained silent once again, realizing that his little sister had experienced too much during her years and it was scary. The beauty shed tears after the girl's words, as they were truly sincere and sincere. She realizes that Tim deceived her again because he promised that he would not harm the girl. Her determination was gigantic, she was ready to grind him into powder so that he could never do any mischief again. Tim plays the role of a villain perfectly, and his charisma is amazing because even in a dire situation, he continues to smile evilly and laugh like a villain. He considers his beloved strange, since she trusted him, the one who in life will not follow anyone's lead. The mad ruler raises his hand, trembling, and tries to do something. He cannot believe that he loved her, and even shed a tear, like a little child. Putting his hand to his face, Tim is clearly thinking about how much he hates himself for allowing anyone to get close to him. John looks completely blankly in Tim's direction, understanding the reason for his tears. His willpower is amazing. Clint easily rips the arrow out of his body and does not show a drop of mercy towards him. Clint claims that the one who destroyed the family hearth does not dare to live and will not allow him to do this to anyone again. He is already preparing a bloody arrowhead to send Tim to another world once and for all. In Tim's eyes, there is no longer that hefty confidence and only fear is written in them. The fear that he caused to all the people around him has returned to him. Something shocked even our Clint, who was cold-bloodedly ready to kill his own father. Tim's brother stopped the arrowhead, taking the blow himself, thereby saving his cruel brother. Tim is shocked by his brother's suddenness, but he is amazed by the devotion to him that Tim may have cultivated for himself. The brother sends Tim to hell so that he can escape unharmed. Will is already at the limit and is already begging his brother to run and not stand in a stupor, exposing his life to danger, which is already assessed by the life of his brother. The whole gang calls Clint an insatiable bastard and tries to humiliate him in every possible way. Clint mocks everyone, as if he spits in everyone's mouth and forces them to swallow it all. He has increased pressure on Will and intends to kill him and Tim along with him. Will screams in fear for his life, since he won't be able to hold the arrow in his hands for long. Now he continues to throw mud at Clint so that the crowd turns on him and crushes him with numbers. Will calls Clint's father and asks if he wants to help him. Tim, silently, sits on the sidelines and waits for the events to end, while everyone else asks Clint's father to send him to the next world and not give him the label of a murderer. The old man asks Clint to stop, but at the same time he shakes with fear like a child. Clint continues to mock everyone and wants to kill all his enemies as quickly as possible. All beaten and broken, he continues to pretend to be an important person, but he is nothing of himself. He grabbed a pitchfork from one of the onlookers and rushed towards Clint. All you have to do is kill him, thought the stupid father and rushed to deliver a stabbing blow to his son. 
In the blink of an eye, John stops Clint's father's attack. Now the danger is finally over. He is very scared. His eyes exude only fear and despair. All the spark has gone out. John easily extinguished it. Taller, stronger, and most importantly smarter, John is stronger than his smaller brothers in every way, capable of thinking like a human and fighting like a zombie. The father stumbled and fell, as if any minute he would cry like a little girl. Warm, golden, and fetid water flowed from his father's pants, and this confirmed his fear and apprehension. He hid behind his wife, the lowest act on his part. This is a real reason to laugh, since even Clint was amused by such a scene and completely showed all the weaknesses of his father. Clint just can't stop laughing and continue fighting normally. He points a finger at him and points out that he defecated out of fear, and this could very well become the boss while he is running around somewhere. Will caught a good moment and is not going to waste it. He snatches the arrow from Clint's hands, and that's pretty bad since he can defend himself. Will points the bloody arrowhead in Clint's direction. Clint understands that such a fry won't even be able to cut up a dead chicken. Will is already spitting blood from just one blow from Clint, yet he is too weak for him and is not at all close to him. Will only manages to touch Clint's hand. Obviously, this is not casual and maybe even part of the plan. Clint holds the arrow in his hands and continues to taunt his opponent, calling him a dog with the wrong master. Brother Will falls to his feet in severe pain, Clint hit too hard. Incredibly, even now, he does not lose his fighting spirit and says that Clint only needs to be bitten to defeat him. Clint's look suggests that he misunderstands his opponent, what he is talking about and what his thoughts are about. Finally, it dawned on him. His guesses were confirmed and the touch was not simple. Will attached an explosive to Clint's hand and it would soon tear off his hand. Clint's gaze is filled with fear. Will smiles cheekily because he humiliated his enemy, which means he won. Clint was angry. He plunged an arrow right into Will's forehead and didn't even regret killing a man. The arrow sticks out from Will's forehead like a great blade that lay in the stone, and only the worthy could pull it out. Tim lost his spirit after the death of his brother, and it is very unusual for him to react this way to someone else's death. The smile on Will's face did not fade even after death. He is the winner in this battle. Streams of blood flow down onto his snow-white t-shirt. His entire body is a sign of battle, heaps of deep wounds and a bloody mess on his forehead. Tim still can't believe his brother's death. His body is numb, as if chained by a ship's anchor chains. Clint recognizes this little guy as a worthy warrior and even praises him, realizing that soon only ashes may remain from his hand and scatter to the wind. The fuse has already burned out. The stick of dynamite is a second away from exploding. The countdown has begun. Clint's team is worried about him and shouts his name at the top of their voices, it is unknown for what purpose and how it will help him. Even John was worried about his friend, comrade, and the one who could cover his back in a difficult situation. His right arm is torn into pieces. A massive explosion may leave his arm completely bloody or leave him permanently disabled. The explosion turned out to be very strong, as a flash from the explosion was visible even over the horizon. Even the dead, who were kilometers away, saw a strong explosion and this could not lead to anything good. Ashes, blood, and smoke. All these are the results of an aimless battle. A battle to the death for your friends, family, and acquaintances. John and the whole team are shocked by what they saw. Everyone hopes that everything will be okay with Clint. Clint lies with a face full of despair, with a damaged arm, and it is unclear whether he will be able to continue to use it, whether everything will be as before. Tears are running down Clint's cheeks, Ash is swirling around him, and the abrasions on his face indicate that he is in great pain. Clint is incredibly angry. If Will were still alive, he would greatly regret the opportunity to live that fate gave him. No one knows how to help Clint, how to cure him, whether it is possible. He tosses and turns in pain, spinning in circles, he really hurts. Clint himself is to blame for his carelessness, as he underestimated his opponent and paid for it with his own hand, which will be a permanent lesson for him. For an unknown purpose, Clint grabs a nearby wooden stake with an iron grip. Will's cold corpse is getting colder and colder every second. Clint was as mad as a child, and he needed the stake to finish off the already dead body. He sticks a stake into Will, his blood spurts out like a fountain, how terrible Clint is when he's angry. John reassures Clint, like a real father restrains his son so that he does not finish off his offender. Clint is still a child. Everything in his character is similar to the traits of a child. He only talks about himself. If he were an adult, he did not reveal his anger and calmly reacted to the loss of his arm, 
and did not put the whole team in danger. John also fell under the hot hand. His face suffers many blows, and this behavior does not please our John. John is very dissatisfied with the way Clint behaves and also considers his character childish. Clint claims that his skin should not have a scratch on it. It should be perfectly smooth and clean. John looked at Clint's hand, which was burned from the explosions and looked terrible, as if it had been fried over a fire until it was smoked. He asks Leo for help to find out if Clint's arm can continue to function normally. The scientist realized at one glance that in general, the hand was only burned on the outside and the bones were all in good condition. Every time you touch Clint, it hurts him a lot, causing him to scream. John is already tired of Clint constantly shedding tears without any specific meaning. Something made Leo turn his gaze to the side and even shocked him. The pupils narrowed greatly and became covered with fear. What could have frightened our scientists so much? Leo's surprise was facilitated by a new attack of the dead, who saw the explosion and followed it to the trail to the village. Leo warns everyone that a zombie is already on their heels. Clint is still crying into the chest of his protector, who is not very happy about the grief of his ally. John understands that he must initially calm his friend down, otherwise he will lose his mind under the influence of anger and die the death of madmen. John orders the team to take Clint to safety and protect him. Michael grabs the wounded man and decides to take him to a secluded place. John also calls his cute little sister. In addition, John is calling his beloved and it is unknown why he called them. He puts his girls in his arms and is going to help carry everyone to a secluded place, since he does not dare to lose everyone again. One of the gang of dead meat eaters grabs Tim, offering to help him. John, even after such dirty tricks on Tim's part, is ready to help him. John's kindness knows no bounds. But still, such kindness must be paid for and nothing else, since this is real alms on his part. Heaps of corpses lie on the ground and their fetid smell develops in a light breeze and spreads this horror in different directions. Tim's gang brought John to a vault with explosives, and such payment is quite valuable during the apocalypse. John glares at Tim's sixes and is not entirely sure that they are not lying. He stripped them naked, and they stood there and were embarrassed to show even a piece of their body. The team gathered in one place to bring one corpse as John needed it. Flies flew around the dead man like vile vultures eating the rotting flesh. It is unclear why John needed the zombie corpse, but he is serious about it. He pierces the stinking corpse with his sharp claw like the sharpest knife, piercing its flesh right through. Everyone is shocked by John's actions, and they all want to quickly find out what is going on in the head of a dead man and a man. John smears the six's face with zombie blood and his intentions are clear, since having become a zombie, he also lost the attention of the dead, and this will be like an experiment, whether zombies are guided by smell or otherwise. He knows about everything in this village, even the gunpowder warehouse is no secret to him, and he instantly interrogates about it. Tim's gang is shocked. How does John know everything? How does he get so much information? John points out that he only saw this amount of pyrotechnics on the eve of the Chinese New Year, which means in such large quantities. John plays it safe and ties Tim up at the same time so that he doesn't have time to do anything bad despite all his madness. He thought through everything wisely and even realized that the blood of zombies would protect them all just a couple of meters from the dead man. Tim is tied up. Is this the end for him or will he get out and continue to abuse everyone and use their lives to save his own? John explains Clint's role in the plan and that he and everyone he leads should not care about their lives because he and only he can tow the bus on which they will all escape. The beauty and the girl are worried that John will survive and return to them alive and well. He pays attention to them and understands that their hearts literally skip a beat when he repeatedly pretends to be a hero and tries to save everyone at the cost of his life. John strokes his little sister's little head and assures her not to worry, and he will never leave them again. He also asks his beloved to protect herself, and he will definitely come back and hug her tightly, tightly. She asks him not to overwork himself too much. In short, she takes care of him, encourages him in every possible way, and pleases him with her touches. She has only one demand for him, that he return unharmed and headlong run to them to express that he is alive and well. The girl parts the long hair from her lover's face in order to see his scar. Someone left a terrible scar on our hero's eye and it's scary who could have left it. He kindly walks away from such touches, since this scar can cause not only physical pain, but also possibly moral pain. 
Probably the scar on his eye is his only weak point and he can only hide his wounds to himself, although he has many other scars. They finally decide to go out before it's too late, so that there won't be too many dead at one point. John orders the six to take the explosives and carry them with him as if they were kamikazes. The door opens slightly. Our saviors, led by John, come out, and their plan is sure to be successful. There are indeed a lot of dead people, and their corpses are much more numerous, whether the graves spat out their inhabitants. They are not sure that the blood of the dead will save them, and still ask this question, since this operation could cost them their lives. Blood ceases to act within a radius of two meters, and this is its only weakness, which does not make it ideal in everything. They immediately went crazy after our hero's words and cannot imagine what would happen if they came closer than two meters. John is tired of being surrounded by only crybabies who constantly whine for their lives. His claw lit up with fire, as if a spark ran through his fingers like a stone hitting a flint. John does not want to die here. He first of all hopes for the success of the plan, and to survive in any case, Otherwise, he is not a man for not keeping his promise to his beloved girls. He uses his claw to light the fuse of all the explosives to finish off his fellow creatures. All the pyrotechnics soared into the air and headed towards the dead. Everyone is carrying dozens of sticks of dynamite, prepared for the hungry dead, and John bombards them with explosions so that they will definitely not get up after their death. For John... The main thing is that all the dead die in the shortest possible time, and nothing could interfere with his plan. Many explosions covered the ground and scattered the dead around. Among the ashes, sparks, and explosions, the Sixes and John rush forward to clear the way for those coming behind. While everyone is running, John's cold hand touches one of Tim's Sixes, and it is unclear why. He orders him to run ahead to the pyrotechnics warehouse and not look back. Against the background of explosions, a real fearless man runs and moves the entire team to clear the path forward. Explosions, blood, and zombies, all this scares the team. Everyone is trying to escape and save others. Six hates John for his dangerous plans and tries to express all their emotions by screaming and yelling. John calls him a zombie sadist, whether with some self-interest he laughs and jokes at him. Often the bodies of the dead fly in different directions. If they were people there would be much more screams. Against the background of the dead and smoke, the door from the hiding place of our heroes opens slightly. Familiar white hair makes its way between the cracks and its owner is apparently trying to find out whether the dead have left or not. Clint's team has scouted everything out and they can all probably move out. They see a clear path to the bus and prepare to evacuate the village. Clint takes responsibility for John's sister. Michael takes responsibility for his beloved girl. The bus, even after such destruction, continues to operate, looking like a military vehicle that has gone through all the horrors of war. They got to the bus without any problems and are already going to take their seats. Clint instructs everyone to board the bus and not forget anyone. The others are worried about Clint, but he is responsible for everyone and must personally make sure everyone is in their seats. But this is not his only goal. He needed Tim, and he somehow set him up. He grabs Tim by the long hair to stop him, and Tim doesn't like it much. Clint talks about some things that were stolen by Tim. Tim was shocked by Clint's words, since he probably understands what Clint is talking about. At the same time, the rescue team made its way to the warehouse and are preparing for the second part of the plan. The Sixes open the door to the pyrotechnic warehouse to take all the explosives from there. They have come to a large amount of explosives and are waiting for orders from John. John is tormented by a scar on his eye, and this could plunge the entire team into mortal danger. Meanwhile, the dead are already on their heels and attack one of the six. The fat man knows a lot about explosives and grabs the biggest one to certainly solve the problem with the dead. The bearded monster sees a large stick of dynamite in front of his face, and that is the last thing he sees. The explosion was so strong that it tore out the doors and jams and sent the dead man on a long flight. The dead pay attention to the explosion and even say something in their dead language. They understand that they have only made things worse, and the real danger has begun now. That zombie is still standing on its own two feet and is even holding up well. The dead attack the gap and don't even see the obstacles in front of them, just to eat human flesh and don't care about anything else, since they are led not by their minds, but by their legs, and wherever they lead, they will come. John manages to grab the zombie by the hair and saves his temporary ally from a zombie attack. 
He hits him on the ground and is amazed by the force with which he does this, with what ruthlessness. Over and over again, John beats and beats his enemy, leaving no chance for his victory. John sees a crowd of his relatives in front of him and is going to tear off the head of each of them and screw it back so that they never want to bite off a piece of a person again. He wants to send his enemy and is preparing to send him into the crowd of zombies. As they say, three birds with one stone, John is like a cannon, and his enemies are a cannonball that blows away everyone in its flight path. Everyone is perplexed by John's strength, their mouths open, waiting for orders. John tells them to take the gunpowder and he will solve the problem with all the zombies. Everyone agrees with him and is already in a hurry to collect gunpowder. After a powerful explosion and great carnage, a cloud of dust floats across the entire earth, covering the entire space. In the warehouse with pyrotechnics, oddly enough, there are a lot of explosives, and at times, it's even scary what Tim and his gang prepared so much of it for. Half-naked sixes indicate that zombies are very difficult to fight, even too difficult. There are more and more walking corpses on the streets, as if they had fallen into an anthill and the number of its inhabitants is amazing every time. John, as responsible for the success of the plan, takes on the task of protecting Tim's sixes. Shave does not understand how he alone will fight hundreds of monsters that are much stronger than humans, but he still does not know what John is really capable of. The six hands over a large shipment of Chinese fireworks rockets to John, and that's how he plans to place each zombie's head on the floor. Shaved is worried about John and believes that it's not safe to go out into the street with all the zombies and it's worth thinking through a good plan. John, calmly and quite confidently, is already moving towards the hole in the wall, holding a bunch of fireworks over his shoulder. John is completely confident in himself. Not a drop of worry is visible on his face, only complete confidence in success and a certain pathos. He opened his red eye, which frightens even those who have not experienced fear, whose heart does not freeze when there is a deep abyss under him, when the last breath of air runs out, and you are at the bottom and there is only darkness around. The Sixes are very frightened by his gaze, and not without reason, due to the fact that John is incredibly dangerous if you become his enemy. John believes that he doesn't see anything complicated in front of him, which means he shouldn't bother himself with such trifles. Under the cover of night, the dead become more and more numerous each time, which frightens each time. John's eye has unusual power. He is able to see opponents behind the walls of houses, and this gives him a great advantage over all opponents. He is already preparing to fire the first salvo, which will knock down every dead man in front of him and send them to burn in the suffering of Inferno. Fireworks display like volcanic eruptions, unleashing their terrible power, as in the times of Pompeii. The reaction force throws John some distance. That's the force of one volley of a bunch of fireworks. Each zombie is torn apart and sent on a long flight by the explosive force of the pyrotechnics, so that they become part of a magnificent fireworks display. Each salvo of a new missile sends zombies on a job interview to death, which will cut off the head of anyone who dares to come to her. Bright sparks, flesh, and zombie body parts, what could be better than this, when the enemies of humanity take their last flight and see their last fireworks? The Sixes are amazed by John's strength, as if a current had been sent through their veins. But this is not enough for John. He needs to finish everything as soon as possible and go to his loved ones. A holiday during the apocalypse, two completely incompatible things, when the walking dead roam the alleys and bright lights light up in the sky and give hope of survival to those who were able to escape under the yoke of hungry zombies. Passengers are inspired by the beauty of those lights because six months have already passed since the end of the world after the loss of all their dearest people. Sam saw someone and hesitantly says that John and the Sixes are probably already returning. In fact, among the clouds of dust, one can see a silhouette similar to a human one, but it is not certain that it is an ally. The man contradicted Sam's expectations, and his face shows that those running in the smoke are not allies, but the worst enemies. They turned out to be evil dead people who were burning with fire and were running from something more dangerous than themselves. The nooses soared over the heads of the zombies, as if death itself was chasing them, as if it wanted to hang them on the gallows, where the same end awaits them for all, a rope, soap, a stool. Cannot posthumously embrace the dead and thereby took away their last hope for further absorption of people's lives. What could have frightened the already dead corpses so much and dragged them with such force into a cloud of dust, ash, and dirt? 
Still, the death of zombies cannot be avoided and they cannot be saved even by a white chalk circle on the floor, since John himself is responsible for their death. He's already aiming a couple of missiles at the other ends of the ropes to decapitate a couple more of the dead. The emptiness in his eyes says that he is completely cold-blooded towards his enemies and will never think about mercy. A couple of seconds and the life of the dead will end at the wonderful moment of fireworks exploding. The explosion had already reached its enemies and burned their heads to the point of their skulls, so that even the rotten flesh peeled off the cranial cortex. The burning heads fell to the ground and their appearance amazed all the passengers on the bus. John steps forward to meet his allies, representing the success of the mission. Everyone is assembled. The sixes keep up with John who seems to have not been injured since only his partners look tired. Meg and Alice have already taken their places and are happily awaiting the arrival of John, so that he is alive, healthy, and unharmed. From the side, John hears a familiar voice that attracts his attention. He casts his sharp gaze upward, since it was from there that the sound that called him came. Clint and Tim climbed into one of the houses, because Clint needed to return important things that Tim had stolen from him and hid in this house. John probably doesn't understand what this couple has lost in this house and why they can't sit in their places. Clint makes a stupid face and asks John to catch him while he jumps. John's look suggests that he doesn't like this idea and is completely tired of looking after him like a small child. Multicolored explosions of fireworks enveloped the gray sky and painted it with the brightest colors as if buckets of paint were splashed onto a snow-white canvas. No one ever hoped to see with their own eyes such beauty as the Chinese fireworks display. John still reaches out his hand to Clint and is already preparing to catch him in his tight embrace. Clint is already throwing himself from the window, screaming, expecting a soft landing in John's arms. You can tell from Sam's look that he noticed something wrong in Clint's jump, as if he had forgotten something very important. Clint is already climbing down the stone wall of the house and is preparing to touch the ground. John, like a real savior, catches a child from a burning house. Clint forgot about the most important thing, that he is attached to Tim, and this will not lead to anything good. The grimace that appeared on Clint's face shows the stupidity of his actions, that he did not fully think through his soft landing. Tim is already flying after Clint, screaming something incomprehensible in fear. Clint himself will soon pay for his absent-mindedness and lack of attentiveness, which is already in his blood, Tim and Clint had already collided with their heads, and they were obviously in trouble after such blows. John, for obvious reasons, did not dare to catch them both, and left all responsibility to fate, to fathom. Two fools are lying one under the other, and it is literally written on their faces that they are not happy about such a fall, but Clint, the team boss, is to blame for everything. Clint is trembling and doesn't understand why John didn't catch him, what the reason is, John said contemptuously that he had changed his mind about catching him and Tim, but next time he would be smarter. The entire team expressed contempt for them and put their hands to their faces, which means complete shame for their bosses who act like children. Meg is already running to John to hug him tightly and probably express all her emotions about the magnificent fireworks display. She jumps into John's arms, and if she had been Tim instead of falling, John would have just as happily caught her and tossed her up a couple of times, making sure to catch her so that she could see much more from such a height than usual. This is true joy in the eyes of a child, in the eyes of a little girl who immensely loves and appreciates her brother, whom she has not seen for a very long time. John invites Alice and Meg to escape from here to the most remote places in this world, and his interlocutors listen to him carefully, expressing their agreement. Clint does not like their attitude in the family, since he hates his family with all his heart, for an unknown reason. He is dissatisfied that John did not catch him, and considers himself a dog that John allowed into his family for a while. A drop of water fell onto Clint's shoulder, and he instantly turned his attention to it. Heavy rain poured down and it would extinguish all the fire that was created by the explosions of hundreds of fireworks. Cold drops flowed from Clint's face and covered his hair with a light color, as if after the morning fog, when on each blade of grass there are many drops of water of the fallen humidity of the fog. The sky brought down one of its natural phenomena, raining down a large amount of water on the earth, which will wash away all the dirt from the face of the earth. The lights went out, 
The flames were uprooted and extinguished by tiny droplets of rain. The burned corpses went out and their eyes, like lunar craters, filled with emptiness and darkness. A certain smell spread and caressed the noses of the rescued. The pleasant smell lured with its charm and directed their gaze towards the sources of that smell and all the victims of this smell, which captivated with its charm. Leo was frightened by something. He swallowed the saliva in his mouth because of the strange charm that appeared suddenly, foreshadowing something bad. John noticed Leo's strange behavior and, grabbing his shoulder, asked why he wasn't heading to the bus to take his seat. The scientist was distracted by a loud scream, which greatly alarmed him since the cause of the screams was severe hunger, which was awakened by that very smell. Six is trying to keep their ally from starting to eat the zombie meat, from which a strong, alluring smell was just coming. Leo's calmness disappeared at that very second, as he realizes that consuming a zombie will lead to transformation into a zombie himself. Clint's father, the people from Tim's gang and those who ate the meat of the dead went crazy, and their faces became similar to the faces of drug addicts after another marathon of taking drugs. Leo suggested that the reason for people's madness was the smell of fried zombies, which lured their minds like drug addicts are lured by one kind of the next drug. John did not even think about the fact that they could become dead, since they had already eaten dead meat. John was shocked by Leo's words, and he said that it is not necessary for a zombie to bite him for infection. The madmen rushed towards the stinking meat of the dead. Their faces went crazy, covered with a terrifying grimace, as if they had already become bloodthirsty zombies. Leo already had experience with such patients. He adjusted his glasses and began to tell his long story. The behavior of the virus is very peculiar. People lost their minds without even eating the flesh of the dead. At the beginning of the end of the world, hospitals already looked quite terrible, as if they had been in constant ruin for decades and had been completely abandoned for a long time. The doors of the hospital locker rooms were shabby and scuffed from all parts. At the beginning of Armageddon, Leo found himself in the locker room of his hospital with his colleagues and some patients. Since everything happened so suddenly, they only had time to eat small snacks and it is so bad that they will have to eat them for a long time. During the two weeks, Leo had one chocolate bar left, which was like the most delicious morsel during a long-term fast. He's already bringing a sweet bar and a beautiful wrapper, thinking about what he can afford today. Leo didn't even have time to touch his candy bar with his lips when someone unfamiliar and probably very arrogant snatches it away. His look instantly changed to a more fearful one, since perhaps that candy bar was his last food for the near future. The thief turned out to be a certain scoundrel who had become very skinny all the time and threatened Leo with a broken bottle of wine, since he certainly would not have had the strength to take his food from an adult man. The man turned out to be not such a scoundrel since he did not eat the bar himself, but shared it with his wife, like a real man. Like the most loving wife she refuses to eat and invites him to eat since he has become very skinny. He makes excuses for her and says that his hunger cannot be satisfied with such a trifle, he only needs raw meat and let her eat a sweet bar. He did all this for his future son so that he would grow up healthy and his mother would remain as beautiful. She nevertheless agreed and thanked him for such generosity, and he answered her with a sweet and kind smile. Leo noticed that the man was very exhausted and everything he said was a lie since he was very weak. The man's face was empty, no emotions. He was greeted by death, but the sweet smile did not leave him. He was completely weakened, exhausted, his strength and soul left him. He is at his limit. His pupils have disappeared from his eye sockets. His lips have become very dry, and he himself has become very withered, all signs of death from exhaustion. The dear wife cannot let go of her beloved husband. Her fidelity is amazing. She is afraid of losing him just as she is afraid of her own death. The beautiful wife tightly clung to the still warm body of her husband, a man with a capital M who for the sake of his family was ready to sacrifice himself until he lost his mind. Leo understands that he is probably already dead, and all he has left is to leave this world with the death of a brave man who defended his lady of his heart until his death. The girl asks all the doctors sitting here for help, accusing them of being doctors and why can't they help him. One of the doctors justifies himself by saying that the man can no longer be saved and that it is definitely impossible to help him, for him, this is the end, but for that it is very bright. 
She hated all the doctors the second they refused help, since, in her opinion, they should have at least taken the initiative. She hugs her husband for the last time and sees him off to another world so that he can live there happy and healthy. Still, he answered her, calling her darling and grabbing her soft, shiny locks of dark hair. The look remained as empty as before, but he sensed a strange and at the same time fragrant smell from the side. Probably the man had a dying delirium and soon he would lose consciousness and die the death of the mighty. Leo found the man's behavior strange as he smelled the stew that he thought his wife had stewed for him. His wife doesn't understand him. There isn't even a morsel of food nearby, and his nonsense seems very out of character. He pressed his crazy face to the floor, along which a pleasant aroma was spreading, and like a dog he began to sniff and go to the source of the smell. The smell came from outside the locker room and the man understood this, which led to very bad consequences. The drool was released like a river and flowed, like a bear at the sight of honey, like a pervert at the sight of a beauty, like a fisherman at the smell of delicious fried fish. Everyone in the room is shocked. The wife tries to stop her husband and asks others to stop him. Suddenly, the man's strength awoke and he rushed to meet the smell, eagerly to absorb that source of the smell. A strange aroma filled the entire locker room and spread its aroma everywhere. The wife has already lost hope in her husband's rationality, and the others cannot understand what happened to the man and where he got so much strength from when he was so weak. Her face is full of despair and misunderstanding, as if she had some kind of hope and at the same moment lost it. She truly loves her husband with all her heart, is devoted to him with all her soul, and is even ready to step over fear and head towards danger. The doctors are worried about her and are trying to stop her, but she doesn't even listen to their words. She hopes that her husband will return to her safe and sound. One of the doctors suggests going there and scouting out the situation, since she is pregnant and it's worth keeping an eye on her. The feet of people began to take the first steps in order to leave these four walls for a long time and not huddle within these four walls and fight for the last piece of food. Something caused a strange reaction in Leo and even slightly scared his fearless Dr. Hart. He opened his mouth wide and was very, very surprised by what he saw. The thin legs of the loving wife began to give way. She felt bad as she spoke with great heaviness, but it is unknown what could have frightened her so much. All the food she had eaten during all this time came out and it was all just from what she saw. Now it is clear what frightened the girl so much. The man was eating the flesh of a dead man, which had long since rotted, and her already darkened blood was smeared on the walls of the hospital. He greedily eats piece after piece as if he had already become a real dead man. He was truly mad. Character, personality, appearance, everything changed in a matter of seconds. The real danger lay in wait among the survivors and was waiting for the right moment to metastasize. She should not experience strong worries, but she cannot do anything about it, since quite recently an absolutely reasonable husband turned into a terrible monster. He attacked her, not seeing his wife in front of him, but a victim, meat, food that once belonged to her husband, and now she will be food for the monster in the body of the father of her child. Leah will never forget this again. It left a big mark on the life of the blue-haired doctor. Leo is very angry with that man since he ate his own wife, who was pregnant and carrying his child, but still he cannot be blamed since his strength left him and the virus took over him, taking over his mind. Sam and Michael try to stop the guys from eating this smelly food since they already look terrible. John understands the danger of this situation and the fact that, having eaten zombie meat, they will sooner or later become dead and this cannot be avoided. John remembers his parents, and this causes him great pain, expanding his emptiness in his soul. As Clint's father eats piece by piece of rotted zombie flesh, his skin begins to darken, and his mind becomes dull. Drops of rain are dripping on him, but he doesn't care about everything around him. He's as if under the influence of psychotropic substances. He wants to get more and more high. Clint's mother tries to stop him from being devoured by zombies so that one of the pieces does not end up being his last. Clint doesn't let his mother near his father so that he doesn't hurt her and make things worse. She asks her son to save his father no matter how much pain he brings to Clint because he is above all this. She despaired because it is clear that Clint will never help this bastard since it is their fault that they raised him in such a way that he behaves like a child. All roots come from his parents and their upbringing. 
Clint looks down at his mother, showing his determination and the fact that he will definitely never help his father in anything. She looks with her puppy eyes and seems to be begging him for help with them, the fact that she is also to blame for all the incidents, but asks once again for help. The mother grabs his hand and continues to beg for help. She is ready to kneel before her son, and he only needs the death of his father so that he will rot under a layer of earth. Clint asks, in return for saving him to do him a favor, to tell him the truth in his matter. Clint remembered a certain night fifteen years ago that shocked our mother, as her pupils constricted greatly from what she heard. Clint asks if she begged this bastard to save him, if she asked for mercy towards Clint, so that at least once they would feel sorry for him. Clint is very puzzled, and he is fully expecting an answer. He is waiting for the truth from his mother. Without unclenching her hands, his mother continued to listen to the difficult question that her son asked her. He abruptly pulled his hand out of her palms, personifying his indifference towards her and continuing to trample her into the ground. She did not expect such harshness from her son and such rejection. Her heart pierced through the thickest spear. The mother pronounced his name with heaviness and sobbed heavily, since the question was truly difficult. And it was incredibly difficult for Clint himself, who endured all this, to bear this burden. She screamed with tears in her eyes that it was completely impossible to take and stand up for her little son, to take and save him, but not to regret it in the future. Clint's face wilted, but he's glad he heard the truth, and his mother continues to make excuses, in terms of the fact that she could have saved, but would have been dead by that moment. Clint expected this from his parents, who except for harm, did not extol anything into his life. No one will ever be able to save Clint's family, a ray of sun will never break through to them, their family, the dark side of the moon, all the worst that could happen in Clint's life. That's why the apocalypse is like a holiday for him. He throws his mother towards Michael and orders him to keep his eyes on her. Clint grabs a steel stake and prepares it for his vile father to finally solve the whole problem with him. The rest ask their friends and acquaintances to stop eating dead meat, but these madmen no longer see or hear anyone in front of them. Clint sticks a steel bayonet into the would-be dead man and ends his life. The madman's friend can't believe that Clint killed his ally so mercilessly and didn't show even an ounce of mercy. The corpse bleeding lost the last crumbs of its consciousness and its soul went to the next world. He tells the six that there is no need to waste time on him and let him be killed, which will kill him too. He remained silent and continued to drill Clint's back with his gaze. Clint is already approaching his bastard father and preparing his bayonet for an instant attack and the same instant kill. The father continues to consume the flesh of the zombies and receives ecstasy from the taste of dead meat, which has consumed his mind and made him a zombie. Clint looks with hatred at his next victim, who is bound to die sooner or later by his hand. Clint states that he hasn't seen such a familiar expression on his father's face for a long time. Blood and raindrops are dripping from his face. His skin has darkened, and he is not going to finish his meal, but is even thinking about continuing, although his mind has long left him. Clint is already swinging his bayonet and directing his attack towards the bastard. His face looks like he's on a real high, as if his brain has turned to crumb, like cockroaches from De Clorvos. Here is the face of a shameless man, humble and completely high. He absolutely does not care that his son is pointing a weapon at him. He does not care that there is a heavy downpour. He gets a big buzz. It struck Clint this expression on his face is worse than any horror. How you can bring yourself to such a state. Food began to burst out. That grin killed all the desire to kill him. He wants to grind him into dust. His father's face infuriated Clint. He wanted his soul to finally leave this dirty shell so that his father would commit suicide. Clint began to cry as this grimace reminded him of one of the events of his childhood. As a child, Clint also cried constantly, for which his parents were guilty of bringing everything to the point of absurdity. We were brought back into Clint's story 15 years ago, to the very night that Clint himself spoke of when he asked his mother a question. Here he is a real horror for the child in which Clint constantly lived. They whipped him, hung him on a rope, and dressed him in women's dresses. All this was done by some important person with her fetishes, who cannot restrain her sadistic inclinations, and his father rubs his hands waiting for something. Here is the impudent grimace of the father and his, apparently, client, who greedily licks his lips and praises this bastard for his son. 
Realizing that his boss got what he wanted, the father asks for something that this sadist promised him. The bastard asks his guards to bring Clint's father a certain suitcase with unknown contents. The father's face changed when bags of medicine began to fall from the suitcase, which gave him great peace and tranquility. The person is already impatient to start dessert. He wants to quickly and better get a better look at his victim of sadism. The father snorts the next dose of the drug, and the mother stands all tense and looks at all this, because she is afraid to move, to make an unnecessary movement. The sadist continues to praise his victim for his snow-white skin and scarlet blood, since these sights awaken in him the dirtiest animal instincts. Clint managed to bite the finger of the arrogant sadist, which is what he needed, since this freak has no right to touch the innocent body of a child. The pervert did not like this insolence and responded with a blow to his face calling Clint a bitch. But he was aroused by such insolence, no one treated him like that, and he decides to act harshly in the immobilized child. The bastard decided to do the unacceptable and put his hand under the skirt of a child who didn't even have time to do anything bad. He tries to get the bastard to stop, but his excitement cannot be stopped. This is where all the traumas come from. They all come from childhood. They all appear due to the fault of adults and their upbringing. But still difficult times give rise to strong people. The impudent face of a real freak. To whom only children are given, only children bring real pleasure to the freak. Clint's face speaks of all the worst emotions and feelings that he has experienced in his entire life with a terrible father, a real bastard. Something surprised our pervert. Something stopped his joy, lust, and greed. Something ended all his pleasure. It wasn't even surprise that came to the pervert's head. But anger, rage, which he wanted to pour out somewhere, he began to bare his teeth and rub them against each other. He did not expect that a man's body was hiding behind the women's clothes, that behind the snow-white skin and scarlet blood there was a boy, and this plunged him into anger. The mother is crying, the father is enjoying another dose, and the boss is angry, all the sins gathered in one room, lust, greed, despondency, anger, and so on, they all represent Clint's family, that's what he meant when he said that his family no one can ever be saved. The boss slams his father's face into one of the bags of drugs and he gets an even bigger buzz than before. He grabs him by the hair to interrogate him about why he was given a boy who does not give him the pleasure he deserves. The eyes became squinted, the mind became clouded, and rational logic completely disappeared, leaving only the instincts of the animal. The pervert throws Clint's father and his mother tries to catch the culprit of all the misfortunes in their family. The boss breathes a sigh of relief, but his rage has not left him, and he is ready to destroy everyone in their family. He understands that Dad got a big buzz because he sniffed out all the drugs that he brought him. The mother asks for forgiveness from the important person, since otherwise they will only face death at his hands, which will not cost him anything. He casts an angry glance at her, and apparently he takes out his anger on her. She will be his next victim. The boss grabs a sharp knife and prepares it for our mother, who cannot even protect her son, she stands further, bending her knees and apologizes, and he is already approaching her, and with every step he is getting closer and closer to put his blade to her neck. He puts a knife to her neck and says that she will never understand how he feels, what humiliation he received that night. The person's face darkened, he showed his true personality, a terrifying tyrant, a pervert, and all this is hidden behind a rich man who may be considered a good gentleman. Someone snatches a knife from the hands of a sadist, and he did not like such impudence. The slobbery bastard pulls out a knife, and it's no better, since the knife he has is even worse than the pervert's, since he's going to solve Clint's gender problem. Even the pervert was intrigued by a certain method of the scoundrel's father, since it was not without reason that he snatched the knife from his hands, certainly not in order to protect his wife. He already points a knife at Clint and says that after his birth, our dad began a series of failures and all the consequences were brought by the birth of Clint. He has lost his last strength to even speak and can only silently look at his distraught father who is already bringing the knife closer and closer to him. The father could have become a successful man if Clint and his mother had not appeared in his life. The tears don't have time to fall from Clint's face and his father says that it would be better if he were a girl and there wouldn't be any unnecessary problems. He lifts his skirt and brings a knife saying that with one movement of the knife, this problem can be solved. Clint begs to save him, begs his mother, 
calls her, and it's as if he's standing in front of him and is holding on with difficulty not to snatch her husband's hands. Mother cries and tries to stop her husband, but she does not have the strength to do this, since she understands the consequences of her actions. He noticed that the mother decided to say something against the actions of the father, and he did not like it, since he liked this child. But his only problem is that he is a boy. Mother froze and could not say anything in response to such contempt, only remained silent and silent. The boss liked his father's decision, and the blood began to boil again, as if it had been boiled and was evaporating from the temperature. Father is already licking his lips and preparing his knife to cut off what, in his opinion, is superfluous to Clint, what must be deprived of our Clint, his dignity. He began to scream even louder, with every second the pity for him manifested itself more and more, since such an attitude should not be towards a child. Clint has already come out of his memories and shouts to his father that he will never forgive him in his life. The bastard has already transformed and is already rushing towards Clint to kill him too. Clint understands that he has been sleeping for too long, and it is unlikely that anyone will help him. Someone will save him. Someone snatched Clint's bayonet, and it is unclear whether he is an enemy or an ally who has come to save him. The unknown person grabs Clint by the belt and tries to save him, which suggests that this is our savior. The stake is sent towards Papani to hit him and put an end to him once and for all. Incredibly, our savior turned out to be John, who, when necessary, will always come to the aid of his family and friends. The steel tip pierces the dead man's father and sends him on a long flight to heaven, where he will be sent to the very bottom of hell, burning with the flames of inferno. Everyone silently looks at the corpse of a dead man, who a minute ago was a man who could show signs of an intelligent person. John, silently looking at his father, puts Clint on his shoulder and carries him to the bus since they have already lost too many and they don't dare lose the commander. Everyone is trying to wake up Clint, and John orders them to hurry up and get on the bus and finally take their seats. Clint gets wet in the rain and realizes that it's all over with this bastard. He will no longer be in his life. He wipes away all the tears that have accumulated in him over a long time, and the moisture on his cheeks is hidden by the downpour, which has been pouring in every moment for a long time. Morning came. Birds flew out of the green crowns of the trees, as if the nightmare that had passed at night had evaporated the very second the sun appeared over the horizon. The steel chains that John used to pull the bus on his hump fell down, indicating that they had arrived somewhere. John dragged the bus all night to its destination and still arrived only in the morning and was probably very tired. One of the passengers noticed a very important thing. John led everyone to a cave, which for the first time would protect them from the next influx of zombies. The Sixes accompany Tim to the cave in order to explore the territory and shed light on the darkness in the gloomy cave. John takes responsibility for ensuring that everyone leaves the bus and goes to the cave. They found a place to stay for the night, but Tim seemed to still be without a roof over his head. He didn't even have a face. He was completely drooping because he had to obey John, the one whom he had despised and humiliated all his life. John is a real gentleman, as he is ready to carry his lady of his heart in his arms so that she does not have any problems with this. John and Alice agree to go inside and make themselves more comfortable, but Meg seems to be worried about something, as if that darkness does not give her peace, and she does not take her eyes off the cave. John was alarmed that Clint did not enter the cave with everyone, but rushed in a completely different direction, the darkness of the cave swallowed up all the light. Every ray of sun disappears without a trace in the darkness, in the darkness. But still, the inside of the cave is quite cozy, and everyone has already found a comfortable place for themselves, including John and his girls. John asked Meg and Alice to sit here, since he would need to leave, and clearly for what reason. Alice played sweetly and tickled her little sister, like a real big sister, like a loving mother comforts her beloved child. The exit from the cave is like a panoramic window, which gives a beautiful view of the scarlet sky during sunset, when the sun leaves us, disappearing behind the horizon. John has already left the cave and is going to visit Clint to understand what bothered him so much during the murder of his father. The majestic peaks of the mountains against the backdrop of the golden sky, whether if you get to the peaks you can find the gates to the divine gardens, to paradise. Clint found a great place to retire to admire the beautiful views of the mountains and their reflections in the river.
A warm breeze caresses your hair and develops it in the air, as if it is sweeping between thousands of trees in a dense forest. John is already on his way to Clint to ask him about what is going on in his head, what is bothering him so much that he has to sit alone on the bank of a babbling river and in front of a beautiful view of the sky. Clint already realized that it was John who approached him, and he decided to show his gratitude for the help he showed during the murder of his father. John goaded Clint with a caustic phrase. Clint tries to justify himself, but his grimace speaks for itself. He sat closer, and this puzzled Clint a little, since he could not expect sympathy from a zombie with a human mind. John decided to help Clint, to help him morally, because from Clint's mood one can understand that he is morally killed. The elements are at war in his soul, as if the butterflies in his stomach became brutal and began to suck the strength out of him. He was surprised by John's initiative, but more amazed that Clint had probably finally met someone to whom he could express what was on his soul. Clint looks down and he understands that a complex and difficult conversation cannot be avoided. Apparently, he decided to open up to his interlocutor. He decided to tell his dark story, which he would like to keep silent about. They sit opposite the river, which reflects the golden light of the sky and seems to show another world, where the clouds move in the other direction, and the current changes its direction in the other direction, the so-called looking glass. Clint admitted that he cried, but he didn't cry because his father died, which was obvious. John was surprised by Clint's words because he didn't talk about tears of happiness. Clint's face says that any minute now, he will laugh like a little child. His face will be filled with laughter. Clint choked, but was still delighted with John's understanding. He realized that he had found his zombie, whom he could trust. Sitting in front of such a view makes it very atmospheric to talk about difficult topics and thus gives them a great friendship bond that gets closer each time. At the first meeting, Clint thought about why it was John, why he was the chosen one among so many people, what fate owed him so much to give him a new life in the body of a zombie. John continued to listen to Clint in silence as this conversation interested him a little. Clint calls him unusual because he was able to sympathize with him, which suggests that few people are capable of this, but he is already an unusual person with the body of a dead man and his strength. John continues to belittle Clint with his snarky remarks because he thinks he's special, and John is right to point this out to him. Clint was infuriated by this attitude towards his injuries and towards him in general. He straightened his shoulders wide and said in a relaxed manner that he had absolutely no sympathy for Clint and that Clint was completely right. Clint did not like this news since he expected reciprocity from his interlocutor but received a complete refusal. John looked up and began his magnificent quotes with great meaning, as if inspiration had struck him from heaven, and under its influence he began his story. There are a lot of analogies in the world, and the fact that someone can be truly fearless, and someone can be a weakling, is as commonplace as it is meaningless, since fate can turn in any direction. The weakling will become strong and fearless, and the fearless one will crawl at his feet, Everything changes every time, and what was a second ago is already meaningless. Fate pushes you forward, but the choice is yours. Live in the past, or keep pace with fate. Those whose eyes were full of hope lost everything within one second. The whole life of the moment and the past will already play a role only in the form of a lesson, but definitely not to dwell on it. Here he mentioned his parents, whether everything that was in their eyes disappeared after Armageddon. John finished his thought well that the whole past is meaningless. Everything that a person is driven by has no logic. While your legs are moving you, while your heart is beating in your chest and while your torch is burning, you need to find fuel to saturate it, that there is a goal that will make you move on. John's train of thought amazed Clint greatly, as it was rare to hear such a good thought from a dead person. He breathed a sigh of relief and decided to ask John if he wanted to listen to his story. John is not at all interested, and he is already moving away so as not to hear Clint's whining about his sad life. Clint tells him to sit down and listen to him, since their conversation has already gone too far and they shouldn't waste time with him. The crescent moon peeks out behind the cave while they were talking. It was deep night. Everyone had already lit fires and were getting ready for bed, warming the inner walls of the cave and warming themselves up before the cold night. Michael points out that it's time to go to bed, 
since they've been without sleep for a couple of days and don't even have the strength to go get food. But everything will be the next day. Sam absolutely agrees with Michael, yawning as he gets ready for bed. Alice put John's little sister to bed and was already at the limit of her strength, getting ready for bed. Tim was completely depressed. It was unclear whether he had planned something or had lost his dignity, lost his faith in the future. Michael and Sam were already drooling by the fire and looking at the seventh dream. Incredibly, Tim found a way out even in such a hopeless situation. Even now he found a piece of glass and hid it in his possession to use at the most inconvenient moment. John and Clint blithely warm themselves by the fire and look at the river, while Clint continues his story in parallel. Clint, finishing the story, said that from the moment his father approached him with a knife, he promised himself that he would kill him at any cost, that his death would be inevitable. The bastard father is a real freak, even among zombies. John was shocked by Clint's cruel story. Even the emotionless zombie was moved by such a story. But still, he was more worried about whether Clint's soldier was in line, whether he had a glass of wine. Clint was petrified by such a sudden question, as if the ancient Medusa had cursed him to live in the shell of a statue. Clint does not consider such information very important, and very persistently asks him to focus on the gravity of the story and not think about the soldiers. John considers this information very important, more important than the whole story as a whole. Clint said that due to the large dose, his father's hands were shaking like a sick person, and he only made a lot of cuts at his feet. He crossed his arms as if nothing had happened and that his dignity was in place. John silently listens to him, but you can feel his distrust of Clint's words. John, keeping his eyes on Clint, continued to listen to him since his story was indeed quite interesting, but the questions about his worth were much more interesting. He became a little sad and began to look at Clint's belt, but Clint realized that John did not believe him and shouted at him. Clint doesn't see any way to prove to John that he's doing well and that everything is in place, except by actually showing it all by lowering his pants, and John tries to stop him. Still, John only lowers his pants even further and sees a leg in front of him which is covered in scars as confirmation of his story. Both remained silent, and then, the awkward situation stuck a lump in their throats. If anyone saw them, they would be branded on their backs, like a couple who loved the open countryside. John instantly jumped away from Clint, their eyes darkened, both crossed their arms, and Clint didn't even have time to lift his pants. The silence did not stop, only their position changed, the atmosphere in the air was just as tense. John glanced at Clint, his long hair blowing in the forest breeze like a current blowing seaweed at the bottom of the oceans. He looked at Clint's scars, the many cuts that had been caused fifteen years ago by his freak of a father who, God willing, was basking in the hellfire of Inferno. Clint noticed this look on himself and offered him something that could take off his panties if he didn't trust him in any way, but John turned his gaze to the side to personify the refusal of the offer. John still asked the question that Clint's scars date back to the time his father started cutting him. Clint indifferently answered him that this was true. The child's blood flowed from deep wounds inflicted on him by his own father, who did not care what to sell or how. He needed drugs and was ready to do anything for them, even cripple his son. Clint tries to kick in front of him, but his father needs to move away from this state, since his eyes are already squinted, and the picture in his eyes is floating like an oil painting in the rain. Little Clint's eyes were empty. Even the tears stopped flowing. The strength to kick was gone, and his father continued to try to cut off his dignity while he could only watch, hanging on the ropes. He's a real madman. Even now he's trying to convince his boss to continue working with him and dealing with his child. The pervert clearly indicates that Clint cannot be helped and such people will never arouse his interest again. He gives him a strong blow and sends him to his bags of joy-giving drugs. He, like a fish falls towards the red bags and begins to swim, breathing through his gills. The drug killed the person in him, and this is its most dangerous side effect. The worst thing is that after taking such drugs, the person's personality evaporates the very second he gets his high. He was thrown to the floor, but he continues to laugh. There is no longer a person in him. For him, the zombie apocalypse began much earlier. The bodyguard offers to kill Clint's father, but he especially likes the way he behaves. He is intrigued by how he can control a person with his money and capabilities. Finally, the pervert leaves the place of torture of the child, straightening his tie. 
He leaves the house and takes the guards with him. Clint was in the torture room. He was beaten with a whip. He was stared at. He was cut in front of his own eyes. And all this in one night, during the most miserable night of his life. His eyes are like diamonds, pure, in plan. They are pure because of the emptiness to them. In his eyes there is nothing. Not a sparkle of hope, nothing. Only emptiness that has absorbed the best in him. Now there is a sparkle in his eyes. The emptiness has been eclipsed against the backdrop of endless rage. He is ready to destroy everything and everyone in front of him. John slaps his cold hand on his leg as if there was something there. John's behavior is very strange, since he was already lowering Clint's pants, and now he is touching his bare leg for no reason. Clint was shocked. He was in a very awkward situation. His face immediately changed to one of incredulity. John pointed out that he caught a mosquito on his leg. Clint probably wouldn't like this, and he definitely wouldn't consider such actions normal. As expected, Clint is furious. He definitely doesn't like such closeness, and even more so such impudence. John's gaze seemed to sense something, as if a sixth sense suddenly made him nervous. He looked back. Since for a long time they had not explored what was going on in the cave, since their enemies were also located there. Clint was intrigued by John's words, since it was indeed too quiet and Tim had not made any sounds for a long time. Everything becomes clearer in John's gaze. He feels something bad, but it's probably already too late, since a lot of time has already passed. It can't be, the bus disappeared into nowhere, this all says one thing, yet Tim got free, which doesn't bring any good news. John grabbed Clint's hand and slammed it harshly into the ground, as if he himself had become an enemy in a matter of seconds. Clint's entire palm continues to bleed scarlet blood. It is unknown why he needed Clint's blood, that he decided to wound him at the most unexpected moment. John smears Clint's hand on his face, asking him to lend him some of his blood. The bus is already rushing at full speed. Stones and dust are flying in different directions from the incredible speed that the bus has developed. Tim's gang kidnapped John's sister, and apparently she was not the only one who fell into the clutches of the insatiable Tim. And so it turned out, Alice was also stolen by them, and they are already beginning to tie her to the seat. Six at the wheel tells Tim not to worry about John, since they have already gone far, far from the cave, and it is unlikely that anyone will catch up with them. Tim silently listened to the words of his subordinate and continued to sit and not make a sound. They were able to start the engine of the half-destroyed bus, which is probably considered a great success for them. There are traces of ropes on Tim's wrists, as if he had been put in a stone bag for life, handcuffed, constricting his every movement, but he was able to get out by finding a loophole. Meg's screams pretty much pissed Tim off, and he even had to be distracted by her, since even his subordinate barked at her. Tim listened to the complaints of his six that the little one was constantly yelling and hinting that they should get rid of her, since they were sure that her brother would definitely not return. He looked to the side angrily, as if his hawk's gaze pierced the soul and made his victim shake in horror. Tim, for some unknown reason, approached Alice. What did he want to do because he had seen a lot over time and would definitely not be merciful to her? He looked up at her, piercing her with his sharp gaze, as if devouring her from the inside with his pressure. She doesn't care about this at all. She behaves as usual. Nothing puts pressure on her and she doesn't feel its pressure on herself in any way. Her gaze turned out to be stronger, her fearlessness won in the fight with him, as if a lion and a panther met their gazes, neither of them knows who is capable of what, but the panther turned out to be stronger with its charisma. After Tim's order to shut Meg up, Alice added fuel to the fire with her caustic phrase about Tim's fear, the main fear from which he is now moving far away, never to meet it on his way again. The pressure in Tim's blood jumped, his veins bulged. Soon her words would be dying words, since it was easier to piss Tim off than to escape from the sleeping guards and steal a bus. Tim clearly indicated that he would easily find a way to torment them, and it would not be difficult for him to find a hobby for himself. And he would not care whether she was a little girl or a lady once loved with all her heart. Suddenly, Tim makes a strong slap in the face to Meg, and he definitely won't get well from John after this. He will pay for his impudence. John will send him to look for parts of the bodies of his sixes in the mountains in the bitter cold. Poor sister, what a vile character Tim is, even if he can be understood since his brother was killed by Clint. But only Clint is to blame for his death. Why do you need to take it out on the poor girl? 
Alice continues to provoke Tim and asks him to take his anger out on her, and not on a defenseless child. Tim hit the nail on the head. Alice is here as a bird and she should remain silent, since it is to her that he will no longer be merciful, since she betrayed him, although she was never even his property. With his gaze, he definitely made Alice's heart beat faster as a result of the adrenaline in her blood, which made her tremble from the overflow of energy. Light from the fires was coming out of the cave, and John and Clint just entered it in order to scout out the situation inside. Sam was drooling due to a long lack of sleep and passed out literally in a matter of seconds, as a result of which Tim and the whole gang ran away and took Meg and Alice into their hands. Clint is cruel to them and is ready to wake them up with a kick in the stomach so that they don't sleep so sweetly. He clenches his fists in anger at Sam, because why is he sleeping while people are being stolen from under their noses? Sam has no idea who took him, who he took, what he is accused of. He is completely at a loss, and Clint is already preparing a couple of strong blows on him. Michael also jumped up as if sleep paralysis had overtaken him but Clint turned out to be worse than him and he was able to get out of oblivion. Sam continues to make excuses to Clint and believes that they are not useless. It's just that Tim is cunning to look for, and they didn't keep track of them due to fatigue. Michael and Sam continue to report to him, but Clint ignores all this. Since their fatigue is not important to him, what is important to him is where Tim and the whole gang with the hijacked bus are. No matter how hard Clint is with Tim, no matter how hard Clint deals with Tim, Sam decides to give advice that he needs to be tougher with Tim, and only recently he killed his brother without any regret. Clint was infuriated by Sam's words. He would definitely be in trouble after his words. Clint grabbed Sam by the hair and reminded him that he had just recently killed Will, his little brother, and now he was being tough on him. Still, he got what he deserved, and Clint punched Sam in the nose to shake out his never-ending mind. Michael tries to console Sam, and Sam himself is in pain, as Clint's blow is very strong. Clint doesn't care what his allies think. He found himself a certain team, a new team, a replacement for them. She and John are already one whole, a symbiosis. Together, they are capable of anything. Clint has already made up his mind. His decision is unshakable. He is definitely ready to become John's team, but for what reason? Now it is clear that Clint's blood, which John smeared on his eye, turned out to be some kind of enhancement. His eye turned red and his pupil white, like the moon around the bloody sky. The crescent moon floating in the sky faintly covered the dark and dense forest with its pale moonlight. Tim and the gang apparently decided to pause and rest, since they are completely confident that John will never catch up with them again. The bus was rushing at full speed. The speed was amazing. For a broken bus, it was very strong, as if fate itself was pushing their car. An unexpected bump stopped all the speed and power of the bus. All passengers are heavy on their feet and begin to fall off their feet. One of the gang orders the driver to drive the bus more carefully, but he cannot drive carefully, since they are in the mountains and there are no roads. The shaved man remained silent, but something alarmed him behind the front window of the bus. They drive along some path without any navigation where the wheels are brought. That's where they go. Suddenly, the driver sees such a picture. He sees their worst nightmare in front of him. John still managed and caught up. This is the power of the symbiosis of Clint and John. The shaved man screams at the top of his voice as if he saw death in front of him, which is almost true. The wheels of the bus finally stopped. The six's heart not only froze, but also their foot went numb on the brake pedal. An abrupt stop is unlikely to leave passengers alone, and the shaven man may get hit on the bald head a couple of times for such an oversight. Tim approached the six and began to be indignant at what made him stop so suddenly. The shaved man is breathing very heavily, since their main enemy was in front of his eyes. Just one sight terrified him. Even Tim is not so scared. Six says that he was stopped by the silhouette of a familiar dead man. John showed up for just a moment and already stopped an entire bus. Tim was shocked by the news from the six. He was very scared. The possibility of John catching up with them did not even creep into his thoughts. He could not imagine this in any of the variations of further events. He still can't believe it, because it's hard to imagine even in a dream. Before Tim's eyes, the bushes rustled strangely, something that definitely should have kicked his heart into his boots. Meg's cheek is very red. She's trying hard to call him. It is unknown how strong Tim's blow was. 
She doesn't have time to scream when the fat man covers her mouth, but she still tries to mutter at least something. The fat man shouts to the shave man to hurry up, start the engine, and drive into the very distance. Suddenly, the glass breaks and its fragments have already pierced the fat man's face, which does not have any good consequences for him. He is trying to react to a sudden attack from the side. John spectacularly bursts into the bus cabin through the window and is ready to send all the kidnappers to the afterlife. The fat man screams at the top of his voice to meet John, since he can hammer nails into the lid of his coffin with his strength alone. John is preparing a strong blow for the fat man. Excess weight will definitely never save him. His face turns to mush, his teeth fly in different directions, and the speed of his fall leaves behind mirages. John sent the fat man to the wheelchair, where he will sit for the rest of his life. John's strength amazes time after time, since it takes a lot of strength to send such a massive carcass flying. Tim's heart began to beat faster. His six had already lost all their spirit. Only snot and drops of sweat were released more and more. A strong dent was left on the fat man's face, indicating that he had been knocked down by a blow of superhuman strength. Steam flowed from John's fist. He was ready to send every passenger except his girls into the world of dreams. Meg was wounded, but he freed one of the captives. The main thing is that he did not forget about the second. Meg was very glad that John had come, but she did not doubt his strength. In any case, he would have come running and saved her in the shortest possible time. He sat her down on the seat and asked about her cheek, what happened to it while he was not around. Meg is such a strong girl that she even endured a blow from an adult man and remained just as kind and sweet. Tim still managed to capture Alice, which is very bad for John, since she is one of the best hostages for John to intimidate. He heard the screams of Alice, who called him with her angelic voice. Tim put that same shard of glass to the delicate skin of Alice's neck and began to threaten that he would kill her if John came even one step closer. John is not so far away. He only needs to make one jerk in their direction, and he is not a survivor, but he will not risk his beloved. She is calm even at a moment when she is on the blade of a knife, when there is a shard of glass at her neck. Tim knows how to threaten his opponents. It's not for nothing that he took them with him. John remained silent once again. It was with him that he was not so talkative. He breathed a sigh of relief, preparing to talk with his longtime abuser. John began his dialogue with Tim and decided to mention that Meg told him that he cut off Alice's leg to save her. But what's strange is that he's the one who's now putting a shard of glass to her neck. Meg silently sits in her place and eagerly awaits the end of the brawl. John was sure that Tim was a bastard, but he was also sure that even he would have something he wanted to protect. But again, he was disappointed. John stepped on Tim's heels with every step, which he definitely shouldn't do. Tim pointed out that it would be better for John not to come closer as he continued to interpret his speech. John asks the question over and over again why Tim threatens to kill the one he loved and protected. The fragment is getting closer to Alice, and Tim continues to yell so that John finally understands that there is no need to move one step closer. The shrapnel had already pierced her skin, and a small stream of blood flowed down her neck, which meant that Tim was serious. Meg instantly became worried about Alice and screamed loudly so that Tim would not lay a finger on her. John is very angry. He clenches his teeth and could have done at least something, rushed into battle without delay. Tim put the fragment to his neck and decided to tell him why he was doing this, the motive for his actions. From birth, he was a spoiled child. He had everything, and now he just wants everything at once. Tim's words startle his sixes, but they understand that it is better for them to remain silent. On the one hand, Tim could dominate and take the desired girl, but John, in his opinion, is a bug who stood in his way. He continues to mock John because he considers his way of thinking stupid, and he himself is arrogant and a complete scoundrel. He points out that John can protect her if he can, and if not, he can destroy her. John realized that there would be no meaningful conversation with him. They would always be fire and water for each other. They had nothing in common, like two boots of a pair, but both looked in different directions. Alice suddenly grabbed Tim's hand as if she was planning something. She turned in him, which greatly alarmed Tim himself, since he could not have expected this. She told him over and over again that she always hated arrogant people like Tim. These words made Tim very angry, and he was ready to plunge this fragment into her, making the deepest wound in her entire life. She also pointed out that she and John had not seen each other for a long time, 
and he had probably forgotten what a fighting woman she was, that she could put down a crowd of the dead with a swing of her blade. John said her name, not understanding what she meant. She smiled sweetly and decided to remind him of everything through her actions. The cute look instantly changed to the one that killers use before killing, when they show their determination to kill the enemy. Tim was very surprised since he had not seen Alice in anger for a long time. She says that she herself is able to stand up for herself. At the same time, she sticks her fingers into Tim's old wound, from which screams, screams, and attempts are heard from his mouth. She jumped up on one leg, even better than some with a pair of healthy legs. Even if her loved one came to save her, she is not at all a weak flower to wait for protection from him. She herself will put Tim down in a couple of snaps of her fingers. John was incredibly surprised, although he had already seen her abilities, but even so his jaw hung, and he couldn't say a word. Tim's legs are already falling along with him, which means that Alice defeated Tim in an instant. Divinely beautiful and strong, like a Valkyrie capable of defeating hundreds of warriors and fluttering like a butterfly and stinging like a bee, Tim will definitely not go to heaven for warriors as he lost to our beauty in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Once again, the spoiled boy lost the battle between John and Alice. She reigned on him like on a throne. Now you can hang his head on the wall like a pedestal of honor. She is breathing heavily after such a battle, since she has not practiced for a long time, and problems with her leg did not give her the opportunity to train. Tim misunderstood when she couldn't answer him sooner. Previously, she was lenient towards him, which is why she did not respond to his every blow. Alice set foot towards her goal, to see her beloved, as a result of which she never resisted. John and Meg are at a loss, or rather it is impossible to describe their emotions. The family of strong people is amazing. A strong woman needs a strong man. She beamed as she was able to approach John. Now everyone was saved. Perhaps even Alice herself could be saved alone. John met her gaze, the eyes of a loving man, their gaze like a hot kiss that should be dessert at the end of the battle. Meg admires Alice. She would never have thought that her little sister could move so gracefully and hit hard at the same time. Everyone was pleased with the spectacle and the battle itself. Everyone was delighted. Alice effectively stood in a pose so that the blood of all those who admired her would boil and their hearts would boil in this boiling water. They finally return to the cave to everyone alive and unharmed. Tim is thrown to the ground because his behavior contributed to their attitude towards him. He is very angry at everything and everyone. He lost again. He again lost the opportunity to get everything and everyone. Michael decided to ask what about Tim, what he would do with him. Clint angrily pulled out a knife and said that he would kill him in the very near future. Clint is very angry with Tim's gang because even when they spared them for their own benefit, Tim still found the strength to hijack a bus and kidnap the girls. Tim is even more frightened, as if not an ordinary knife blade is rushing at him, but a large guillotine blade, as if the executioner is already ready to cut off the head of the judge. John again decided to spare Tim. It is unknown whether this is a mistake or he knows the use of him. Clint was puzzled by why John decided to forgive Tim and the whole gang, because they were the ones who stole his girls. It turns out that John needed Clint to tell him about a certain city bee before killing him, the same suitcase that was stolen from Clint by Tim, but still Clint was able to take it from Tim. What is he hiding? There are many secrets in it, and this is obvious. John looks with interest at the secret suitcase, which contains something he needs. Clint, opening the case, says that this is a treasure chest that contains everything John needs. He easily snaps open the suitcase, which closes with strong latches to hide the contents. Not everything is so important there. Ordinary things soared into the skies, including even strange things for a boy. Clint is definitely unhappy that he decided to open his case in front of him, since he could not have expected such an eruption of things. John's head also suffered from the sudden attack of the suitcase. Even the suitcase dared to attack the sentient zombie. John is at a loss. He can't understand why Clint needs so many unnecessary things, sometimes even children's ones. Clint is very embarrassed. He couldn't expect this, and he has to justify it by saying that every person can have all these things, and sometimes you can find even worse ones than him. He again rummages through his things in order to find something important there that worries John so much and what he so wants to know about. Incredibly, he pulled out the radio and apparently she will be the one who will tell everything in City B. Clint turned on the radio and began to switch it, but in response she only hissed. 
He connected to the station of City B, and she finally announced that everyone who hears this message should hurry to the city, since they have a lot of space and goods. John was intrigued by the message and wondered if it was true that they could be protected there, or if it was a trap. Everyone was surprised or glad, since in City B it would be possible to accommodate up to 20,000 people, but still they received this message about a month ago, which could refute the relevance of the information. He abruptly throws the radio at John and says that the radio is old and it's quite hard to hear anything on it. John catches his feed, continuing, listening to all the information about the radio from Clint. John turns out to be an expert in old radios, as he even knows that older models do not have sound recordings, which confirms its age. John is haunted by the question of what binds Clint and Tim together, what constitutes their connection, what is it based on. Clint didn't immediately understand who John was talking about who he managed to unite him with. Clint pointed at Tim and hit the nail on the head because there was no connection between them. He smiled and apparently decided to start a new story, only this time about Tim and his story that connects them. It's not for nothing that Tim calls himself a spoiled child. After all, his father is the ruler of City B, to which their new path leads them. Tim's father has great power in his hands because it is not for nothing that his son is so arrogant and everything is allowed to him. Incredibly, how could the ruler of City B be Tim's father? At that very moment, Tim grinned with satisfaction. John immediately cried out how it was that his father, Tim's father, turned out to be the ruler. Immediately after John's screams, a fist flies into Tim's face with such force that even his father's power will not help save him from it. How senseless is the power that he had. John and Clint mock Tim because they cannot believe such information. He cannot be the son of the head of the city. A strong blow hit Tim. This will definitely make him reconsider a couple of dreams, and if he's lucky, he'll even reconsider his views on his behavior. Shave decided to stand up for his older brother, and even decided to threaten Clint and John, since as soon as they arrived in City B, they would definitely not be welcome. He gritted his teeth and promised to tell Tim's father everything they did to them. Clint and John look down on them so that they don't think too much of themselves. Clint easily finds a solution for the shaved man, just kill them before they get to City B, and that's it. John is merciful as always, although he just recently sent Tim into the world of dreams with one blow. Clint doesn't like the way John acts. He wants to solve them as quickly as possible, make a sieve out of them and not worry about it again. Tim is already rising after a short period of oblivion, and John even thinks that they could be useful. The fat man is still recovering from John's strong attack, and the dent in his face will take a long time to heal, but still John hit the wrong person who injured Meg. John looks around at the inhabitants of the cave and realizes that the road to City B is very long. But it is worth it, since perhaps it is an oasis for them in the middle of the desert. A young mother is rocking her hungry son, who urgently needs to find food, and indeed they all need to find food and provisions. John assesses the situation sensibly and understands that he cannot force children and mothers to get food on their own. Tim didn't like John's idea. He was ready to die, but he would never work for him. Shaven tries to stop Tim, as he is clearly at a disadvantage to show his character, but Tim doesn't care about his words. His pride is higher than that. John also did not like such impudence and turns his furious gaze towards him. The shaved man is already shaking with fear, and Tim was suppressed by the fact that he so instantly turned his attention to him. John had already gathered his fingers into a fist, and with every step he was getting closer and closer to Tim. He looked down at him contemptuously and asked him if he couldn't wait to die, if he wanted it. Tim continues to defy Jonah, saying that it is better to die than to wander at his feet for the rest of his days. John leaned towards him, which indicates that he was clearly in trouble, as he had made him very angry. He looked him straight in the eyes and asked him when he would die, how quickly it would happen. Tim was surprised by this question. He could not expect anything from the once merciful, once cruel John. John's cruelty has taken its toll. He is ready to crush his skull against the walls of the cave, turning it into bone meal, so that at least his bones can become fertilizer for new plants. John's hand is already very close to Tim. He will be in great pain from such a blow. What will happen after such an attack on Tim? What will happen to Tim in the future? Does he have a future as John's main opponent? No one could have expected this from John, 
since only recently he had forgiven all of Tim's antics over and over again, and now he had smeared his head, leaving cave paintings with his blood. In the cloud of dust, only Tim's legs are visible. It is unknown whether he is alive or whether his lifeless body with porridge instead of a head is already ready to leave his remains to his ancestors. The shaven man began to cry over the death of their brother, since it was he who constantly protected them from all bad weather, no matter how ugly he was. Tim's screams came out of the clouds of dust, which meant only one thing. John spared him. Otherwise, there was no other way since he simply could not miss. Tears of sadness gave way to tears of happiness. Shaven and the Sixes can no longer help but rejoice that their brother was reborn after death. Still, Tim is afraid of his death. Since he is shaking for himself the most, his life is most dear to him. The pupils constricted very much. He was very scared as he was on the verge of death. His whole life flashed before him. It was like a rebirth or a second birthday for him. John stood up impressively and is preparing a second blow to teach Tim a lesson once again. Maybe right now Tim will be afraid of death. Now he will be afraid to look into her eyes. Tim feels like he's on a roller coaster, and every time he descends from the high part of it, he squeals like a little child. It's already the third descent for Tim, and he still doesn't understand that it's better to obey, and it's even better to be useful, otherwise death. When it comes to him, it must eventually dawn on his stupid head that his pride will only destroy him. And again a fist flies at him, like the scythe of death itself, it takes his life. But he is already running away from John's attack. What is he so afraid of? Before he said something completely different. Why not die for real? What is keeping him in this world? Tim collapses and falls towards his sixes who can only shout brother and brother. Another crack has spread in the cave, and John is so strong that he cracks the walls like an eggshell. John explains that Tim does not understand what death is at all. He even wonders how insidious it can be. Tim thinks that he is the most fearless and can easily fight her, but this is definitely not the case. John even tries to teach his enemies what they lack. He even tries to teach stupid Tim. Real death acts very insidiously. It silently waits for the moment when you stop expecting it. And it attacks suddenly when you don't even have time to grieve. That's how terrible it is. Death overtakes everyone, and everyone's path will end at different times. One person's path is full of thorns. Another's is full of wealth. But the end is the same for everyone. A rope, soap, a stool. Everything that you can admire forever is torn to pieces before your eyes, and death is to blame for everything. He grabs Tim by the shoulder, which scares him even more. Tim is not afraid of death, because he considers it a moment. But he knows nothing, and John is not the last in matters of death, and like no one else, knows everything about it. John realizes that Tim doesn't care at all about his words, he turns away from him and leaves. Even if he is not patient, he makes a promise that he will not beat him to death. For John, there is not much joy in his life, but he enjoys it sincerely. He does not demand more as he will end up losing it all to a greater extent. He understands that Tim will not give them peace and decided to send the girls to sleep on the bus, keeping an eye on them. Meg is very happy about this news, since her brother hasn't put her to bed for a long time. All the inhabitants of the cave watch as John silently leaves with his girls. Even Leo was frightened by John's speech and kept it quiet until he was far away from them. Clint orders Leo to shut up. It is unknown why he is doing this to Leo, but for him it is strange. It turns out that Clint admires John with all his heart for his reasonableness and toughness. Clint's admiration was stopped by a certain voice that came from behind him. Tim isn't Tim if he doesn't remain silent and try to turn the crowd against John. Tim says that John is playing giveaway with everyone, but in fact he is waiting for the moment to kill everyone. After such a disgrace, his own blood has only just dried, and he is already preparing his Protestant speech. Clint liked Tim's speech, or rather, he was very tired of it. Clint was impressed by Tim's persistence and fearlessness. John was right. He couldn't care less. He thinks Tim is a dog who just can't shut up, and he's just one of a kind. Who does Tim think he is when Clint is considered the boss here and he gives him a slap in the face similar to the slap in the face that Tim gave Meg? Clint sends Tim to the corner for punishment, but he's not a kid anymore, so he still needs to throw a kick to hurry up to his corner. The little sister splashes in the cold, truly sincerely enjoying every second of her pampering. She notices the beauty that the river reflects, the moon and stars that fall behind the reflection of the river. 
Meg calls her friend Alice to show her endless joy. Alice takes care of her so that she is more careful, and she actually behaves like a real mother. Meg, in response, expresses her consent, but there is no limit to her childish pranks. It is impossible for her to set boundaries. The friend smiles sweetly back, waving at her in greeting. John was silent, and this somehow bothered Alice that she decided to examine him in detail. She thanked him for which he never understood. He was left confused with just one thank you as he couldn't have expected such frankness so suddenly. Now everything is clear. She thanked him for the fact that John was looking for her and eventually found her. Wasn't it fate, even after such gratitude? She herself shone brighter than the moon in the sky. Finally, a bright smile appeared on John. At first he was confused, but his chest became warmer because of the pleasant words of such a beauty. John has something hidden in his pocket and is trying to find it so he can show it to Alice. What is this? It shocked Alice greatly. She was very confused, as if he had taken out a wedding ring. This is the same bandage that Alice had on before the apocalypse, which was stolen from her by a zombie, and John carefully kept it, as if it was leading him to her, like a guiding star leading him to the north. After waking up, the first thing that caught his eye was a bandage that was eerily similar to Alice's bandage. Maybe it was then that he began to have hope of saving her. John, without any regret, snatches the bandage from the bloodthirsty mouth of the dead man, not giving him a chance to survive. Still, he was wounded by the news that visited his head. He could not believe that his loved one could so easily pass away without leaving a trace behind. Later, one of the survivors made it clear that John was definitely no longer a human and indeed a zombie. He was something in between, a zombie with a human mind. His soul was divided into two parts, a dead man who had the mind of a man and a man with the power of a real dead man. His life was divided into before and after. His despair knew no bounds. He tightly clutched the bandage to get rid of such thoughts. John is not pleased to admit that fate has awarded him such an opportunity to survive. It has turned him into another dead man, and it is unclear whether it would be better for him to die or wander in the body of an irrational zombie. Alice puts her hand on his strong shoulder, trying to reassure him in every possible way. His desire to find his sister and Alice knew no bounds. His heart could not just bark once, and it would humbly calm down. He searched blindly, walking wherever his feet carried him. The worst scenarios of events visited his head. Alice was very frightened by what John experienced, what he had to overcome on the way to them. John hugged his beloved tightly, tightly, fully expressing his affection, his sincerity, his joy that they were found alive and not remains on one of the streets. She did not expect such sincerity from him. She was also shocked. She was confused. She never thought that she could feel the warmth from her beloved again. He is on the verge, as if any minute he will burst into tears, and all these tears will fall on the shoulders of the beauty. He thanked her again, but she silently smiled and was also very happy about this opportunity. Alice stroked his head, running it through his silky locks, calling him a puppy, which was very, very sweet. He doesn't really like it when they call him a little dog or worse. Her kind smile does not fade from her sweet face. She continues to delight him and enchant him with her unearthly beauty. Even here, John is depressed. Supposedly, he cannot be like a cute dog since he is dead to himself. She doesn't think so. She doesn't see the downsides of John being a zombie. She touches his cheek, expressing her sincerity in the words she speaks. Even if he is a zombie, he never ceases to be kind, strong, and most importantly, even in the body of a dead man, he remains human. The kindest feelings are written on his face. He has not heard such words in his direction for a long time. His heart beat faster. It is precisely such words that give endless motivation to protect what is dear. Everything around was shining. Wet lips were reaching out to each other. The most significant moment was about to happen any minute. It could not be avoided. A couple of centimeters separate them. Even in a dark night, they shine like dawn in the early morning. But it's still an eclipse. Meg stops this spectacle and points out that John wants to bite Alice. She has no idea what is happening here. She seemed to want to help. But she stands there in complete bewilderment, silently. John asks her to go play a little, and Alice, embarrassed, cannot even glance at Meg. The little sister will not stand aside and will always give practical advice. She immediately warns Alice not to allow John to bite her. You see, a foul odor will come from her mouth. John is not happy with this news and is completely furious at his little sister's words. 
Suddenly, a knife is already flying from the side, an enemy or another joker who decided to stick a knife in the back. John is not so weak as not to catch such a childish attack. Even in complete ignorance, he is ready to catch a bullet that flies in front of his eyes. Again this Clint, his ability to intervene at the most inconvenient moments is amazing. He arrived in time like never before to throw a knife at an ally, in time for privacy with his beloved. Elia and John recognize a familiar silhouette. It can be recognized from a thousand, and its impudence from millions. He clearly doesn't care, but still apologizes to them for interrupting their intimacy. Even when he wants to sleep, he will give his friend some attention to play a little joke on him. That's all, Clint. John asked more than once to give him at least a little free space. For some unknown reason, Clint took the scissors with him. Something had crept into his head again and John might not like it. Here it is an evil grin. All his evil intentions have been revealed. He wants to deprive John of a couple of silky strands from his head. John cannot react to this in any way other than with apprehension. When the scissors are in Clint's hands, you can't expect anything good from him. What has gotten into his skull? The hair is already lying on the cold stone floor, which means that the haircut is already over. Clint wanted to do one thing, but it turned out completely different, leaving everyone nearby in shock, whether from minute to minute they would pour out laughter. What is John's transformation after Clint's masterful haircut? What will make them all laugh out loud? Apparently Clint did what he wanted. It turned out very funny. The brutal zombie turned into a cute, long-haired teenager. Everyone is already trying hard not to laugh at John. They are trying not to reveal their emotions. But this does not help them, since they literally have everything written on their faces. Everything is in vain. Sam and Michael are already tearing their stomachs with laughter. This reaction is typical. Anyone in their place would not have been able to restrain themselves. Alice, Leo, Meg, and Clint hold back their emotions, clutching their own mouths so as not to laugh out loud. Since he received only ridicule from his friends, he can only admire himself in the reflection of the river. What is going on in his head? What did Clint do? Clint is not a master hairdresser. He is a master at ridicule. He has a talent for this. Even John himself laughed. What an irony. Clint is very strong in this type of activity. John turns towards Clint, who is definitely not going to get well soon. And Clint had already prepared a camera to capture such a moment in order to visit the phone gallery in the future and be at that very time with the warmest moments that, decades later, would give warm emotions. As expected, John doesn't like sneaky photos and instantly reacts with a hard slap to the face. The walls of the cave are covered with the warm light of the flames of the fires. But the cozy atmosphere is undermined by bad news. One of the inhabitants of the cave is sick. He is clearly unwell and needs urgent help. He is very unwell. Can he still be helped, and as soon as possible, otherwise it will be too late to help him. Everyone around is wary of it, which a sick person might throw out, since such symptoms can only indicate one thing. Hunger is to blame, but he himself is also to blame. These symptoms are similar to the symptoms of someone who has eaten the meat of the dead, or rather someone who has not eaten it for a long time. All his strength was gone. He fell on the cold floor, but he couldn't die. Still, everyone adheres to the idea that the man died, it is no longer possible to save him. Tim was frightened by this. The theory about the absorption of zombies turned out to be true. These are the symptoms after his experiments on people. He feels guilty before him, or is it just fear? Shaved speaks precisely of the consequences that resulted from eating zombies. Zombie meat kills in any case. It doesn't care that the consumer has stopped eating it. It won't make him its slave. It will just kill him. That's how harshly the virus treats people. Leo soaks a rag in water and says that zombie meat should under no circumstances be consumed as food. It certainly won't lead to anything good. Even those who did not become zombies after being absorbed by zombies did not become zombies will die in the future without any obstacles. Many people have already become victims of Tim's insidious experiments, but now he will be in trouble. No one will take his side. There are many people in the cave who have at least once tasted zombie meat, and this scares them plunge them into fear. The worst thing about this food is that it is addictive, and for good reason. Since everyone enjoys it as if they had never eaten anything tastier, they plunge into ecstasy, as if under the most powerful drug. Anyone who receives a certain level of toxins will die or become a zombie. It's only a matter of time, and such information is terrifying, because no one even felt the consequences after such meals. 
Someone is already scratching the back of their head. What could be creating such an itch? It can't be where everyone around them was looking when they are already rotting alive and turning into dead people, and the skin under their hair has already darkened and resembles the skin of a zombie. What did they all hope for when they fed on the dead, or their brains were controlled by a foul odor that enslaved their minds? The screamer began to call out to everyone in fear in order to identify the next madman who was trying zombie meat. Everyone passed the screamer test, yet most of the inhabitants of the cave have already tried zombie meat, and without quick decision-making, everything can only get worse and lead to tragedy. Finally, Tim himself understands that the situation is heating up and soon accusations will fly at him, which suggests that nothing good will come for him. Everyone in the cave is like a Trojan horse. Some take zombie meat with them, some have no meat, but they become zombies. Even one sick person can infect everyone in the cave. It's strange, but Clint is happy that the situation is heating up, but Michael is not happy that there are so many sick people. Clint thinks sensibly, but not fairly. He believes that there is no other way than to leave everyone in the wake of fate, to hope for fate, only to leave everyone here to certain death. Clint has already made up his mind. His decision may be wavered, but in the future he will always find a reason to get rid of unnecessary people. Clint does not hold his people. He waves his arms and indicates that everyone should collect their things. They separate. He is already looking for a candidate for the position of leader in order to give all the patience to him, since our boy is not going to bother with solving the problem. He rests against the strong chest of John, who has already arrived and just in time to start solving the problem and not leaving everyone here. Clint didn't like who he bumped into. Any collision at all would have led him to such a reaction. John despises Clint for this way of solving problems, even humiliates him a little for such cowardice, since the commander is the last one to flee the ship, nothing else. Clint doesn't like this kind of impudence. He's furious because he didn't expect his friend to stand up to him. John understands the difficulty of the situation. Most of them ate zombie meat, and if he took responsibility for leading them, let him take it only on himself. Clint can only rub his nose and remain silent in response to John, since he is truly wrong. Most of those caught trying to eat zombie meat turned out to be alive, and this is real happiness, since many were transformed into zombies instantly. John clearly wants to override Clint's decision, since John's conscience is much clearer than Clint's. John believes that Clint has no right to leave those people alone. He must help them, even if they are useless in the future. Clint is only concerned with the visual component of John, only here he wants to find a common language with him. He exhales and even thinks that John has become nicer. But it's true that John's new image is good. The one who did this has taste. Clint still listened to John and decided to help the others and also asks Leo for help. Leo didn't expect that he would be forced to treat everyone, although this is stupid, he's a doctor. People from the outside were instantly glad that they could be helped, since among them was a doctor who was very much valued at such a time. It's all due to the lack of calories and food, the body doesn't have enough of them, and it begins to be drawn to meat, at the present time, the meat of the dead, which needs to be replaced. John adjusts his glasses and understands that to maintain life he needs to bring animal meat, which is quite difficult to find at this time. Clint immediately begins to be indignant, since meat of animal origin is very difficult to find and almost impossible. Still, someone's stinking heap lies on the ground, perhaps it belongs to some animal, which suggests that those people can still be saved. Clint hints that this pile could lead them to a lot of meat. John is trying to examine the whole pile in detail in order to quickly find this animal that will save people from inevitable death. Clint notices a haze creeping across the surface of the pile, indicating that it was made not long ago. John thinks Clint is disgusting, as he would only like stinking smoke over a bunch of people to discuss. He cannot take his eyes off such a spectacle, smoking with its disgusting smell. Clint understands that the chances of finding the animal in such a large forest will be difficult, even impossible. John points in the direction where the tracks lead that do not look like human ones. Clint realizes his stupidity, and they begin to follow the tracks. Clint orders Tim to be tied to him, and they should already be moving out. As soon as Clint turned away, his face changed and turned into a face of shock. What brought him to this? Sam and Michael are not far away from Clint. Both look at the pile exactly with him and discuss it in exactly the same way as he does. 
Tim is waiting for him to be tied up and for them to go in search of the secret animal. Clint will not feel sorry for such people. He immediately hits everyone on the head so that they don't behave stupidly. Everyone got it, even Tim, who didn't do anything extra, but fell under Clint's hot hand. John tries to cheer Clint up because after such a shame, it will be difficult for him to forget him. John's gaze changed sharply. Something prompted strong attention in him. Maybe an enemy, or maybe that same animal was found. He grabs Clint's hand and forces him to stop. Something is still wrong. Clint doesn't listen to him and continues to walk, not seeing any obstacles in front of him, like a bull at the sight of a red flag. Clint looks down and sees something that scared even John, as if they didn't notice, but were walking towards the abyss. Under Clint's feet, there were a lot of remains of blood and rotten flesh, not that a crowd of zombies had already been here. This whole picture shocked everyone. Something incredibly vile fell under their feet, something that did not bode well. Heaps of bones, flesh and blood, and most importantly, a vile smell that makes it impossible to even take a breath as if clogging the nostrils. The meat was already decomposing, and when I grabbed some of the meat with a stick, it began to drip down like some kind of sauce. Such horror can only be encountered during the apocalypse. Such a smell comes from rotten meat. Clint can't believe what exactly zombies could do, that they could kill every single animal and leave them only rot. John confirms that these definitely cannot be the walking dead, who already like animal meat. John studied everything in detail and noticed some traces that belong to the killer of all these animals. One can only envy John's attention, the only one who time after time finds all the traces that no one in the gang can see. Clint immediately guesses whose footprint it is, since it was very large, which means that the animal must be of amazing size. John silently ponders who the giant monster that left such traces could be. Clint was distracted by a sound from the side that was coming from behind everyone. The giant boar turned out to be the same killer of animals. Only from what moment did boars become predators? The giant screamed at the top of his voice to demonstrate his strength. He was hostile, which was quite strange for an ordinary boar. Everyone is already scattering in different directions, and Clint froze, as if in a deer's stupor, nothing could move him. A strong stench came from the hungry monster, which confirms the boar's involvement in devouring those animals. Clint can only stand in front of the monster and silently look at it. There is no way to even run away, since it is already late. He puffs out his cheeks, and John grabs him by the collar and tries to save him from the boar attack. John is still not a weakling, and easily saves Clint from a rushing boar, as if he stopped a train in motion with his own strength. The boar could not have expected such strength from a dead man, but John gives him a strong kick so that he runs off in fear in search of truffles. Clint is already so sick from all the stench that all the food is coming out. John is annoyed by Clint's carelessness and sends him flying to keep him out of the way and underfoot. Clint already felt the ground with his whole body. John threw him to the side quite hard. Clint can only crawl and complain that John abandoned him while he spits out the remaining pieces of food. Everyone is in a hurry to escape from the boar so as not to get hit and also so as not to get underfoot again and not get in the way. During the battle, John even manages to be indignant while he is attacked by a giant zombie boar that has eaten all the animals in the area. Clint didn't like the way he behaved in the battle, lost his vigilance, and also released a stream of food at his friend. Clint, warning John about the danger from behind, screams as if he would tear his ligaments any minute. John sharply glances at the enemy and prepares for his attack, which will clearly not be weak. Our hero catches the entire blow with his chest like a real man, but such an attitude towards battle cannot lead to anything good. They rush towards Clint. Will he again stand and just watch the battle from the sidelines and expose himself to blows? John felt all the mighty power of the wild boar. Such animals cannot be found in any zoo during the day with fire. For Clint, everything worked out fine. The boar and John flew past at high speed. If Clint had been in their way, he would have already been razed to the ground. The boar slammed John right into the tree. The boar's strength is also impressive. This is the highest degree of evolution. John cannot answer the giant boar since he is definitely not weak and is ready to fight to the death until the death of his opponent. He takes advantage of the situation and prepares to bite John's head off, opening his large mouth wide. John is not a weakling and easily grabs the boar by the tusks. The boar's mouth will only close when it dies at John's hands. 
Clint won't stand by when a giant zombie boar tries to devour his friend. He grabs the sheath to pull out the knife and jumps towards the boar to wound it in its weakest place. Clint takes the handle of the knife, prepares it for a large boar carcass, but this will probably not be enough. Clint is already rapidly flying towards the boar and makes a strong swing with his knife to deliver the strongest blow possible. The knife easily entered the boar's carcass and it is unknown whether it hurt him at all or whether he felt anything. Still, the boar was unpleasant and even painful. He growled strongly at them, revealing his displeasure. John is trying to take care of Clint, but he himself is in much greater danger, even mortal. Clint points out that he should worry about himself and help himself first. He wounds his hand with a knife in order to share his blood with John, so that it will increase his strength significantly. Clint throws a little of his blood at him and says that even after becoming a zombie, John will not cease to be truly human. A drop of blood is almost reaching John, such an enhancement for him only from a drop of human blood, an incredible ability. John's eye lights up with its own unique flame, as if such a flame burns the soul from the inside, covering the victim with eternal fire. Clint takes John on a bed and forces him to defeat this pig rather than stand in a corner. Here is John's incredible strength. Finally, the impudent pig will fly away to another forest and leave all the living creatures alone. Clint and the boar are already turning over. The size of the boar is amazing. A couple of truffles, which he will find in the thicket of the forest with his keen sense of smell, will not be enough for such a boar. John's strength is also amazing. One kick to the pig's neck made it stand on its hind hooves and spit blood. Clint is already loudly asking John for help so that he can quickly save him from such a death. John is already jumping from his seat and heading towards the boar, since the battle is definitely not over yet and he still has to help Clint. He grabs the animal's tusk and directs its fall in the opposite direction. Still, he wants to deliver a decisive blow to the head and jumps on it. He conquered the giant creature. Now all that remains is to send it to animal paradise so that it no longer eats animals in the area and does not kill all strangers in sight. John helps Clint and grabs his hand. Here he is our savior, a dead man and a man, a hero. Clint holds on to John with all his strength and tries to climb onto the boar's head in order to at least get out of the battle alive. John asks Clint for help while he can move and continue fighting. Clint has not yet fully woken up, and they are already asking him to give him a stick, like a dog who will humbly obey and give him that same stick. Clint notices that stick and moves his gaze and himself to grab it. He deftly holding John's hand, snatches the stick from the ground and prepares to hand it to him. He throws it to John. It is already flying straight into his hands to finally finish off this giant creature and clear the world of yet another zombie. The stick is already in his hands, which means John only has to plunge it into the creature's head and send it to the guardian of the scales. Incredibly, John throws Clint's head to the ground for the second time during the battle. For him, this is a personal record. This requires hefty strength, since not everyone can throw friends away. The frightening creature screams at the top of its voice in pain. Apparently, it doesn't have long to live, or rather, life has already left it. John waves his stick like an executioner waves a halberd before decapitation in order to most likely deprive his victim of his life once and for all, leaving him no chance of further survival. The stick went very deep. The monster has no choice but to leave this world and leave behind only his horns and legs. The animal's eyes rolled back, Another monster fell at the hands of John, who cleanses this world of evil creatures, putting his life on the line, betting on the future. He took the tip of the stick out of the pig, as if taking out a holy sword from a stone that had been lying there for hundreds of years, waiting for the worthy, sending it to another world. The creature was truly strong, and fell in battle like a hero, fighting to the end. She left many wounds on the enemy, but was able to defend herself like a real warrior. At the same time, Sam and Michael try to wake up Clint, who was thrown out to dry by Joe while he was trying to help him. John comes up to them to find out if everything is okay with his friend, who can always be thrown to the side so as not to get in the way, and when he brings it, go and don't interfere. John brazenly approached and decided to worry about his friend. Maybe he felt bad after he threw him far away so as not to get in the way. Clint lies silently on the ground, and Michael is surprised at John's impudence, since he did not even apologize for such impudence. 
Clint didn't like how he was thrown in different directions, when he tried to help in every possible way and even lend a helping hand, but he was thrown as if as a sign of gratitude. To the side, Tim hears grunting. It's impossible for another creature to crawl out on the sly. Clint definitely won't withstand a second attack. A strange rustling from the bushes. Is the enemy coming out of there? What is there? What awaits our heroes again? What is the danger? Tim had already begun to warn everyone about this sound that was waiting for them on the side, as if a new danger threatened their lives. John and the entire campaign are sent for testing, and they are clearly ready for anything. Even if the sky falls on them, John catches him and lifts him back up. He parts the thick grass to find out everything about what is hidden behind it. Probably the real food is hidden there. John's eyes shone, whether this means that there was an enemy behind the grass or animal food. The joy in his eyes says that they were lucky after all. Finally, they found little piglets with little doll eyes the sight of which makes you not even want to eat them. You want to cuddle them and hug them with all your might. They found a treasure hidden by a creature that retained its maternal instinct, helping to protect its children. John lowered his eyes because they killed the mother of those boars, who defended her boars with all her might, and they unknowingly killed their only protector. Sam showed his sympathy for the boar and his kids, who were left alone and will soon go into the soup to cure people, he understands that everything has its price and sometimes no one pays off. Clint was wounded right in the heart, since even a boar has a maternal instinct, but even his mother did not have it. Even a boar fought to the death for his children, and his mother allowed all the worst things to happen. Sam shed tears after Clint's words because their mistake cost five lives, four of which could continue to live and give birth. The only fate that awaits the wild boars is boiled broth, which will be a medicine for useless people. Everything immediately flew into the soup with pork. The fragrant smell filled the entire cave. Enchanting with its aroma, the broth was saturated with the taste of the animal, which it would still be a pity to eat. The inhabitants of the cave are already wiping their drool to try the meat of real animals for a long time, and not the toxic meat of the dead. Clint, before starting to eat, prays and thanks the Lord for the opportunity to taste such food. Sam can't stop his tears. Even Michael can't calm him down. It hurt our guy's feelings so much. All the madmen are already starting to have discharge from their mouths because of the aromatic smell that comes from the cauldron of soup and spreads throughout the cave. Everyone is already rejoicing and celebrating. They will be able to survive. They will be able to continue to maintain their existence. The mother rejoices her sick son that they can be saved. The meat has arrived, and they only have to wait a little longer to recover from their addiction to the meat of the dead. John didn't forget about the girls and grabbed a couple of fruits for them to enjoy. And Meg actually loves fruits more than any meat, so she's very happy about her brother's attention. Tim and his gang sit with empty stomachs as such an aroma floats past their noses that intoxicates the mind much better than any medicine. Tim understands that there is not enough meat and they should ask for some for their people, since there are many more of them who have tasted zombie meat. Shaved reminds Tim about meat, but he clearly already understands everything. But this won't make it any better. They urgently need to ask for some for their gang. Another points to the man who is already drooling, and he also urgently needs help, otherwise it will be too late. One of the gang is already almost dead. He has either salvation or inevitable death. It's worth looking at Clint's mercy. Tim swallowed his secretions out of fear, since it was his and only his fault that such consequences lay hidden, and only he was guilty of them. Suddenly Tim approached Clint, probably to borrow some meat, but judging by Clint's behavior, he would never in his life share even a crumb from the table with him. Tim is ashamed to ask for something, but he asks specifically for a certain deal for which he wants to get some meat. Clint finally began to listen carefully to Tim. He was interested in such sincerity on Tim's part. Clint laughed at this statement. His smile stretched to his ears, as if he wanted to gloat at him so much that he was really itching. Clint considered Tim a daredevil, because after everything he had done, he still dared to approach him and even negotiate a deal. Clint brazenly grabbed Tim by the chin as a sign of his humiliation, but Tim is very afraid of Clint's reaction, since after the murder of his brother, one can expect everything and more from him. He does not stop mocking the helpless Tim. He continues to humiliate him, even when he is humiliated so much that he can be called the lowest person. 
Clint controls Tim with his actions. He shuts his mouth without even touching him, only grabbing his chin. Tim's mouth goes numb. Clint points out that Tim is a dog and should behave like one, whining and barking on all fours to ask for things. Tim just silently watches as he is humiliated in front of everyone, but he cannot do anything else, since he will pay for resistance with his own life. Clint sits Tim on his lap so that he begs for mercy, so that he whines like a puppy waiting for food, so that he finally understands his situation here. Shaved and the whole gang notice such impudence on Clint's part, and they all order not to overdo it, because they think that he has crossed the line of what is permitted. Michael and Sam are already in fighting positions. One extra movement and extra teeth will fly in different directions. Clint's ability to mock his opponents can only be envied. He smells the aroma of fresh meat right in front of Tim. The same feeling comes from trying to shake hands with an armless man. Clint invites Tim to bark to earn that piece of meat so he can share it with his guys. He mocks Tim because it brings him endless pleasure, like the most powerful drug. In an instant, the meat disappears from Clint's stick, and his laughter gives way to silence full of fear. Clint was shocked by such speed. After such joy, a moment of fear appeared, which gave goosebumps to his skin. John grabbed the meat thief by the neck as if he was trying to attack him, and John masterfully defended himself as if he had swatted a mosquito. This madman turned out to be one of Tim's gang. He was already mad with hunger and had completely become another dead man who thirsts for meat and only meat. Clint is still in shock. He has no choice but to stand and silently watch everything that is happening. John grabbed the madman's neck tightly with his hand, and in response he only growled something incomprehensible and continued to bite the piece of meat. The capillaries inflated in front of the eyes, saliva flowed and the fangs were revealed. In addition, the skin darkened. All the symptoms of a dead man, his death was inevitable. Tim and the whole gang are shocked by all this. From Tim's eyes, you can understand that he did not want this outcome. He wanted to achieve this outcome, but the risks were not justified. John is reasonable, and yet before killing asks Leo if this man can still be saved, but his face makes it clear that the only salvation for this guy will be death. Everything turned out to be true. No one will help him, only to wander in the boat of the guide of the eternal guide of souls to the underworld. No matter how difficult it is to make such a decision, John should make it in cold blood, since it is no longer possible to help the man, which means it is better to deprive him of his suffering. John grabs him even tighter, squeezing his throat tighter and tighter, only he can decide death or life in a mindless body. Tim is worried about his subordinate and does not want to let some John kill him, under no circumstances. Tim is already starting to yell at him in an attempt to stop him, but everyone understands that there is no way to save him. The shaved man is very excited because it is never, as if his body is hanging in John's hands, that he can even take a breath of air. The second shouts the name of the virus victim. He cannot believe in all this, that his friend will go to another world at the hands of the enemy. Tim even remembered the promises. He himself never kept them. But as it relates to him, the promise is most valuable. John does not listen to this fool, since he is the only one to blame for all this. Only his guilt lies in his death, and the infection of all people also lies on Tim's shoulders. He still continues to pray that John stop the torture, so that he does not kill his comrade and friend, whom he would easily send to be eaten by the dead, just to save himself. Still, John did not listen to him, and his life was over with this. Blood splashed in all directions, and the end of the man's life. These are Tim's sincere emotions. Finally, he can show compassion for his people. Something human has awakened in him. Even a tear rolled down his cheeks. His eyes became very wet. He is still a freak. But John's words awakened something humane in him. Tim bowed his head, all because of one subordinate, but one could never expect such a reaction from him since he was not even so worried about his beloved. Clint stands in front of the whole gang with his arms crossed, as if what he was trying to achieve has happened, he has emerged victorious in this battle. Tim is in complete despair. For him, this defeat will become an eternal lesson. He is unlikely to risk his allies, comrades and subordinates anymore, but as long as he has enough. Meg and Alice could not expect this from John. He was cruel, but he made sure that he did not suffer, so that he did not go wild and start attacking the healthy, since one was sick death for everyone else. A killer and a savior, two in one, 
John is like an executioner. With a swing of his axe, he sacrifices one, saving the majority. The world is still not without losses. Regret and compassion are visible in his eyes, but his hands are already stained with blood and cannot be washed off. But still he is not guilty of anything. All the blame lies on Tim's shoulders. John remembers the meat and asks Michael about its readiness and he replies that it is ready. John is generous. Even after the murder, he is calm. He is ready to share his spoils with fools who only have on their minds how to eat and listen to their boss, who is putting their lives on the line. Clint was instantly indignant at how they were going to share the meat when it had been so hard to get it, when they were basking in the cave in complete safety. John thinks strategically. He understands that one mutated person can lead to a tragedy. If they don't help, death is here for everyone and even significant people can be at risk. Our hero explains everything clearly to Clint, but in his eyes there is a kind of self-interest that never happened before. Something was definitely wrong. He clenched his fist tightly, gathering all his fingers into a fist. Is it all because of John's decision? Is everything to our Clint's liking? Here is Clint's evil look. Everything was red in it, his intentions are not clear, but he doesn't like the fact that John makes such decisions. He put a mask on himself. Everything is clear with him. He most likely wants to throw this whole burden of responsibility far away. Everything in the cave is a burden for him. He only needs John. Clint wants to leave a difficult conversation and says that he will go eat sour berries while his people eat his meat. This nervousness is visible in Clint's movements. Sam tries to slow Clint down so that he eats more slowly, but his anger cannot allow anyone to hear. John perhaps understands what is happening to Clint. He silently looks at him, because he wants to understand what is happening to him. But still his gaze is interrupted, and he throws it towards the people whom he saved with his generosity. Finally, they were able to escape, and it was all because of John, who showed mercy, solved Tim's problem, and generally saved many lives. From John's appearance, one can understand that everything is not as good as everyone thinks. He noticed that strange reaction in Clint, sincere joy for the survivors was not visible in his eyes. He wanted them all to die. Alice wants to reassure John, thinking that for the near future, all problems are solved. John soberly assesses that it is not for nothing that there is a downcast expression on his face. He refused Alice and her decision, since the decision was only to delay the inevitable. John's gaze examined everyone in the cave, who eats, how they look, and most importantly, who wants to throw all their people into the abyss. Clint nervously eats the berries that he and John and the whole gang picked after the hunt. Tim and the whole gang eagerly listen to the delicious aroma of meat and perhaps are waiting for it to be shared with them. The rest of the people eat piece by piece, and to survive they only need ordinary meat, which in their time is considered more valuable than all treasures. John understands how harsh the reality is, and also understands that this decision is only a way to postpone the inevitable, only to leave everything as it is, postponing it. Sam looks at all this from a different angle. He believes that everything is fine since all people have gotten better, but the worst thing lies not in their illness, but in the one who wants to leave them. People rejoice, they feel better, all those who ate zombies have become normal. Their powers are returning. Finally, a small salvation has been found for them. Clint's berry falls to the floor. Is he happy about all this? Or is it just a pretense on his part that can be seen? Sam didn't even notice this in him. He didn't consider Clint like that. He didn't understand that Clint didn't care about their lives. It was hard for him to lead them. He would definitely get rid of them all soon. He greedily licks his lips and fingers from the juice, like a bloodthirsty predator swallowing the blood of his prey. Sam is frightened by Clint's reaction. He realizes that he could be next after, in his opinion, useless people. Clint doesn't want to take care of people. He wants to live a quiet life, not get food for people who won't even thank him, who can't give him anything. It can't be, another patient showed up. Again, the symptoms of someone who ate zombies, again problems. New patients began to appear among Tim's gang, as if one was already on the verge, Tim would again have to beg for help from John and the others. One of the gang is trying to wake up his comrade, but it is already clear that only the Almighty can help him. In the eyes of the six, the hope that that man could still be saved had already disappeared, his eyes became small beads. Here it is, he has almost mutated, his skin has begun to darken, the virus is taking its toll, now he doesn't have long to live. 
Tim understands the seriousness of the situation. He urgently needs to make a decision that should solve this problem in the shortest possible time. Tim's people are in despair. They all think that soon they will all become dead or die before everyone's eyes. Tim is very scared. He is confused. When he risked their lives, he could not think that he would be so brazenly forced to sit on his knees with his bags tied in a knot. He casts his gaze towards those from whom he can ask for help, and he will again have to disgrace himself in front of them. Incredibly, Tim decided to turn to Jonah, to his old enemy, to the one whom he had despised all his life, this desire to solve all his mistakes. John remained silent because he did not expect such determination from Tim, or rather, he could not at all expect that he would understand his mistakes and try to solve them. He tries to make a deal again, only this time with John since it was not possible to find a common language with Clint. Now he has come running to John. Tim offers in return for the meat whatever John asks for, whatever John would want from him. Again, this loudmouth interjects in the middle of the conversation. Again, he is itching. He doesn't seem to solve anything, but points out that John has no right to share meat with Tim. He believes that their people have not eaten at all, and they need to share with Tim's gang, who did not consider them valuable, but now wanted to atone for their sins. He accuses Tim of forcing them to eat zombies. It's all his fault, but they themselves happily stuff their cheeks piece by piece. Tim is also furious. He is not happy to hear this, but he is also guilty, and even more guilty than anyone else for everything he has done. To the side, you can hear the cries of those people that the whole gang should die every single one, and Tim continues to talk about the deal. Now he began to speak not with requests, but with threats, that it would be better for John to give meat to people, for the sake of their lives. Earlier, John was told that Tim is the son of the ruler of City B, and it would be better for him to give some meat, otherwise they will not get into the city, even through battle. John nevertheless started a dialogue. Now Tim definitely won't have the words to continue the conversation. He stood in front of him so that he would not look down on him in order to be taller than him and put pressure on him with his charisma. Tim fell silent, yet he was overwhelmed by his strength of spirit. He had no choice but to silently listen to everything that John told him. John points Tim to the reality that if his people don't eat enough, they won't live to see tomorrow morning. All that will be left of them is their horns and legs. Will people care about City B if they don't know whether they will die, whether they will eat today, whether they will live to see tomorrow? John says that there is no need to remember this. Their priority is that they and their families live until tomorrow so that their bellies remain full and do not need food. John leaves Tim without taking his eyes off him, showing him his strength and capabilities. Tim silently looks at John's back since nothing he says will matter. Is John going to negotiate with his captain so that they share the meat with them? Will he really show mercy even for him? Tim continues to look after John, thinking that he will give them some of the rarest medicine, meat that will save the lives of many in the whole gang. Shaved is very worried about his elder, because last time everything went badly, and he cannot guarantee that everything will go well this time. Tim peers at him and understands the reason for his worries, since he himself is in this situation and he once easily controlled them. John, for an unknown reason, asks Clint for his dagger, but Clint assumed that John needed it in order to kill the impudent Tim, who had the courage to even threaten him. John orders them to prepare for the fact that after everyone has eaten, he will wait for them in the car, since they will soon be moving out. People agree with their leader, and even the majority have already reinforced themselves, however, almost everyone is ready to move forward. John decided to continue the conversation with Tim, and it was not without reason that he asked Clint for a knife. Something crept into his head, but he definitely does not intend to kill him, since he made a promise, and he keeps them. Tim tensed up a lot. He was frightened by John's strange decisions, why he needed the dagger, who it was for. All these thoughts visited his head, and that was what scared him. With every step John became closer to Tim, so many times he pretended that he would kill him, but did not end his life. Now would he be so merciful. The knife is already in John's hands. He definitely intends to be serious. He doesn't care that it's someone's son. He will resolve issues with him like an adult. John has already approached Tim. All he has to do is make one move, 
and the life of the impudent son of the ruler will end. Everything will become as meaningless for him as the lives of those people he dared to risk. Tim is already at his feet, trying to stop him with his screams, because he thinks that John will stoop so low that he will kill the defenseless. John still does not betray himself. He threw the knife on the floor to Tim so that he could solve everything himself before they mutated, while they could still be killed. Tim's face was covered with a shadow, the shadow of his conscience. It would be hard for him to kill his people with his own hands, but throwing them left and right is nothing for him. Otherwise, John will decide everything himself, and each of them will die tied up at the hands of the enemy, and they will die at the hands of the boss, who will give them a worthy death. Tim doesn't like John's decision. Even if he's guilty, guilty of everything, he won't be able to come to terms with killing his people. John continues to put pressure on him. He knows how to put pressure on a weak spot like no one else, even for someone as fearless as Tim. John remembered Tim how he tried to throw his little sister out to be eaten by zombies back when the apocalypse had just begun in that very store, what now scares him. Tim is already in despair. He has no choice but to truly solve this problem in only one way. Only killing his subordinates will lead them to a dignified death, but to nothing good. John is very angry. He grabs Tim by the mouth and points out how he fed zombie meat to people. Just for the sake of an experiment, he put so many lives at risk. John put a lot of pressure on him. He is ready to kill him. Now he asks if his hand is raised now, if he can kill his people who he put in danger. John didn't leave Tim to save him. Not because he's so kind and generous. It's certainly not the kind of decisions that haunted his head. Tim is more scared than ever. He definitely could never feel such fear. He is in adulthood, which means he needs to solve issues like an adult. And this is exactly what John teaches him, taking off his rose-colored glasses. He throws Tim to the floor so that he will finally understand his place, so that he will finally understand what he has done and the fact that John left him alive, so that he will face his sins. John understood that all his sins would not come back to him, he just had to wait a little and everything would definitely come back like a boomerang. He abruptly rips the ropes off him, freeing him from his shackles, and now he can finish off everyone who is sick. John orders him to pick up the dagger, which in no case will please him. John shows all his superiority, all the superiority that Tim himself used to show over him when they were still students. After a while, now Tim is crawling at John's feet. Now John is telling him what he will do. The countdown has begun. He is already reaching for the knife and preparing himself and his fortune to end the lives of many people before it was easier to send a couple to be eaten by the dead, but now he does it all himself. The countdown is over, the last second of life for all patients, and now Tim will raise his hand to cut off the heads of his comrades. Tim begins to bare his teeth as if they are trying to cut off a limb, and he holds a piece of cloth in his mouth to ease his pain. He is already making the first swing of the knife, but now there is one end for everyone, an eternal guide along the river of souls. will prepare more places, since there will be quite a few deaths. John orders not to waste time, but he has already gotten up and from his facial expression you can understand that he is dead inside, but he is obliged to kill them. John urges him to make such a difficult decision. His sixes ask for alms so that he does not kill, but it is too late. One of them is already very bad, and John continues to point out that either he or he will kill. The man's eyes are already covered with dew. He doesn't want to die or becomes a bloodthirsty monster, but he can't be saved. Tim is very unpleasant to admit this. The man's tears forced Tim's tears to break through the layer of pride. Now he understands the cost of his decisions. No one will help him, and his father is very far away. John never stops rushing him and never forgets to put pressure on him but Tim orders him to shut up and be completely silent. So he became a dead man. But he didn't have long left. Now he's a dead man and there's nothing good about it. Tim continues to tell him to shut up over and over again, but his face shows no rage. John continues to humiliate him, even when he has already made up his mind. But John still wants to bring him to the point of absurdity. Tim still could not stand it. Screaming at the top of his voice, he pointed the knife at his ally with the intention of killing. The horror for Tim is over. They have already moved out, which means the death of that man has already happened, and everyone else moved on well fed. John looks around. Michael has taken control of the bus. Tim is sitting in the farthest seat. Clearly the worst part of his life has begun for him, 
and it's his own fault. He looks at his hand, which was stained with blood, which was shaking with fear. For him, this day will be a real lesson in life, and John has become a real mentor for him. The elder looked at his hand and could not take his eyes off it. He could only look at it endlessly and was afraid to encounter this again. Clint, without putting in his two cents, does not remain himself. He called his comrade a dog and continued to mock him. He shows his power by mocking the son of the ruler himself. For Clint, Tim is a real coward who lacks the strength and fearlessness to kill the dead man he made. For him, everyone was disposable, but here he was afraid to kill his subordinate. The Six tries to intercede for Tim, thereby only aggravating the situation, as Tim again hides behind the backs of his allies. Clint confirms that he can only hide behind the backs of the Sixes. He remembers the death of Will, Tim's younger brother who protected him. Tim is hurt by every word addressed to him, and Will's death pierces his heart even more. Six is very angry, or rather he is furious. He is ready to blow Clint's head off so that he will no longer say unnecessary things. Suddenly Tim stops him, since he is already depressed, and he definitely doesn't need unnecessary conflicts. Six is in shock, but Tim has had enough that day and he's definitely had enough. He doesn't even have a face, he's completely drooping. He doesn't even have the strength to fight. He was killed mentally, even if he himself was to blame. Six is confused, as he has never seen the boss in such a state. Clint's mockery can be heard from the outside, but there is no way to avoid this, even if you cut off his hands or tie his tongue in a knot, he will continue to talk and mock. It's not for nothing that Tim sits behind everyone and across the aisle, all to make it more convenient for everyone to humiliate him, so that he's a real eyesore for everyone. Everyone hates Tim for what he did, but he understands that he won't be able to say a word, as he will only make things worse. They even remembered City B, thinking that on the same bus it was much better than in this ill-fated city. Clint, for some unknown reason, decided to stand up what could be on his mind. John kept his eyes on the view from the window. He watches everything so that he is prepared for anything. Clint is delighted with John because he did not expect something like this from a dead man, such an ability to put pressure on people's weak points. Clint puts John in comparison with all people, and yet for him he becomes higher and higher than everyone at once. Clint rubs his chin and realizes that Tim is completely killed. The soul is already crawling out of him. He feels so bad, as if he will soon sell his 21 grams to the devil and find absolute emptiness. John believes that every person must pay his own price for the desire to live. If you want to live, you must pay, and often this is not money or treasure. He casts his suspicious glance at Clint, as if sensing some kind of immense self-interest in him. In response, he sincerely smiles at him. Some thoughts must have left his head for how long. Suddenly they stopped. What made them hit the brakes so suddenly? Michael is alarmed by something. Puzzlement is written on his face. He is excited. He does not understand what is in front of him. He presses the brake pedal hard to stop the bus as quickly as possible, as something mysterious met on their way. After a sharp braking, Clint almost took off, but John managed to grab him. Michael points out what made him stop moving so abruptly. A frightening van appeared on the road. Its nose was completely stained with blood. What could be there? These are the thoughts that come to all the bus passengers. Michael is very surprised by this even according to him. The van appeared there out of nowhere. John's gaze was intensely interested in what could be in this van and who its owner was. John ordered the others to sit on the bus while he went to investigate. John's feet are already stepping towards the van. With every step, he is getting closer to solving the mystery of this van. There is no surprise in John's gaze, which means he hasn't noticed anything wrong with this van yet. The van was not destroyed. There was no evidence of battle experience on it. But the blood on the bumper spoke of something completely different, were its wheels crushing many dead people while the owner was driving away from them. Initially, John decided to inspect the interior, Perhaps it was there that the whole secret of the mysterious van in the middle of the forest was hidden. There is not a soul behind the wheel. No secrets have been revealed, but many more questions have arisen. Suddenly, someone rushed past the van, whether it was the owner, an enemy, or an ally. John instantly noticed him and fixed his gaze on him. He definitely needed to hurry up to catch up with him. The unknown person is trying to hide in the shadows of bushes and trees. He is also definitely not a zombie or a zombie, but he is the same as John, with intelligence. 
John looks at the stranger and listens to every rustle, and even managed to hear the ringing of the links of an iron chain. Our hero decides to immediately go to him and find out what kind of vans are standing in the middle of the road in a dense forest. John intends to catch him and even tells him to stop. How long will he run from him? The stranger does not have time to leave the horizon for John, yet he is not such a weakling. He is trying at full speed to catch up with the stranger in order to find out from him who he is, why he is running away, and what kind of van he is. The stranger is not a weakling and is not going to yield to John in speed, which is very strange, since previously John could catch up with everyone, even a bus at full speed. John is hot on his heels and his target's heels sparkle from his speed. Even John recognized his speed. He could never meet such a fast person. Who is he? Only one thing is clear that he is definitely not a weakling. The speed of our stranger causes leaves to fall from the treetops directly onto him and John. It's incredible who he is. A monster, a man or something in common. Why is he wrapped in bandages and running with such force? What are the chains on his neck? All these thoughts come to John. After laughing for a short time, he stopped abruptly. Does this mean that he is going to attack our hero? John was puzzled. You can see in his eyes that he really wants to ask him a lot of questions. He stopped for a break. He probably ran out of strength to run away from John, since John did not allow him to run even a meter. Will John really catch up with the fugitive, but not only this worries him, but he worries about the chains in which his hands are chained. John hopes that he has finally caught up with him and no longer needs to chase him to reveal a couple of secrets. He jumped up as if on springs, heading towards him. He grabbed the tree branch tightly so that like a monkey jumping on vines, he could quickly get to his prey. John quickly wants to get to know this guy better who he is if he is so fast that he is hiding that van. He examines a potential enemy in detail in order to counterattack him in a weak spot during an attack. The sudden stop of that stranger seemed very strange to John, because this is only done when preparing an insidious attack for the enemy. John attacks first and tells him to show his true face, which he hides under the hood. He pays attention to him. Finally, his face appears to the eyes that is hiding under the hood. It won't be possible to see the whole face because of the bandages, but the outlines will be known. At least it will be possible to find out what gender he is. His entire face is hidden behind a mask of bandages and hair. Only emerald eyes and malachite-colored hair are visible. John was shocked. Even after removing the hood, there were no fewer questions. His eyes were not just scared, but puzzled by who was hiding behind all this. Suddenly, the stranger dared to grab John's strong hand. He would not tolerate such impudence. His entire body is covered with bandages and chains. He is a prisoner or an unfortunate experiment, having such wounds. He has such powers. John couldn't expect such strength and grip from him. He couldn't move. The stranger found John interesting. Something about him captured him and inspired him. Still, our emerald is human, which can be said by the color of his skin, but his strength is shocking, since John has never lost to anyone before. He traps John in a lock, preventing him from moving. The stranger is so strong that he can easily move John himself, who is moving a bus on his shoulders. He is stronger than all the enemies John has previously encountered. He has never been able to meet such a force that could move him at such a speed. This is already the second opponent driving John into a tree, but the first time a giant zombie boar was chasing him at full speed, now it's an ordinary person who pushed him into the tree without gaining speed. John has already put in all his strength, but still he cannot move from his spot since he is very strong. The stranger began to put pressure on him by saying that he himself recognized his strength, but was not going to concede even a little in strength. John had already begun to exert excess force to at least push his opponent aside. Unheard of impudence, he grabs John by the hair, but only let John free himself, and this impudent man will not live. But John still needs to free himself from the scoundrel's hands, but he can only stand pressed against the wall and clench his teeth. The stranger does not even forget to mock, yet he was not taught manners where he came from. He pressed him to the wall for a reason, but this is what crept into our stranger's skull. He decided to explore John to the fullest, even to sniff out everything that was hidden behind the pile of muscles. He needs to look at John fully, what exactly he wants to learn from him and his body. The insolent man's hand even got into John's mouth. Even his mouth did not remain untouched by the insolent man's hands. Looking at the teeth, the impudent man decided to try the fangs, which were razor sharp. The stranger considered John's teeth to be very healthy, which, in his opinion, was strange, like for a zombie. 
Finally, he took his playful fingers out of his mouth, which had already been lying in his mouth for quite a long time. John reacted instantly and clenched his teeth like a bear trap. The stranger was greatly surprised by his speed and even called him cruel to ridicule him. John is very angry with his opponent, and he is even more angry because he constantly puts his hands where they shouldn't. He thinks John is a weakling because he isn't that strong to him. Even if that's true, he shouldn't have said that about him. Suddenly an arrow flies from the side, trying to pierce our heroes, who are pressed against the tree like a sweet couple. The stranger is no weakling and easily catches the arrow in mid-flight exactly as John did earlier, suggesting that his reaction is the same as John's or even better. For our emerald, everything around seems interesting. Everything around awakens delight in it. John's entire team came running to save him, but it is unlikely that they will be able to help him in any way. Clint orders the stranger to let John go, holding him at crossbow point. The others are very worried since no one has ever been able to corner John, and some person took him hostage with such ease. The stranger is surprised that John has friends, and for him they are not even food or a snack, but comrades who will come to his aid. It seems to him that this is very bad, and that it will be very difficult with John, even for such a strong guy. He squeezed the arrow until his hands bled, and it occurred to him what his insidious plan was. He decided to kill John's friends and sent a bloody arrow in their direction, but it is unknown why he wet the arrow with blood. The arrow is already flying towards Clint. Any minute it will overtake him and send him to another world. He froze. The speed of the arrow amazed him. He did not have to use any devices to throw the arrow with such force and speed. John immediately freed himself from the enemy's grasp and rushed towards Clint to save him. Everyone nearby screamed his name, fearing that he would no longer be able to escape. He remained standing and watching all this, as if he had done all this just to see John's reaction, whether he would try to save his friend. Still, John manages to save Clint, grabs his head and takes the entire blow upon himself. Clint can only say his name as the arrow pierces him and seems to be touching him with its tip. It really hurts him, even the most severe zombie bites. The blows of a giant boar were a tickle for him, and now one arrow made him clench his teeth until he cracked. What would have happened to Clint if he had not been saved by John? The arrow would have pierced him through and others would have suffered. Everyone is surprised by John's speed, since even here he managed to catch the arrow with his whole body, but saved Clint. The stranger silently watches how a dead man saves a man. For him, this is the most amazing experience of his life. Still, he considers John problematic, since he has a conscience or his friends turned out to be very important to him. A certain rumble from the side caught the attention of our impudent man, and he even turned his gaze towards the noise. The roar spread throughout the forest as if something more terrible was heading their way. It can't be that same van. It's from it that the rumble comes and is so strong that it spreads to the entire forest in a matter of seconds. The rumble still did not stop. Everything about that van was strange, and the fact that it had never been beaten. But there were many bloodstains on its white paint, filled with horror those who saw it on the horizon. Something was trying to get out of the van. Something was hitting the doors of the van and blood was gushing out through them in different directions. This creature forced the stranger to leave them and go deal with him. The last phrase aggravated the situation. He said that they would definitely meet, since they still had an eternity ahead of them, and now he had to go. Clint is still scared, and John is trying to get up from his knees and continue interrogating our stranger. The enemy whistles at someone as if calling his puppy or his ally, whom John and the whole team would definitely not be able to defeat. It got out and right next to the bus with passengers. What is it that follows the whistle of our impudent person? What a pile of blood, flesh, and rot. From inside the van, heaps of stains of bloody hands are visible, as if this van is a Pandora's box, in which there was something very terrifying. The giant creature crawled towards our heroes and left a bloody trail behind it. A stranger is waiting for his dog, a rather strange pet, but they are similar to each other, two oddities in the middle of the forest. The monster is as fast as its owner. It covered this entire distance in a couple of seconds. He is very dangerous. It is rare to see such a strong enemy in the middle of the forest who also has such a strong pet. He points out that John may still enjoy his life, but he will definitely return later. He glances their way, making sure that their connection is sincere. They and the creature leave and leave them completely alone. John's blood dripped from the wound that the wanderer left him. That arrow seriously wounded him. 
John easily pulled the arrows out of his back, which was bleeding heavily even under John's strong regeneration. Everyone was very scared when John was pierced by that arrow and even thought that he would never pull it out again. John gets up with heaviness after such a battle, yet the strength of the new enemy is too great for the current John. Clint worries about John the most since it was his fault that he got hit. It's hard for John to even breathe. This is the strength of the enemy he will meet in the near future. He's still okay. He's all beat up and badly injured, but he gives everyone hope that he's okay. John even now assesses the situation sensibly and remembers the people and the bus, since it was from there that terrible creature came running. John hurries towards the bus as if he absolutely does not care about that arrow wound. Clint will not forget about this, and will remind John that he should take a break and treat the wound. Suddenly someone stops Clint, grabbing his hand, realizing that it's better not to stop John now. He paid attention to the one who stopped him and was surprised by the reaction, since it turned out to be his beloved, who should care for him most of all. Something told Alice that she shouldn't stop John now and let him go in their direction. John is furious. His wound is bleeding, but something haunts him. What is the catch in that attack? Why did that guy wet the arrowhead with his blood? What brought him discomfort was the wound, which was so serious that it was through and through, and the wind could blow through it. Finally, they returned. Everything was fine, everyone was alive and the bus was not damaged, since everything could be expected from such a pet and its owner. The passengers are rejoicing, they have returned and everyone is happy about it. Well, not without reason, since without them they will not survive even a week in this harsh world. John glanced to the side as if something very important had prompted such attention in him. Still, this is something much more important than a squirrel running past which is what aroused such attention from John. As a result, everyone was in shock, something incredibly dangerous or a new enemy. They were just getting out of the thicket of the forest and out onto the road along which they were driving and ran into a strange van. Here it is. They were frightened by a giant trail of blood that came from the same van that was smeared with the blood of that creature. The footprints were similar to human handprints, and the campaign recognized that they were truly similar to human footprints. Leo stops them and asks them not to touch the trail of that creature for now. The doctor orders everyone to get on the bus so that everyone is on it at the same second. From the moment the wanderer called that creature, everyone who had once eaten zombie meat began to behave strangely. Everyone showed some symptoms. The boy they cured was sobbing and screaming at the top of his voice in pain. What could happen to them? What was the strength of that wanderer? The veins in the boy's neck bulged greatly and his mother tried to calm him down, but she didn't understand a damn thing what was happening to him. John immediately tries to find out the reason and whether the boy will become a zombie. Leo points out that there is no way that boy will become a zombie. This is just a temporary symptom. Everyone who ate zombie meat had the same symptoms as my son. The situation is utter horror, and they, like no one else, understand this better than anyone else. And that van that from the inside is full of blood and all the most terrible things... John remembered that some kind of creature got out of that strange car, what it was and what it looked like. Such questions appeared in his head. Leo is confused. That creature has disappeared from sight, but he believes that that creature could not be human. Someone nevertheless shouted out and opinions were divided. He said that the monster was a man. John and Leo instantly glance in his direction. Our Tim turned out to be the screamer. He, grabbing his stomach with his hand, indicates that that something was a person. Tim did not consider him not a monster or a mutant, but still he was scared to the point of trembling all over his skin, and this is typical since the creature like a shadow is gloomy and like a terrible nightmare. His eyes narrowed to Quanta to see his pupils. You need to look at them under a multi-million dollar magnification. That creature also had a terrible smell, which blocked the nose with barricades and killed from the inside. Clint is not even going to mock Tim after he almost let a stream flow under him. John has received the necessary information and goes to investigate the van, and Leo says that Tim's fear is inherent and they could suffer the same fate. Clint followed John, asking if he had found anything that might reveal a secret or two. John examined the van in detail from the inside and apparently noticed something. Contrary to Leo's orders, John still touched the substance, which was a mixture of rot, flesh, and blood in general, everything that was deposited from that creature. John understood that that creature was decomposing and bleeding, 
but how could it be human and not die with such problems? Everything contradicted each other. It decomposed, bled, but did not have human strength and speed. This gave Clint good food for thought, which makes him think well about how to defeat that creature and that wanderer. Clint could not even think that except for John, there were no people left in the world who survived a zombie bite. Blood flowed from the van in streams, and the darkness inside made it clear in what conditions the creature was kept. Clint realizes that the situation has worsened, and points out that John himself understands this. John's gaze was blank. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, he was not given an easy choice. Clint persistently explains the power of that wanderer, who pinned him in a corner and sniffed him out, reaching into his mouth with his hands, as if he had seen a strange animal. John opened his mouth wide and began to understand what Clint was trying to understand. Suddenly, someone grabs him by the shoulder to call him or draw attention to himself. It turned out to be Leo, who pointed out that the boy was getting worse and worse, and he urgently needed help. His eyes became empty, he begged for help, and Leo asked to get some meat for him. Still, Leo comes with bad news. The symptoms are getting worse, and even those people on the bus may not last even a few days. That's all. Clint decided to start that conversation that he had been keeping inside himself for a very long time, holding these thoughts inside himself for a long time, keeping a conversation that John definitely wouldn't like in any form. Clint points out the harsh reality that he cannot be sure that he will live to see tomorrow, and even those creatures they met today may come again. The wanderer and his pet are like two shadows that leave the thicket of the forest, like the guardians of the forest from whom they must obtain permission to continue their journey. Clint is hesitant. He tells the merciful John that he cannot carry so much responsibility on his hump. He cannot solve the problems of all those useless people. Leo tries to shut Clint up, even raises his voice at him, since you can't take responsibility for people and abandon them at the most difficult moment. Clint orders Leo to shut up now. Clint has long since taken off his rose-colored glasses, but has not stopped being a child who will throw away an unnecessary toy when it is no longer needed, like a disabled person throwing off his crutches after treatment. Clint grabs John by the collar and remembers Alice and Meg, who also need to be saved and how he needs to keep track of everyone. Nothing could be more important than their lives. Then why don't they leave those people to their fate? These are the thoughts that have been in Clint's head for a long time. The child's mother ran out of the bus with tears in her eyes and asked them not to abandon them, since she herself understood her hopelessness. It was in vain that she intervened between the conversation between the furious Clint and John she could definitely get into trouble, since Clint, in a rage, does whatever he wants. She nevertheless approached them. They turned their attention to her, and soon she would drive Clint to the point of absurdity. She walked up to John, grabbed his hands, and begged him not to leave them. She grabbed his arms tightly, letting him know that her requests were sincere. She laid her head on his chest and continued begging, but John couldn't even say a word. He had a very difficult choice— as if the captain's place was occupied by two people, Clint and John, only Clint had already decided everything. She understands that they cannot watch their loved ones turn into dead people. John is immediately reminded of this situation, a moment from memory when his parents became dead, and every time these images pop up in his memory and lead him into darkness. Here it is, a grimace of fear on the fearless and valiant John, who cannot move his tongue after such an influx of problems. Incredibly, now Clint is definitely furious. He is ready to tear and throw. He grabs his mother by the hair and she is unlucky to fall under Clint's hot hand. He throws her to the floor. Absolute rage. Even after getting his hand shot, he wasn't this angry. The boy was already becoming a zombie and his mother was thrown to the floor in front of her eyes with such force. Clint grabs her by the collar and makes her understand why they want to leave them. They are weak and useless. That's what an angry Clint, who is full of rage, thinks. He points out that they can only cry from no help and no gratitude. Clint's words scared even Alice and Meg. It was difficult for them to hear this, but it was much more difficult for the other passengers, since they were the ones who were going to be abandoned. Everyone began to leave the bus. All the passengers understood where this was all going and saw no point in being a burden for them. All the patients heard Clint well. Everyone began to leave their seats. The bus became lighter and lighter, and this was precisely the load that was beyond Clint's strength. 
Alice agreed with Clint, since even she, without a leg, protects John's sister and manages to give him joy. Clint had already pulled out a dagger and was ready to chop up that impudent mother who dared to go where she shouldn't have. Clint puts a lot of pressure on them, even if he's partially right, but he shouldn't get away with such craziness. Clint is cruel to those who do nothing. Everyone is equal to him. Be she a mother with small children. Be a wise old woman. He will not take them into account and put a knife to their neck. John is silent. Something in his character doesn't add up. He would never allow Clint to do whatever comes into his head. Clint was determined to send every single burden out the door so that they would never cause trouble again. Mother begs for help. Wrinkles appear on her face from fear and pain. Still, one of the passengers decided to show his character and hit Clint very, very hard so that he would stop doing all this. Michael tries to catch the falling Clint, and his offender brazenly stands and watches as his enemy, and once his boss falls from his blow from behind. They are real impudent people, without doing anything. They demand more than anyone else, as if important persons to whom everything is offered on a saucer also dare to beat their protector. The man decided to mention a certain rescue once upon a time when Clint saved them. Clint is also wrong in giving complete protection. He himself taught them not to do anything, when he himself solved all their problems and allowed them to sit under his wing. The beginning of the apocalypse, the dead literally walked under the eyes of the doors and looked for their future victims behind every door. That man at that time was very frightened, trembling, and the sweat dripping from his face confirmed all this, as if he was a rooster whose head would be cut off any minute. It seems like the dead have no mind, but they were able to find out about the people in the apartment, even behind the door. Everyone was paralyzed with fear. Small lightning passed through the nerve endings, adrenaline played at full strength, and the body froze. As if shrouded in chains, the body could not take a single step. The man grabbed a knife from the closet. How will it help him against the crowd of zombies, just not to give in to them too easily? He was very weak in spirit, literally, not yet fighting back. He decides to commit suicide, but his wife stops him in time. The dead were already on their heels and peeking out between the cracks of the doors, showing with all their appearance that they wanted to devour everyone here. Suddenly, a dark silhouette appears behind you, be it the shadow that saved all those people from inevitable death within four walls. The corpse of a dead man falls face down into his own pool of blood. They are saved. This man spoke about this salvation. People still can't believe that they were rescued and it turns out that they even tried to find them. Clint pointed out to his people that there would be people in this house, and he turned out to be right. Clint didn't expect there to be so many people here, so he was very happy. He brought the pipe to that man and pointed it at him, which made him very scared. It was then that Clint said that they could follow him. Then there was not a drop of self-interest in his words, but now he drives them away without even giving them a chance to show themselves. Clint made a promise to them that they could be under his protection, and now people point out to him that it was his fault that he saved them. Clint was enraged by such impudence. He could not believe that such a useless burden began to contradict him and talk about justice. Everything is obvious, Clint slowly said the man's name, which means that something big is planned, lest the man lose his life after such words. Clint says that he is too good, but he sees such insolent people first, who blamed their breadwinner without doing anything for him. His veins bulged with anger, his fangs sharpened, and his gaze became frightening. He was ready to send every rebel to the next world so as not to meet with them. Clint is not involved in charity work. You want a roof over your head and food on your plate. Be prepared to give at least some benefit to the boss. He throws this insolent one and points to his place, from which moment Clint began to have the responsibility to cater to their every whim. The following impudent people are not far from the man. Everyone wants their share, and they are ready to kill Clint, considering him their equal. They pulled out their knives and quickly rushed towards Clint. Michael and Sam take the brunt of it, and overall the entire fight rests on their shoulders. Sam has already been grabbed by the face. The battle is both ridiculous and serious. Michael is surrounded on all sides. The battle is quite tense for both of them, especially when the fight is not equal. They were not weaklings and even showed themselves well, since even Sam had probably already lost a couple of teeth. Sam flies off to the onlookers after taking a strong blow to himself, but everyone around is surprised at the fight in which both sides are in the wrong. 
Meg is very frightened and holds on tightly to Alice. Everyone could not expect such a brawl in the middle of the day. The mother of a sick baby asks that they not fight. She is afraid of the consequences. She dares to beg for help, but is afraid of fights. In her place, she should hide in a secluded place and not stick her head out for a while. Suddenly, her doll-like gaze turned her attention to something else. She does not lose hope that John will help her and calls him again and again, asking for help. She addresses him without saying his name, as if she never cared what his name was, even after what he did. Still, Clint will not leave her alone. She will always get what she deserves for every impudence she has. That sparkle instantly disappeared from her eyes. All her hope disappeared the second Clint grabbed her hand. Whether everything was lost for her, it all depended on his mercy. From Clint's face, one can understand that nothing good is in store for her, only more pain, fear, and horror. Clint explains to John that these people don't give a damn about him when they don't need him, and when they do need him, they will always ask for help. He believes that they do not value anything that is given to them on a plate. All they need is constant protection and food right on their plate. Clint tries to reach out to John, but in response, he receives unanswered silence. Something is definitely wrong with John. The words of that mother were too painful for him. He continued to remain silent, as if the whole outside world did not matter to him. Perhaps the attack of that wanderer, the arrow, the tip of which was smeared with his blood, was to blame for this state. Clint endlessly explains about the personalities and character of those people who beat Michael and Sam at that very second, explains to him that for all of them, he will always be a monster whom they will honor as a god and pray as needed. There was anxiety in John's eyes. What happened to him was known only to him. The wanderer's blood began to act and metastasized. There was an uncharacteristic trembling in him. The spread of the poison had begun, yet John's behavior had already told everything long ago. Clint is worried. He just now noticed the oddities in John's character and began to ask him what happened to him. Blood gushed from the wound. Clint's eyes showed all his fear. They had the same fear as 15 years ago one night. John was spitting blood. Clint was trying to catch him and somehow help with his condition. John's fall could no longer be stopped. The poison was very strong. That wanderer was very dangerous. Even his blood brought many problems and even incapacitated John. What kind of power is hidden in that stranger that could send John to a hospital bed with his incredible regeneration? Clint is shocked. He could previously understand the strangeness in John's behavior, but he reacted too late and may have lost his friend. Our hero collapsed to the ground. He had no face before, but now his powerlessness and malaise are even worse than before. It's all due to the blood of the wanderer. What are his goals? John lost consciousness and was bleeding. It was very strange for him to lie in such a state. No one could bring him to this. Mother immediately reacts to everything with screams and screams. She is more afraid for herself than for our character, since without him, Clint will abandon them, which means that they will all die. Alice is sincerely scared for John. What's wrong with him? Whether the wanderer is guilty of this, these are the questions that come to her mind. Finally, everyone stopped fighting and looked towards John. Oddly enough, they were scared. But who was scared for John, and who was scared for themselves? It is clear that only Clint's team is afraid of losing John as a friend. John did not want to wake up. Nothing was written on his face, but only he knows what pain he is experiencing now. Clint was trembling with fear. His hands were shaking. He did not understand why this happened to him so suddenly. He lay at his knees like a lifeless corpse, did not react to anything, did not respond to the call and did not show any signs of life at all. Clint, afraid of doing something unnecessary, lightly touched his face, as if he were a museum exhibit or an archaeologist with a new fossil. You could tell from Clint's face that he was worried. He didn't understand what had happened in such a short period of time. After a while, the situation became calmer. Countless fights ended, and all attention turned to John. Alice was tearing out pieces of gauze with her gentle hands to bandage John. They had already tied him up tightly, put a bedding under him. Everything was sterile and safe. John was well taken care of, but it was too late. Clint scolds Leo for negligence, since he did not notice the injury, although the doctor. Clint completely scolded Leo, but Leo refused his words since he was always there and was in the dark himself. Leo accurately indicated that he is a specialist in treating people. He certainly has not encountered treating the dead. Everyone was severely beaten and seemed to be placed side by side in a corner, 
but the man decided, without asking silently, to leave in an unknown direction. Clint reacted to him immediately, and his intentions were only to go to the restroom to relieve himself. He immediately screamed and ordered to sit still and endure, while he mumbled something like an apology. Clint was very angry with them, and even no need bothered him. Our boy instantly calmed down since he cannot scream in front of John so as not to worsen his condition. Everyone gathered around John and monitored his condition in detail, but now they won't miss anything. Clint put his hand to his forehead and realized his temperature had risen. Clint finally understood the reason for John's condition. It was all the fault of the wanderer who smeared the arrowhead with his poison blood. Nevertheless, the fears were confirmed. The stranger squeezed the arrow until it bled, wounded himself in order to finish off his enemy. John saved Clint at the cost of his safety. Only the speed of the arrow would have been enough to kill Clint. But the wanderer was serious and decided to kill him without mercy. Clint's hand was shaking. He was afraid that he and his carelessness were to blame for everything. It was he who was attacked, and it was him who John saved, covering him with his body. He felt guilty. There was sadness on his face about what he would have to do to atone for his guilt. John's sudden cough pulled everyone out of the abyss of despair, and he finally woke up. Clint immediately started bombarding him with questions about whether he was alive, how his condition was, and whether he had woken up. John opened his eyes. He is still alive. He is not such a weakling that someone's blood would kill him. Everyone rejoiced, shouted his name, a bright smile appeared on their faces. The world was filled with new happiness. For John, it is a joy to wake up and see familiar faces in front of him. His smile begins to shine better than any star in the sky. But still, this does not make his condition better. He needs to ask for help just to get up. But still, no one will refuse him here. John's gaze became clearer. He stopped being so empty and drooping, and finally you can expect an answer from him. He touched his face and wondered why his face was so dirty, as if he were with his little son who had gotten dirty in the sandbox. John's behavior was just as strange. For some reason, he cared so much about Clint. John noticed the parasite passenger sitting nearby, whom Clint had left alone while the hero was in oblivion. Clint did not like the way John behaved. In his behavior, he saw excessive concern, as if he was not of a traditional orientation. John couldn't stop praising him for working so hard to keep things in order. Clint began to become cocky in response to John's affections, since, in his opinion, he was vile. He explains everything by saying that he was obliged to do so. If everything had been different, Clint threw overboard all the unnecessary ones. John remained silent. He beat every rebel. Every single one of them got what they deserved. Everyone got a couple of bruises and bruises. Clint pointed out that John would never get the chance to save him again and appear so holy. Clint even judged him for caring about everyone but always forgetting about himself. John began his speech again, which should touch Clint to the core. He explains to him that even if he returned to the past, he would save him again. Even knowing that the arrow was poisoned and could kill him, he would expose his back to the blow. Clint stopped. John's words pierced him much deeper than that ill-fated arrow, and it remained deep in his heart. For Clint, this John's arrow was not in the back, but in the heart, and he took it into himself, be it medicine. He was captivated by these praises. He could not even finish the sentence as John bombarded him with compliments. John gets up and explains that Clint doesn't owe him anything because he's not just comrades, but friends. Clint protected John's little sister as well as Alice. This is what elevates him above everyone. This is why John considers Clint a true friend. Even when that wanderer attacked him, Clint did not leave his friend in danger. He went into battle with a stronger enemy and threatened him with an ordinary crossbow. Then Clint was the only one who came forward to help John. Clint was touched by John's words. Joy was visible in his eyes that he was praising him so much, praising his virtues. John sits up and lets Clint finally understand that all his good deeds mean that they both don't owe each other anything. John considers such signs of relationships to be characteristics of sincere friendship. Clint froze in one place. John's words struck him so much that he was petrified at that very second, as if he had been standing in the bitter cold for a very, very long time. Clint's mouth opened very wide. He did not understand how to react to such praise, since he had probably never heard such words from anyone. Here is Clint's real smile, full of joy and happiness. He finally heard what he so wanted to hear. 
He was very embarrassed, but continued to pretend that John's words sounded vile and disgusting. He did not stop praising him, but others reacted to this with their contemptuous silence. Alice was the most unhappy about this reunion. There was no joy in her face, only obvious disgust. What use was a bloodstained t-shirt for them, that their hands were shaking just from the mere sight of it? Clint's entire team couldn't even put on bloody clothes, but why did they need them? Sam wonders what is special about this clothing, why it was smeared with blood from the van. Clint listened to John again and ordered them to do as he told them, because if he said so, then it was certainly true. One of them decided to express his dissatisfaction and explained that under no circumstances could he even throw it on himself. John coolly pointed out that if they did not wear these things, they would meet death much earlier than fate predicted. They immediately became worried, because death is a bad joke, and John is even worse. John's decision is driven by the fact that the slime on his clothes will delay the transformation of those who ate the flesh of the dead earlier. John found a use for even this useless slime and rot that would save many lives. Michael and Sam looked at their clothes, realizing that it was pointless for John to deceive them, and they could trust him, but putting on such horror was beyond their strength. Is Tim really up to something again? His strange hum can only mean one thing, that a new thought has crept into his head, how to annoy John and Clint's entire team into the bargain. The shaved man and the whole gang reacted to their boss's grunt and were also confident that he had come up with something again. Answering a question with a question without even turning around suggests that Tim's insidious plan has begun to take effect. He wants to survive, although this is not strange for him, but there is a hidden intent in his words, since his methods of survival can reach the point of absurdity. Tim's gaze was more determined than ever. He was excited but also cool about everything and everyone. His feet stepped towards all the people and passengers to pick up his clothes. Something is not right in this van, but for sure a lot of rot, flesh, and blood, this whole mixture of everything kills the desire to approach it. Tim had already approached Sam. He tried to push him aside to get to the van. What happened to Tim? A minute ago, everything was normal with him, and suddenly his look changed. In his eyes, one could tell about everything that was bothering him. The capillaries swelled and painted the whiteness of his eyes blood red. The stench and filth, only this was reflected in the insides of the van. All the worst things gathered in one place. Tim was suddenly plunged into memories, as if his head were filled with old photographs, which prompted him to return to the past. In these memories, he was defeated in fencing. Whether his opponent was strong is known only to Tim. It is clear from his face that he is not happy about defeat. Otherwise, he was afraid of something. Defeat for him is not just one time. He will constantly remember it and torment himself. Everyone praised the winner. All this was a lot of pressure for Tim, since they are obliged to praise him, and not some winner. The stands rejoiced, as if their biggest bet, which they had placed on Tim's opponent, had won. They praised him and called him the most pleasant words. Only one was not happy with the outcome of the fight. He chuckled contemptuously in Tim's direction. The non-rejoicing fan turned out to be Tim's father, and it was he who brought him the greatest fear. Defeat frightened Tim, since his father's reaction would be too cruel. The father got up from his seat and went in his direction. There was nothing holding him here anymore. His cruelty was too extensive. Even when Tim shouted at him, he no longer reacted to a single word. Tim asked his father for forgiveness, asked him to give him another chance to prove his worth. He calmly answered him that it was not worth it, since for him personally it had no value. The most terrible and influential person in Tim's life has always been his father, who was influential for everyone and not only for Tim himself. The father had no hope for his son. He initially considered him a weakling, and nothing could change his decision, not even an ill-fated victory. All hope of rising in the eyes of his father disappeared from him, his eyes filled with emptiness in the same way as his fortitude. All efforts were in vain, all hopes for elevation before his father fell to the ground, hope left him first, followed by everything else. Even if it was a real fight, even if Tim was pierced with a real blade, none of it would bring the same pain as the pain of disgust from such an influential person as his father. He was chilled to the point of trembling in his bones. He bowed his knees and did not stop trembling, as if one defeat stopped his life. Time passed more slowly for him. He suddenly cried out towards his opponent, as if victory would have made a difference. 
Behind the mask, the face of the opponent was not visible, who had deprived Tim of such a good opportunity to rise at least a little in front of his father. He grabbed him by the collar of his suit and began blaming him for all his failures. Tim was furious. His opponent was his pillow to vent his anger. He was ready to cut off his head. Our lover of winning does not allow his opponent to enjoy the victory and sends him to the floor with one blow. Tim is trying to improve himself so that his father is happy, and this freak stands between him and his father and prevents him from achieving his goal. His opponent paid in full for his impudence and received all he deserved. Tim tore off his abuser's mask for protection and continues to blame him for everything, like a real child. Screams, screams, attempts, everything came from Tim. He cannot accept defeat with dignity. There is no other way to achieve his father's recognition. For Tim, this is no longer just a dream, but a real nightmare. Since even in his memories, his main enemy turned out to be John, who haunts him even in oblivion. Again, Tim screams and fears awoke. The one he never wanted to see again appeared in his dream. The dream turned into a real absurdity, and now he was an adult and met an adult John. He decided to look around, since nothing could be expected in this place. Everything was new to Tim. Now the stands are filled with the dead. They have driven him into a corner like cattle. He is surrounded. There is no hope of salvation, and only inevitable death awaits him around the darkest corner. Tim orders them not to approach, but it is unlikely that any of them will hear him. Each will reap his own peace and will not leave a living place on it. The lifeless bodies of the dead spun in a round dance like dancing with the devil under the moon by selling your soul weight, you get temporary bliss. A shudder ran through Tim. Fear permeated him completely. What he saw plunged him into horror. In the dream, John considered Tim only as food. He saw only food in front of him. Pinch Tim already, free him from this nightmare, show him the way out, since more than one person cannot withstand such pressure. Tim tried to push everyone and everything away, but it was unlikely that the mindless dead would listen to him, who violently attack and do not see obstacles in front of them. While the boss was sleeping, night had already fallen, and his nightmare caused him to shout to the entire bus, which disturbed all the passengers in the middle of the night. He woke up in a cold sweat, as if he had been doused with ice water, which pulled him out of the abyss of that nightmare. Everyone was surprised. No one could have expected Tim to wake up so suddenly. Clint and John are next to each other again, and they also decided to show their attention to Tim, who is having nightmares and will soon start cutting his teeth. The Sixes ran up to their eldest and began to explain everything that happened to him while he was unconscious. They began to speculate on the cause of the collapse and pointed out that the foul aroma of dried blood from the van had caused Tim to pass out and fuel his dreams with nightmares. He grabbed his head. It was clearly in great pain, since the dream was truly terrible from beginning to end. A silhouette of his father from a deep past appeared in Tim's head, a past that appeared in his dreams and plunged him into even greater despair. He breathed a sigh of relief and said that his father would no longer do the same to him as he had done before. The night continued. The stars shone with small lamps, but could not outshine the moon with their light. They suddenly stopped and were ordered to hurry up and vacate their seats. Shaved continued to explain what happened while Tim was unconscious, and he said that all the women and children were hidden in a washed van, as it was safer. They stopped here to wait out the night and live until tomorrow, and for complete comfort they lit fires and began to warm themselves. In the dense forest it was not so gloomy, it was quite light, and the light from the fires provided not only this light, but also warmth and comfort in addition. The boy is getting worse and worse every second. The scar on his mother has healed, and the man is trying to ask for help. He asks to get some meat, but Clint instantly reacts to him with aggression. John no longer gives a damn about how Clint behaves. He is absolutely indifferent to his goal and does not see any obstacles. Clint is absolutely right as he orders them to find a way to get the meat themselves and not endlessly hope for salvation from John and Clint. John's vision with Clint's blood gives him an incredible advantage, being able to see the body heat of his victims and know their location in advance. John gathers everyone who is dressed in bloody clothes, and apparently he is going to teach everyone to hunt and get food on their own. They were very surprised, they hoped for free help, and John was not a fool and to prove that the men among the passengers were hunters and not cowards. John put forward the most correct solution, did not throw anyone overboard, but found a method to train everyone and avoid a lot of problems. 
It's unclear whether Clint is happy with this fair decision, but John is right, as he gave them the opportunity to prove their worth. Everyone else despaired as they were heavily criticized. Even if they were wrong, they certainly did not want to hunt. Tim and the shaved man glared at John, but still remained silent as they were given the opportunity to feast on the animal's meat. The boy was already coughing a lot. His condition was getting worse and worse every minute. He urgently needed help. The man began to understand that his son urgently needed help, and it would be better for him to hurry up and get meat for the family, otherwise he would lose his offspring. He clenched his teeth. There were many contradictions in his head. He could not decide to hunt in the dark forest, but at the same time, he really wanted to feed his son and heal him. Nevertheless, he pulled himself together, gathered his fingers into a fist, and made up his mind to get meat for the family. John clearly knows how to manipulate people. He is good at creating contradictions for them, putting pressure on them and forcing them to dance to his tune. Everyone instantly gathered their courage, took their will into a fist, and headed after John. Clint, Michael, and Sam were very surprised by the activity of these hopeless people. They certainly could not expect such a reaction from them, but it was as if someone was holding them. Clint considers their behavior crazy, but Michael contradicts him because he believes that they should stick together. Tim remained silent again. His intention to survive had disappeared somewhere or this was a trick to show his desperation. He decided to go with everyone. The shaved man tries to call him, but he doesn't seem to hear him. Those who participated in the hunt will receive the meat, and Tim Six understand this well and also decide to go after the boss. One of the survivors noticed something strange on his clothes. Something vaguely similar to a sticker or photograph was stuck to it. That picture caught Tim's attention. It reminded him of something familiar, as if he had seen it before. He decided to take her with him and check whether she really was familiar to him or just imagined it. The hero brought the bloody photo to his face. His reaction would tell him what was hidden on the other side. Still, the photo did not give him any pleasant emotions, but even frightened him, plunged him into shock. It covered his face with black silk. Another drop of sweat flows from his face. Nightmare after nightmare haunts Tim over and over again. Six noticed the boss's reaction. He decided to find out what happened to him and what kind of image in the photograph changed Tim's face so much. This photo is from Tim's childhood. It completely reflected the horror of his entire youth. Incredibly, the photo shows the ruler of City B, Tim's father and the pervert, because of whom that terrible night in Clint's life happened, when because of him, Clint was crippled both mentally and physically. Clint suspected something, but not in vain, since they were talking very strangely and were definitely up to something. He snatched the photo from Tim's hands, which he didn't expect at all, whether Clint would be glad to see his hater. It is not for nothing that the photograph is stained with blood, since it reflects all the pain of those who have ever contacted that person in the photo. Still, it haunts me that the photograph was in the van in which the frightening creature was hiding and how it and the wanderer are connected with City B. Is it true that it is a trap and how soon will they get there? Clint's reaction is similar to Tim's, but he was much more shocked because his childhood nightmare turned out to be the father of his enemy. At that very second, images and memories of those events that Clint so wants to forget flashed into his head. Tim wants the photo back, but Clint doesn't want anyone other than his family and John to know about it and immediately removes his hand from Tim. Tim was already furious. He bared his teeth and he also wanted to take the photo for himself. But his anger passed. Clint's reaction made him scared. Even his strength left him. When Clint realized that this pervert was his father, he changed. He became a completely different person. His aura became much more overwhelming than before. Tim suspected in his gaze that perhaps he had connections with his father, and from the reaction he understood that they were not friendly. Shaved wants to avoid conflict and pulls the elder out of the conversation, inventing a reason for this. Six thinks Clint is truly creepy since he still hasn't taken his eyes off the photo. Clint had already pulled away from the crowd. He had lost all the mood to kill animals. He wanted to hide in the most secluded corner. He was finally able to tear himself away from the photograph, lowered his hand and prepared to leave on the way back. He simply, silently, went to the camp with everyone. That photograph opened his old wounds and returned him again to his unhappy past. The night continued. The stars were not going to leave the sky and were shining with all their appearance. 
Michael and Sam stayed with Alice and Meg to warm themselves by the fire and talk about various topics. Alice asked them why they didn't go with everyone in search of meat. Sam explained everything by saying that Brother Zombie told them to stay and look after the girls. Meg noticed that Alice had a new prosthesis and asked her if she was in pain and what she felt like. John did his best, so to speak. He gave her the leg that Tim took from her. She smiled sweetly in response and said something that was very convenient, and she was grateful to him with all her heart for it. Clint came back. His hunt was over. He found something he didn't want to find. Alice turned her attention to him and decided to call him, since it was strange that he distanced himself from John and the entire squad. Michael also asked him why he was not hunting, what made him leave there. It was clear to everyone that Clint was not telling something, what kind of excitement he was talking about, what had happened to him. All these questions visited his head over and over again. Now he turned to Alice. What did he need from her? Since before he had never been able to exchange words with her, even greet her, which was hard for him. Clint started with a difficult topic for her, as if he knew all her motives in advance, and that she never wanted to end up in B-Town. She was excited after all. Clint hit the bull's eye when he asked such a tricky question. Clint understood the sad truth that John had to get along with people through desperation. In addition, Alice herself understands that when they reach the city they will have to part, and this can only be avoided if they turn off the path. Clint knows how to apply pressure to get the truth out of a person, but it feels like he already knew everything. He feigned a smile at her and pointed out to her that it would be better for them to stick together, but she already knew the solution to this problem. He spoke in riddles that only Alice could understand, because even if all the problems were solved, John would not stop helping all these people. Clint said everything that was stored in her head. It was not without reason that she agreed with Clint when he began to point out to all the passengers that they were a worthless burden. We returned to the forest at the very height of the hunt, and fortunately, everything around was already brighter, all the conditions for a successful hunt. Tim's gang was chasing a deer with doll eyes, but they don't care about any eyes. They want meat, and only meat. Tim is not a fool, and is already holding the tip of a stick and preparing it for an attack, just like I did in ancient times, when people hunted with spears and bladed weapons. His strength is incredible. Whether he trains and throws a spear so that he can always be ready for this moment, it is not the smartest or the strongest who survive, but the fittest. The spear hit the target and pierced the deer in the center of the belly. Now all he could do was run into the hot broth. Such a spectacular throw and such a ridiculous fall, Tim failed immediately after such a pathetic attack. Everyone immediately forgot about their eldest and rushed at the deer, as if they had found a pot of gold under a rainbow. Still, the deer will kick to the end for its life and will do everything to escape from these greedy people. Six shouts to Tim to quickly get up and run to the rescue in order to finish off this animal. The hunt is not so easy for them, Tim falls, but gets back to his feet in time to get his piece of meat. He grabs a large boulder. Apparently the deer's death will be quick, but not painless. The deer continues to kick, and Tim walks for a long, long time with his stone, but you can rely on the sixes, since they are able to hold one deer. In the eyes of a deer, as if nothing ever happened and will never happen, the eyes of a doll have a sweet appearance and complete defenselessness. Tim delivers the final blow to the deer and finishes it off, blood gushing out like a fountain in all directions. Still, Tim did his best. They realized that it was not in vain that they went hunting, since they were able to taste such delicious meat and did not even need to share it with anyone. The Sixes praise their eldest for the beautiful murder, and offer not to share this delicious meat with anyone. Shaved still can't believe that John was able to survive and also became a reasonable zombie, and all the problems are because of him. If it weren't for him, they wouldn't have gone down like this. They can't trust John and want to escape in their van, replacing the wreck with a nicer car. The Sixes do not have time to finish chewing, but chatter constantly. Only Tim remains silent while he eats and enjoys every piece of food he gets. Still, the six are itching, and he needs to ask Tim a tricky question about the photograph they met on the eve of the hunt. That photo was in the truck where that creature was sitting, and the six noticed it well since it was very important information. Tim pushed his subordinate away, since he did not like such information, yet all the memories with him were very terrible. Tim agreed with the plan, but the discussion of the photographs asks to be postponed, and perhaps for a long time. 
Tim has already made up his mind. His eyes are filled with confidence, and he is ready to crush them. How on time John arrived at such an interesting conversation, he considers Tim a real person of any kind of fear. All their faces changed dramatically. John destroyed their entire plan at the stage of its discussion and eliminated it at the root. Soon John will have the joy of catching Tim in the midst of executing a plan. He is about to lower Tim from the moon to earth and grabs him by the collar to show him where the crayfish spend the winter. In addition, he asks to compose a song about everything that has been said and to perform it in tears so that he can listen to this symphony. Again and again his plan fails and he can't finish it as John catches him at the most inconvenient moment and chops him down, stopping them. John will not even let him reach the camp in peace. He will do everything himself and drag him to the people on his own. Finally they returned, the entire fleet was in place, every car was in place as it was. John throws Tim to the ground and clearly shows him his place. He must not leave the camp even a meter. He is distracted by shouts from the side. People are worried, and someone is trying to calm them down. What happened during the absence of John and the gang? Why is everyone so scared? They clutch their heads and shout that the city is occupied, and there is no longer any salvation for them. Tim was pierced by new information that they would not be able to make it, and perhaps his reaction was connected with his father. On the radio, they say that the city is under attack by someone, and there is rustling noise due to interference. Such news is the worst for all survivors. Tim crawled on all fours and could not believe that the city was no more, including his father. He was greatly shocked by this news, as if the sky had fallen right on him, as if he had fallen off a cliff into an endless abyss and fell endlessly, losing all hope, even of death. In his mind, the city was burning, and his father and the city were like a log in the middle of the wood chips. He is very worried. He cannot believe that such an influential man as his father simply allowed his own city to be occupied. Tim is in complete denial that his father could be dead. Even if he died in his arms, he would constantly refuse to accept it. The image of his father popped up in his head more and more often, as if his father was next to him every day. Tim could not deny the power of his father, and his thoughts made it clear that the ruler could never allow his city to be occupied. People could not know about the power of that man and had completely lost hope of survival. Clint explains to everyone that it is too early to give up hope, and the problem is that the radio works with interference and they do not know the full information. Because it all happened so quickly, almost instantly, that was all Clint could write down. It turns out that Clint was not the only one who heard this information and remembered Alice as if this was all their plan to avoid getting into the city. Based on her reaction, everything is clear. It is definitely connected with Clint's plan. But is it true that the city was occupied? The sister had her say. She confirmed Clint's words. Her words should have made John forget about the decision to go to the city. There was no joy in her. She completely sank, as if such a sweet little girl had lost all hope. She jumped on John and told him to never think about going into the city again. John seemed to suspect something. Meg's reaction seemed strange to him, as if she was doing all this feignedly. The reactions of the people were sincere, since they were already completely confident that the city no longer existed, which means that the last salvation had left the horizon. There was even a crybaby among the people. Someone was deeply struck by despair, which plunged him into the abyss, Fate hurts Tim from time to time, whether it punishes him for what he has done all the time or whether unfortunate events came together at the same time. He was incredibly angry at everything that was happening, the death of his father and the destruction of the city. He became John's hostage. All the worst things happened at the most inconvenient time, and he would not be able to find a solution to this any time soon. By the same time, night had already fallen. It was time for everyone to go to bed, but the news did not allow us to relax for a second. People already easily obtained food as if it was always at hand, they just had to open their eyes slightly. Still, the destruction of the city bore fruit. Such power gave Tim at least a chance to stay among the survivors, but now for them he has become an outcast. The impudent people decided that the city no longer exists, which means that Tim is now an entry ticket that has expired and has no value. Even a small crumb is very difficult for Tim, but now he doesn't even have those connections. Now he's not even a nobody with a capital letter. He has completely exhausted all his strength. 
and they are also throwing him in different directions, like a ball on a football field. They decided to take even the last hair from Tim's hands, otherwise he and he would be sent to hell. The only ones who remained on his side were only his team and subordinates. Only they were always faithful to him. Only they were from the very beginning and will be until the very end. They despair, but do not give up. This is not the first time for them to lose meat and give it to those insolent people. They understood the reason for this attitude, since the city was occupied, which meant Tim lost his last trump card, and besides, the entire conversation was heard by Clint, who was standing nearby. John, as always, is there and more than ever on time, he caught Clint spying on Tim, and it was not without reason that he thought it strange. Clint doesn't know how to lie and points out that John is a real spy, as he approached without making a single sound. Blonde understands that the situation is the worst, people are desperate, the city is destroyed, and the desire to look for food is getting weaker and weaker each time. John still insists on continuing towards the city, even if there is no hope at all. John explains everything by saying that with every kilometer traveled, there are more zombies and less food. John's words are confirmed by the fact that children and adults were starving and hoping that today they would be able to taste a piece of meat. The city is quite large and you should not lose the chance to visit it since they have already come a long way, and it would be a mistake to stop there. Clint is clearly not happy with his decision. His plan is not working, no matter how much he wants to tell John that he should stop, he does not hear a single word. Tim seems to have noticed the strangers who have been looming for quite some time and listening to their entire conversation. Shaved and Tim notice them. The two gangs are plotting around each other. Clint realized that it was too crowded here and it was worth finding a secluded place to talk with important information, since an extra word and all further actions would be in vain. Clint points out the truth that people can constantly circle around John with his abilities, John does not like this truth, and he remained silent. He was able to squeeze those words out of John. He won't be able to defend them forever. He means Alice and Meg, whom he will leave on Clint's shoulders. Clint was shocked by John's words, as he understood the consequences that would happen after John left them. Nothing will influence John's decision. In any case, he will leave everything to Clint. So to speak, he will leave a legacy. Clint is simply furious. He will not allow John to do whatever he wants and began to yell at him at the top of his voice. He doesn't like the way John thinks. He believes that the consequences will be irreversible. Tim and his whole gang will not allow his girls to live in peace. They will always intrigue and bother in any way possible. Now everything is clear. John did not try to bring up something fair in Tim. All his actions were only for profit, and he is alive only because there is still hope for the city. John is not so stupid as to give a potential killer free reign to kill everyone in his path and feed everyone with the meat of the dead. Tim hears the entire conversation. Now all the cards are revealed to him. All he has to do is run, since he is already digging his own grave by still being here. Tim's father is the ruler of the city, and he can give them the opportunity to enter the city without any problems. He can't do without mistrust, but he needs to use it as a free ticket into town. Tim is terribly angry with John. His show of justice and mercy was just a mask. In fact, John is hypocritical for the sake of profit. Tim is only John's ace up his sleeve as long as he is confident that the city still exists. Tim would be very valuable in the city and could easily be traded for a quiet stay in his city. But Clint was just as scared by John's words as they were by Tim. John is confident that Tim will always follow him and will not leave him alone even outside the city. He has the right to live only when people's lives are in complete peace and protection. Only one deviation from the condition, but he will not be able to come to an agreement and something very bad will definitely not be avoided. John puts his hand on Clint's shoulder and makes him a real promise that he will definitely keep. He swears that he will end Tim's life with his own hands if there is something in his agreement that does not suit him. Just one hitch and he will deprive him of his neck. Tim was very frightened because his words were sincere. He was determined, but he believed in his justice. He believed that his life would be safe. The weather completely reflects Tim's well-being. Now all the elements are raging in him. He has one foot in the grave, on the edge of a knife. Tim is running away from here. There is no longer any purpose for him to stay here. His face was covered in shadow, as if a black veil was covering him, as if every second was killing him. 
Even bumps and stones do not give him a chance to escape from this unfortunate place. Everything is against him. Every centimeter is permeated with danger for him. Tim absurdly falls into a puddle of mud. He is already all worn out, exhausted and weak, but everything around him finishes him off. His fearlessness disappears with every minute. Out of rage, he grabs the dirt with his hands, and his hand begins to shake. His fear knows no bounds. Failure after failure pursues him, as if lightning will strike him any minute. Tim will not allow himself to be offended in any case, but these are just his words. He is weak in comparison with John and the others. He can only run. Still, they won't let him safely escape and escape. Clint overtook him at the most unnecessary moment. Clint understood that Tim had heard the entire conversation, indicating that Tim himself was already lying in a grave that just needed to be buried and left forever. Does it make sense for Tim to continue to fight? Will he have a chance to escape? Will he see a bright future? Tim wanted to grab Clint's leg, but he was faster and removed it instantly. Clint was amazed by Tim's fortitude. Even now, he was climbing the slope of the abyss. No matter how high its peak was, he climbed higher and higher. The obstacles that fate gave him, he passed with ease. Only now he was overtaken by a dead end. He bared his teeth at all his enemies, no matter how strong they were, no matter how dangerous. He always showed his fangs and claws just to survive. He rises further, no matter what bumps there are, he will get up. Tim pounced on Clint. His strength never left him. His adrenaline was constantly pumping. Clint thinks he's stupid. Even if he was the most fearless, he's very stupid. Tim's pressure is stopped by one unfortunate umbrella, which turned out to be another obstacle. The grin doesn't leave Clint's face. He's ready to solve it at every moment and will always find a solution for it. Tim clearly did not expect such a move. He attacked first and will fall first. His methods of fighting are useless. He was pierced again as once upon a time, a long time ago, the enemy's rapier did not allow Tim to win the battle, and now he was pierced with an umbrella. He no longer fights strategically. He fights thoughtlessly, simply throwing himself at the enemy, becoming cannon fodder. Again he fell. Every enemy of his brought him to his knees. He was never strong enough no matter how hard he tried. Clint no longer had the same rage towards him. All he wanted was to punish him. He never enjoyed it. He already with four steps on Tim's head and shows him to his place, since he cannot take his side to stop John. Even Clint cannot convince John. He feels compassion for Tim, but cannot help him. He can only hurt John and mentions people eating zombie meat with the intention of using them against John. Tim is already empty inside, but now Clint humiliates him. Even fate, which was previously favorable to him, has turned its back on him. Clint is going to use him to stop John. Even Tim's gang will be part of his plan. He hints to him that he better find a good way to say goodbye to his people, since soon he will no longer be the boss, and his six people will no longer be people. Drops of rain were dripping on him. He had already fallen face first into the mud. There was no way to help him. The situation was one of the worst for him. The rain continued to pour in buckets, spilling tens, hundreds of thousands of drops of pure water onto the treetops. Tim will not be swayed by the words of some people. He always finds the positive in things, a true optimist whom one can only envy for his willpower. Even now he stood up and showed all his hefty strength. Even now he spits in the faces of Clint and John. Even now he laughs at their every word, even if he is already a winner. He is already laughing like a crazy person who is determined to win, even if he is not destined to survive. He will take a dozen like John with him. He will die. Everyone will die after him. He is a suicide bomber who will take him with him to the guardian of the scales, and it will be he who will decide who will go where. The rain stopped along with Tim's madness. The sky became completely clear and reflected that things were getting a little better. John tries very hard to help his beloved, whether it's all for the sake of leaving without any regret or genuine concern. The prosthesis is getting better and better. Now the bones will become a strong support. The prosthesis has become like a full-fledged leg. Clint pokes him with his umbrella and points out that he is as interested in the prosthesis as a child is with a toy, and spends the whole day with it. He asks him to fix the umbrella since it has been broken for a long time, and he is just doing other things. Clint opened the umbrella and showed its condition. Now it is like a sieve and allows moisture to pass through much better than before. The umbrella has become truly useless. You can see everything through it, no need. 
John came up with something brilliant at that very second. He would not restore its previous properties. He would add new ones. So simple and ingenious, he took a certain bone and placed it at the tip of the umbrella. Now Clint is a warrior with an umbrella. He really liked his work. A new weapon in their times was an irreplaceable gift. John interrupted him and grabbed his hand, as his stupidity could lead to bad consequences. He instructs him to never allow himself to get hurt on this bone, since it could become his last weapon. Still, Clint was distracted by shouts from the side. Someone was very indignant at the expense of someone. A kind grandmother was sharing food with a young boy, and a man behind was yelling at her as she was handing out food. Clint finally realized that these people are also capable of helping a friend and comrade. John points out that people tend to express their feelings more strongly when they're having a hard time when they should have been given a chance. He is very glad that they are still human, and their humanity makes them much stronger than all the dead. Even Clint was curious about where all this would lead. John did a good experiment and showed Clint what kind of people all these survivors could become. When Clint becomes interested, he twirls his white silky hair and begins to wonder if sometimes he really is wrong. The eyes are filled with interest, as if every burden began to disappear, and useful people came to replace them, capable of at least something. But the thought of what Tim would do did not give him peace of mind about how far this could all go. It's a clear, sunny morning. Birds are soaring into the sky, but looking at the sky, you can never say that the walking dead are roaming the paths. The rain left a heap of dew on the grass. The ground was damp and there were small puddles on it, which were seas and oceans for the small inhabitants. And suddenly, suddenly, a zombie attack in the middle of the forest, someone can no longer save his hand. The dead man has already sunk his sharp fangs under the skin. The shaved man turned out to be the victim of another dead man, and someone is ready to come to the rescue and cut off his hand before it's too late. The shovel pierced the skin, flesh, and bones. Part of the arm ended up on the other side. They did not leave the dead man unattended and hit him on the head with a large stone so that he would not get up for the second time. His head fell to the ground and created a large puddle of scarlet blood. Finally, he was completely dead. Shaven is grateful to his comrades for being able to save him and cutting off his hand in time. Six turned back with a kind of questioning look as if someone was walking behind him. That stranger became their eldest. Tim returned to them and everything around them began to shine. Tim was glad to see them, since they are the only bros he has to whom he can always say whatever he wants. They are always ready to come up with a new plan to escape. They are definitely positive. Tim grabs the fat man by the cheeks and asks his bros to calm down, since his plan will not lead them to survival, but will take all the offenders with him. After arriving, they would no longer be afraid of John. He was completely confident in his words, what gave him such confidence. His plans include becoming hundreds of times stronger than that rotten creature that is capable of fighting irrationally. For Tim, John is just a toy that they will chop off his head at any opportunity. The others did not understand Tim's intentions. He seemed to have gone mad and this alarmed them. He laughed terribly like a real villain before contemplating a new evil plan. At the same time, John eats delicious meat, which is very surprising for him. Clint, who caught him doing this, was also surprised, whether he was happy or disappointed, but he was definitely stunned. He enjoyed his food, licking his fingers as if he were eating some delicacy. Even if there is little food, they will continue on their way as soon as everyone is gathered and ready to move out. Michael shouts to everyone that someone is returning. Apparently John had already warned him and forced him to watch for everyone to come. Silhouettes like shadows made their way through the thicket of the forest and apparently everything was assembled. We could go. They were dragging raw meat, which would soon be eaten since many of the survivors were hungry. Tim and the whole gang were the last to return to camp and delayed everyone greatly. Nobody was happy with them since they hoped more that they had long since died and left this world. That same impudent man again shows his greedy nature. Even now he wants to take the last piece of meat, but will he be very surprised to find out whose meat it is? Everyone decided to support the man and insisted that they give up the meat and out of quiet sadness go into another world since there was nothing to eat anyway. Tim didn't care what these people said. His goal was to end it all, even at the cost of his life. Tim's indifference seemed impudent to the man, and he immediately rushed into battle for a piece of the dead man's meat. Tim grabbed him by the collar and made it clear to him to get out before it was too late. There was not a drop of fear in him, only an insane thirst to kill everyone here. 
take everyone's life and gnaw their bones. The man immediately learned his lesson, like the smartest student, and stopped being insolent to just anyone. John noticed this and instantly decided to stop him, but Clint was faster and stopped John. Clint pointed out to him a more important problem, which was lurking in that part of the forest, and it was there that there was a lot of zombie activity, which could become an even bigger problem. Still, that's where we'll have to go, and it would be better to solve this problem. But in the meantime, Tim and the whole gang made their way into the van with zombie meat, and their plan began to take effect. Tim looked around and probably suspected something in Clint's behavior. He clearly pointed out the problem and instructed him to use his eye. John refused such help and decided to go on his own and explore everything. Afterwards, John ordered to be here until he returns, and then they will go to the city. Clint thought with some confusion that his eye began to see worse. What did he mean? Everyone was already getting ready and taking their places, and John went to explore the forest and solve the problem. The rest were already returning to the camp, and from their running it was clear that they had brought a lot of booty. They brought a lot of meat to the camp, and for Clint this means only one thing, that he can begin his plan. Those who returned said that something was wrong with their condition, and they should hurry to their seats on the bus. The voices of the sixes could be heard from the van, and this gave them away. Tim looked through the crack of the doors, and was on guard so that no one would come in or see what they were doing. Six touched Tim's shoulder, and apparently they had already come to terms with what they would have to do for the sake of their boss. They no longer wanted to suffer and came to only one way out of this situation. They decided to eat raw zombie meat in order to help Tim take revenge with their sacrifice and take a couple of lives of the offenders themselves. Tim could not even think that his comrades would so decisively go to death for his sake. He did not even dare to mention such a thing. Such devotion could even make him feel, and he was able to say that they were not obliged to eat this meat for his sake. Shaved was already more determined than ever. Nothing would stop him. He grabbed his boss's shoulder and gave him the opportunity to trust. Everything was great for him. This is exactly how he wanted to die. To die for his boss, for his elder. Even if from the outside they look like a gang of student hooligans, their members are the most loyal and honest with each other. He clenched his fist so tightly that his whole hand began to shake, because every word from his mouth was the truth, a dogma that you just had to believe in. They understood why Tim became such a cruel and evil person. The tears of the shaved man broke through Tim. He was in shock, because he did not expect such fortitude from all of them. Tim became so angry because he wanted to save them, to save his reliable people, and he did not dare to lose them, since no best family could even replace their devotion. Everyone in the car began to cry like children, but everyone made an adult male decision, which they came to the very second they came to thinking. Suddenly, even now, Tim was plunged into memories of winter, of a cold white blanket, of strong storms and the terrible beginning of the apocalypse. To get food in such cold weather, one had to try very hard and even climb the slopes for the sake of one berry. Back then, Tim wasn't so long-haired. He shivered from the cold and obtained food with blood and sweat. Still, one wrong movement and all the efforts were in vain, as if he had lost more strength than he had gained. That same scar appeared all over his face after such an unexpected blow on an icy slope. He put himself in mortal danger just to get some provisions and enable himself and others to survive. He fell again into the cold snow. The attempt was in vain. The hope of survival smoldered like the last cigarette for a smoker. He had no choice but to die among the ice and become an ice statue. They were so hungry that they couldn't even make a move. Only Tim didn't give up and fought with fate equally. Even now he did not allow others to give up, but hunger drowned them out completely, and the eternal frost left no chance to rise and warm up. He could not believe that they were able to escape from the crowds of the dead, and now they would die from ill-fated hunger. His voice was very pained, but his only desire was to save his brothers. He was at a dead end. There was no food nearby. There was severe frost everywhere, and crowds of zombies were roaming. There was no mercy from this world. Even the fat man lost weight, but he really wanted meat, any meat. He would taste even the most disgusting meat. They wanted meat. Even if it was impossible to get, Tim always tried to find a loophole. He rummaged everywhere, but there were only fresh zombie corpses around, but he never stopped trying for the sake of his people. The dead were everywhere, as if an anthill had poured out of them straight onto the ground and now their lifeless bodies lay with empty eyes. Tim thought that this was the solution, 
the dead as a substitute for meat to fill the empty stomachs of his bros. He lit a fire and was ready to cook dinner for everyone, which would temporarily postpone the inevitable death of his comrades. Everyone greedily devoured the meat and could not believe that Tim was able to find the only salvation for them, meat, which was once in abundance, but now they have to fight just to take a bite. Shaved with disbelief decided to ask Tim about the meat, which he had not even tasted. Tim understood his guilt, but he simply could not do otherwise because he would have lost his comrades on the same day. Now the most important thing is survival, and then we can discuss this meat. They cried like children, but they proved their devotion, and they are Tim's true and only friends. Warm feelings awakened in Tim. He was touched to the very depths, as if a ray of sunshine broke through in the deepest cavity. They freed Tim and decided not to bother him with eating the meat. After all, at that time he breathed life into them and made them see even more bright moments. The first bite of fresh dead meat will entail a lot of problems. Now nothing can be brought back. Everyone thanked Tim at once and began to greedily eat the meat, since it was the last thing they would eat before the transformation. He felt enormous guilt for everything he had done. He did not know how to atone for it all. Even his death would not cost as much as he owed. Then he only pretended to eat zombie meat to convince them that the meat was safe. He obviously wanted to say something. It was on the tip of his tongue, but the lump in his throat did not allow him to say a word. Then he could not tell them about that meat, since they would have died of hunger and would not even have lived to see these days. He is a complete liar. He lied to them constantly, and they were always sincere with him. This is it, the beginning of Clint's plan. He locks everyone inside along with Tim so that he can be eaten in addition. He closes them from the inside so that the last ticket to the city will die among the dead. Tim noticed a strange click outside. Now even he has no hope of survival. Before their death, Clint even remembers to laugh at them and calls their actions cute. These dogs are ready to give their lives for their stupid owner. That's exactly how Clint spoke about them. The last click and movement of the hand and everything that was in this van will remain in this van. Hunting has already become a favorite place for survivors, but hunting for John means killing hundreds of monsters to the sound of their screams. Another dead man attacks again and again without even thinking about who is standing in front of him. With one flick of the finger, the insane creature is decapitated and sent to hell. The monster fell, but Clint didn't lie. This place really isn't calm. Everyone was defeated. The forest was filled with silence. Only the rustling of leaves gave life to this place. But still, there were far fewer zombies here than John might have thought, which is exactly what he was surprised by. He remembered everything Clint had told him before he sent him here to scout. He was confused as to why Clint sent him here since there wasn't much activity here. In addition, that strange smile on his face all this haunted John since everything in Clint's actions was unusual and for good reason. Suddenly everything became clear to him. His eyes opened wider. He finally understood everything and he should hurry up. Still, Clint's plan went as he wanted, as if he knew all the actions in advance and was ten steps ahead. Screams could be heard from the car, they begged to be let out, and Clint stood and pretended that nothing had happened. They tried to extract from him what he had in mind, but received silence in response. There were many eyewitnesses around, but Clint didn't care. He calmly left there with a pure soul. He took his mother by the hand and was already dragging her onto the bus, ordering everyone to take their seats as they were moving out. The mother decided to ask her beloved son where they were going, and he asked not to ask unnecessary questions and just go. They shouted after them, but it's unlikely that anyone will hear them, since they definitely have no more salvation. Clint called out to Alice and she instantly responded with surprise. He ordered her to take Meg with her and take their seats so that they could leave. She clearly follows Clint's plan, takes her sister by the hand, and she obediently obeys her. They heard this noise and rumble from the truck, but they were not going to do anything, but only go and follow Clint's instructions, since it was very beneficial for them. Screams, roars, and screams came from the car, but everyone had to hurry up and become passengers on the bus. Everyone was disturbed by the roar from the car, and they wondered what was there and what was hidden in it. Nobody understood where they were going and began to be indignant about it. They put forward the right thoughts about waiting for John, but none of this was part of Clint's plan, so no one will hear this guy. Clint makes it clear that they better go quickly, otherwise their flight will end and they will not go anywhere. The man was indignant, but could not contradict him, 
as he would have lost his rightful place. But he was also haunted by the truck with its screams and roar. What was in it, such questions were circling in his skull. Nevertheless, they decided to follow him. Since they have no other way, he will abandon them at any convenient opportunity. First they all have to come in, and later they will talk about everything that is tormenting their head. Clint sometimes glanced at the truck, something that brought him discomfort. The screams continued. No one could shut them up from the inside. But what was also frightening was what could come out of there in the end. Clint glanced at the ignition button and clearly decided to hit the road so that John wouldn't catch up with him. He pressed the button too sharply and too hard. Now he must take full responsibility for the consequences in the future. Old men and women were left out. There were no places for them. They were late. Clint is not going to feel sorry for anyone. To enter the bus, you need a ticket. They didn't have one, which means such passengers cannot even be present in the baggage area. He grinned brazenly and made an arrogant grimace to prove his cruel intentions. Clint orders Sam to head towards John. He definitely didn't want to get into the city and killed Tim for this. All those who dropped out ran after the bus, but it turned out to be faster than them, and soon they would leave the horizon. They fell, screamed, and asked to come back. But Clint in the driver's seat didn't hear a damn thing, of course, on purpose. The last hope fled and left behind a cloud of dust. Clint is too cruel a ruler to be merciful. The truck was too dangerous for them, since it contained the biggest danger for them, zombies that would devour them. Tim kicked the door with all his might, but it was too strong for him. He was surrounded. The guys would soon become mindless monsters, and the door was locked from the outside. He tried to get out, investing all his remaining strength. He fought against this ill-fated door like a monster. He wanted to open access to survival for himself. The boss was in despair, but tried to find a way out of this situation. He was like an experimental mouse that was locked in four walls with predators. He hit the door over and over again, but it was all in vain. There was no longer a chance for him to get out. He could only resign himself to fate. No one heard all the screams and calls, no one cared that there was still a person among the dead who would eat him or, even worse, infect him. Although he could be heard, no one would save him in such a hopeless situation. He is only one among the bras. Whether everything is over for him, only his determination can help him, since only it will give him the strength and energy to fight again. Tim was trembling with fear, but he knew that he could not die and he would definitely prove it. At the same time, the guys had already transformed. Their eyes shone like candles in a temple with a grin like the devil. They were already ready to kill Tim. Fear filled Tim with adrenaline, but chilled his body, as incredibly dangerous creatures stood behind him, from whom nothing could be expected. But he couldn't die today. He had to take revenge and grab the handle of the knife to finish off his boys. They had already become brutal. All that remained was to kill them, since it was either him or him, that's how natural selection was. But Tim should not face death yet. He still needs to take revenge on many people, and now it is too early for him to die. Someone was quickly rushing past tree trunks and creating a whistle from their speed. It turns out that John was already rushing towards the camp, because he was sure that Clint was up to something, and he turned out to be absolutely right. He fought his way through trees and bushes, knocking down everything in his path to stop Clint, since he had been acting strange lately. He was eager to find out what his friend Clint was up to, who decided to distract him and go in his direction. The bus was racing at full speed. At such a speed, it would be difficult to catch up with it if it was also constantly on the move. Alice grabbed Clint's hand and wanted to force him to return in order to take those people before it was too late, since he could not do this to them. This plan was very difficult for Clint, and there was no way he could sacrifice it for the sake of some people. She believes that Clint takes on too much, since he had to distract John in order to get rid of them. He was definitely furious after her words. If she hadn't been John's beloved, she would definitely have been in trouble. He was very tired of listening to nonsense from John. This John constantly pokes his long nose at him and teaches him morals, as if he were a small child. He threw her on the seat and this greatly agitated Meg, as she was very frightened for Alice. He doesn't understand that John wants him to become the most generous and fair. It really infuriated him. The passengers are perplexed by everything that is happening, but they will sit silently and look at everything with empty eyes until the end. Clint was very angry. 
He grabbed his head and clenched his teeth as if he really felt guilty. He had been alone all his life, and suddenly, this John came out of nowhere and started teaching him everything. It was both good and bad for Clint. Obvious bruises appeared under his eyes. He often experienced mental pain and his eyes swelled from tears. John was the first person Clint couldn't contradict, even if he didn't agree with him. Time after time, he took on everything and shared it with everyone, and even then, Clint agreed with him. He always wanted to avoid conflict with him, and this is what his silence led to. But all this does not mean that he always agrees with him and is completely on his side. He is the same person and has his own opinion, even though it is sometimes not correct. Clint does all this in order to correct John's mistakes, since they are the only ones who have each other, which is just wrong. Every mistake will be corrected by Clint, and in the end it will be just the two of them. That's what Clint wants. That's what he wants. Still, Alice told him the truth. John is not alone at all. Besides him, there is Meg and herself. Clint did not like such impudence on her part, and he silently looked at her, as if any minute his hand would grab her neck and make her beg for mercy. John also has human feelings, and besides, he must not only give them, but also receive them. Clint was already on the edge. She was completely right, but he couldn't give her John, since he was the only one who could warm up to him. He grabbed her by the collar and began to explain to her that she could not possibly be a comrade. She was a burden, and only a burden. She was calm. There was not even fear in her. She was truly strong. This is what a comrade in arms should be like. Suddenly the same truck crashed into the bus, yet Clint could not think through every step. At the most unexpected moment, his plan began to collapse. The whole bus shook, and everyone flew out of their seats as if an earthquake had started in the middle of a calm day. Clint was confused. His surprise knew no bounds, since anyone could have come for him. Behind the bus came a truck containing Tim and his gang, who were supposed to eat him, but something did not go according to plan. It was Tim who was driving. It's incredible that he was able to survive, escape, and get to everyone in such a short time. Tim had already caught up with them and was very angry, all wounded and wondering how he could survive after such a thrashing. The bros were lying in the back compartment of the van and apparently were killed by Tim. That's the man's fortitude. He escaped through broken glass, as evidenced by a piece of cloth from his clothing and a lot of spilled blood. He himself almost became a dead man. His breathing was heavy. He was ready to take revenge. Tim bared his teeth and promised that Clint would go to hell after everything he had done, and he himself would take him there. He leaves them no chance to escape as he steps on their heels again and again. Clint's plan began to collapse before his eyes, but he did not take into account only one point, and everything began to collapse like a house of cards. Tim can no longer be stopped. He makes a firm decision that Clint, John, and the others will go with him to the afterlife. Another violent collision with a bus, this is a life and death battle. Again, the whole bus is shaking. All the passengers are holding on to the handrails with difficulty, and there is general panic all around. Clint orders Sam to get behind the wheel and continue the escape, but everything is pointless, according to Sam. Clint doesn't like this turn of events. He has no choice but to swear and bare his teeth. Suddenly, Tim's hand breaks the glass. Now Clint is cornered. Now Tim is on a horse and will trample Clint to the ground over and over again. Everything is bad for him. Everything he did turned against him. All the mistakes that he wanted to correct became large-scale problems against their background. Tim was already ready for death. He survived with all his might to take revenge and take a couple more people. Meg and Alice are very frightened. Both are holding on to each other, as if something immense will separate them any minute. Clint didn't have a backup plan, just in case. Now his plan is ruined. John is already heading towards them, and Tim is already on their heels to kill everyone. The atmosphere became very tense for him. All his actions brought only harm. He turned out to be a complete coward as soon as everything began to collapse through his fault. He leaves everyone to the mercy of fate. His mother grabs him by the leg and begs him to save it, not to abandon it under any circumstances, and to keep it under her wing until the end of time. In her opinion, Clint is obliged to save her. Since she is his mother, he must protect her from all bad weather. There is complete bewilderment in his eyes, such impudence on the part of his mother. She dares to ask him for something when she acted worse and worse over and over again. She continued to crawl at his feet and beg for salvation. She was already distraught for her life. Her son had previously meant nothing to her, 
but now he is a savior for her. For a long time now, Clint had been screaming and whining in the same way. He asked to be saved, but his mother stood behind everyone and silently looked at all this. Even if they put a knife to her neck, she could stop this pervert. She could stop the vile father, who was already destined for a place in the flames of Inferno. Clint, of course, will save her. He will save her and sacrifice his most valuable things for this. Only it was she who taught him one thing that he must do in the first case. She taught him to initially save himself. Then you can think about your family, but he's right. Even if he abandons all these survivors, only his upbringing is to blame for his character. He runs from his mother's arms. Now she has the same face as Clint's once 15 years ago, when he was tortured and cut. Clint can no longer be stopped. He has already run far away from his mother, since earlier it was necessary to establish contact with him and then whine for help. He jumps out the window, leaving all the passengers alone without a commander, as if his biggest mistake. For many years, she hasn't even changed, about herself and only about herself. She doesn't care what happens to her son, only how she feels, nothing more. He will soon leave their horizons, but his mother still continues to point out to him that he cannot live even a minute without her. And then the memory struck again. He was a little boy running away from his mother. Then it was not too late to establish contact. He tried to shout out to her. He had once wanted to run away with her far, far away to leave all his problems here. Just the two of them to go on a trip and forever forget about what kind of life was prepared for him here. At the same time, his smile dropped. His mother refused him. She cannot fulfill even one of her son's most cherished wishes. Only now did she begin to realize her guilt. So many years had passed, and only now did it creep into her head that she could be responsible for everything that happened to her son. But it's too late to sob and cry. Tim is already breaking into the bus and is ready to take many lives before he himself dies. Now, Tim is not such a trash. Every offender will be chopped up by his hand. It's not without reason that he decided to do this. The survivors were very scared, they could not do anything to the zombies, especially when Tim became one. They begged for mercy, but Tim's eyes burned with a different desire. They burned like candles in a temple. His smile scared everyone around like the devil. He was definitely ready to leave everyone's hopes on his sharp claws. Clint made the biggest mistake of his life. He left John's girls right in Tim's hands, and if even a hair fell from them, John would destroy everyone. Alice protected Meg with all her might. She covered her with her whole body so that he would definitely not touch her. Tim was already very close. He looked into their frightened eyes. John had to hurry before it was too late. She broke out in a cold sweat. Her fear knew no bounds. No one could have expected what would come into Tim's head. Tim finally turned out to be happy for a long time. Even when he knows about his death, he is happy to take revenge on everyone who has annoyed him in his life. Clint was already running as fast as he could. He had no thoughts of where to run or how far. He ran wherever his legs took him. But suddenly he is stopped by someone's dead hand, whose it may no longer be important. Everyone with that skin color wants to kill Clint. It turned out to be John. If he finds out about everything that happened during this time, Clint will be in great trouble. He was very angry with him. John was ready to drill his angry gaze all over Clint in order to finally pierce his lying heart. He still wondered what had happened during all this time, and how such a plan had crept into his head to distract John and escape far and long. Tim didn't care anymore. The blows on him were pointless. They only did what irritated him and drove him to rage. Alice threw herself at him. Even if she was a fragile beauty, she could easily fight back the crowd of men in the alleys. But Tim will definitely not fall for such naive attacks. He easily catches her leg with the intention of depriving her of the other one so that she cannot kick as before. He squeezed her leg tighter, grabbed it with such force that it would crack any minute. It will not be easy for Alice to get out of his shackles, and she understands this well. Tim is now not the same as before. Now he is a dead man who does not care about death. Now an ordinary person is unlikely to defeat him. Tim is a real madman. He survived even after what happened to him. Anyone would easily accept death and go with it to the afterlife. But he is not like that. He laughs in the face of death and walks away from the swing of her braid from time to time. But Tim completely forgot that John added a good accessory to her. Not only did he become stronger, now she, having two legs, can give good blows. Still for Tim, such blows will be a trifle like a mosquito bite. 
Now even a pistol bullet won't kill him. She was amazed by his strength. No matter what blow she tried to throw, he always deflected it. Tim believes that Alice can only be taught something by force, and all because she is trying to fight him on an equal footing. Her willpower is the envy of everyone. Even when her neck is squeezed, she bares her teeth to her opponent. Even if her legs are cut off, she will not stop kicking. Tim is truly cruel. It's not for nothing that he came out of that truck alive. It's not for nothing that he's trying to take revenge. The last breaths of air were gone. She couldn't even say a word. John was too far away. It was unlikely that anyone would help her. Her hands were shaking, but never out of fear. She was shaking due to lack of air. She was not afraid of death. Tim wanted to turn her into a dead man, and only then they could be together. Only then he could achieve her. But she contradicted him. Tim was amazed by such impudence. Alice grabbed his cheek while he was strangling her, and brazenly said that he would not dare to do this. The elder didn't understand why he couldn't do this, why she thought so, why she was so unsure of him. She smiled back at him. Even in such a difficult situation, she did not despair, but only because she knew him well. No matter how cruel he is, there is one weakness of his, one weakness that she will tell him right to his face. The mask slips from her kind and naive look, and she is now the most furious warrior who puts pressure on her enemies only with her charisma. He is a weakling. Tim again left his guard along with his head in a completely different place and lost his eye. Fragile like crystal and strong like steel, it was she who was awarded the phrase that beauty saves the world. It is she who remains strong and beautiful, smart and reasonable, the best woman for the best man. Tim again remained a joke. Alice made fun of him, and he continues to kneel and prove his helplessness. Beauty is no longer the first to save her sister. Even now she manages to accomplish the impossible. Even now she does not let her down at the most inconvenient moment. She orders Meg to save herself and run away from here while her little sister detains this madman. But the most important thing is that Jonah's youngest runs away as quickly as possible. Meg didn't want to leave her friend alone with this monster, but she was categorically against it. She tells her to forget about her and run without looking back. The little sister wiped the tears from her cheeks and ran, ran as fast as she could to fulfill the instructions of her commander so as not to let her down at the most inconvenient moment. Alice looked after her to make sure that she had already left the horizon so that she was already so far away that no one could track her down. The battle is still not over. She turns her gaze to Tim and prepares to take a new blow. This monster tells her to stop, but now she is unlikely to find a new weak point for him. One wave of his hand and Tim is able to cut off the head of an elephant, leaving hope in its claws. Tim's claw swing was so powerful that it sent Alice flying and off the bus. Tim was already bursting with anger. He was exhaling steam from his mouth like a steam engine. The impact with the ground was not weak. Her back took the full impact. This picture is very tragic. A young girl lying in front of the bus. An incredible tragedy. A mistake by the driver who hit the sweet beauty. She fought to the end. But now she doesn't even have that fire in her eyes. He didn't have that life. She doesn't even have the strength to get up and fight back against Tim. Once upon a time, it lay in exactly the same way, when the end of the world had just come, when the whole world was suddenly filled with the dead and left no chance for humanity to develop. That time, Tim was very scared. His whole face was smeared in blood. But it is no longer known what would have happened to Alice if he had not cut off her leg before it was too late. From the shock of pain, she did not even have the strength to scream. She quietly said that she was in pain. She did not complain and did not interfere with her salvation. All this suggests that she is incredibly strong. Tim was very scared for Alice. She could have died in his arms, but he certainly could not survive the death of his beloved. Tim ordered his six to take off his t-shirt in order to help stop the beauty's bleeding. He instantly snatched the t-shirt from his subject's hands his hands shaking due to fear of loss. He bandaged the bleeding leg. Only one thing is unknown, whether such first aid will save her or whether everything is in vain. He sincerely hoped that she would be able to recover. He cared for her as if she were the rarest jewel. He touched her face and said that her leg had finally stopped bleeding. This was real luck, even a miracle. He promised her that it was with him that she would always be safe, no matter who stood in front of him. Now Tim was in complete madness. His mind was clouded. He could not utter reasonable words. 
but it was clear that he wanted to kill her. He grabbed her artificial leg and squeezed it tighter and tighter. Tim tears and destroys everything to smithereens. Even Alice's prosthesis is destroyed into the smallest pieces. Like a wild beast, he rushes at Alice. He is ready to die with her on the same day and take her with him to the afterlife. The willpower has dried up. Now she has lost the strength to survive. All hope remains in the Savior who will arrive from time to time. She has already said goodbye to her lover, to her chosen one, with whom fate has brought her twice already, but now she is ready to meet only in another world. How harsh this world is. Even such a beauty is taken away by this cruel fate, which initially gave everything that was most valuable and took it away for no reason. Her whole face was stained with blood. It was unclear whether she would live on and delight everyone with her beauty and strength. Incredibly, she opened her eyes. She survived, yet fate was kind to her. John, as always, is on time, always comes when the situation is already on the brink, when hope disappears but his silhouette calls her back to him. It pierced right through Tim's belly. He was bleeding but did not scream in pain like crazy. Tim, even becoming a zombie, did not become immortal. He is mortal, as before, only the power to fight, like a warrior with several lives, intoxicates his mind and he does not see the danger in front of him. Seeing a target, he goes to kill it. John now doesn't care who he is. It doesn't matter to him that he is the son of a ruler. John can deal with him as he pleases. Tim can no longer escape from the angry John. Since he is more angry than ever, his intentions no longer have mercy, only the murder of his long-time offender. The long-haired man wants to say the name of his enemy. He wants to whine him, but the virus that has already enslaved his mind has filled his head with fog and his tongue is tangled over and over again. Everyone was already gathered. They stood behind John and watched Tim's execution. Clint was with everyone and it was unclear what John would do to him for his initiative. An ideal warrior, without fear of death, without feeling pain, he does not care about enemy attacks. He will always attack the enemy until he becomes a corpse. Tim rushes at John again. Not a single blow will teach him that John is much stronger than any dead man. Every dead man can only strive for his strength. John was well aware of his strength and grunted at every arrogant attack by Tim to mock him. He again begins his show-off speech, which sincerely will never mean anything to him. Everything is decided for Tim. He would have taken his life in any case, even if he had not become a dead man. Tim's rage knew no bounds. He had experienced too much in such a short period of time to leave this world without taking any of his offenders with him. Even here, John is trying to humiliate Tim. He cannot send Tim to the next world without further ado, as a righteous warrior who did not die for revenge against his brothers. John's words again plunge Tim into memories. Again he sees the old silhouette of his main enemy. Then for Tim, it was golden time. He could do whatever he wanted with John. Tim did all this to prove his superiority. He beat John in order to show his power and strength, as if everything was under his control. If he said so, it would be done in the near future. John fell over and over again, but got up and continued to mock Tim's strength, since he understood what motivates Tim when he does such things. Whether Tim was angry, he beat John. Whether he was cheerful and joyful, he beat John. He was not in a certain mood. The main thing is that John's face was ready to take a few more blows. All this so that John would independently recognize his strength in order to assert himself in front of others and rise above John. But John is not a simpleton. He grabs his impudent hand and squeezes it rather weakly, but his intentions to break it were too strong. He called Tim a weakling and the scoundrel's face immediately changed. He literally froze from such impudence, since hardly anyone had dared to say such a thing to him before. The hero recognized his strength, he believed that Tim was strong and his health was excellent, but only one nuance did not give him unlimited power. The nuance is his cowardice, which he wants to compensate by humiliating the weaker. Even if John has the same health, he can become hundreds of times stronger than Tim, and this amazed the bully. He was shocked that his willpower was so strong. Tim was already tired of listening to his every impudent word. He wanted to squeeze it between his teeth and crush it. John's self-confidence infuriated Tim. He prepared his fist for another but more powerful blow. Since that time, both have changed a lot. As John said, he became hundreds of times stronger than Tim. Tim became a dead man. Only he remained at the same level as before. 
The main character does not even give a chance to win. Tim can take blows like a punching bag that cannot respond. Tim was confident that he would easily defeat everyone in his new guise, but remained disappointed because he understood that he would die at the hands of the one whom he had always towered over. John didn't even give him the opportunity for a break. Tim no longer had any salvation. He had lost his last hope of victory, since you had to be lucky to become a rival for John. One more blow, which will not be the last, but one day one of the subsequent ones will still send Tim to another world and hammer nails into the lid of his coffin. John, even before Tim's death, tries to teach him something as if his words even mean anything. Tim was already completely destroyed. His whole face was beaten, his gums were flying out, and blood was flowing like a fountain. John believes that only Tim is self-confident here, only he fights at the expense of his willpower, at the expense of his pride. He is too strong for Tim, just one blow sent Tim flying. In the clouds of dust, Tim's face is still visible, which seems to be asking John to hit him, which really wants to take a couple of blows. The character does not resist his desire, and with every step gets closer to Tim in order to finish him off. Tim spat blood. He no longer had the strength to stand up and fight back John, only despair in front of this world. Fate punished him for everything he had done. Now he is destined to die at the hands of his main rival. He was shaking. He was growling like a monster, but John would not be bothered by his pitiful appearance and would not force him to show compassion. Tim, even in the guise of a zombie, began to see danger in front of him. His eyes spoke for themselves. John said that Tim was very tired. He was tired because it was quite hard to take, but he had already taken a person's life. Tim cannot come to terms with all this. John understood all this well, but spoke with a certain mockery in order to finish off all the moral readiness to fight in him. John slammed Tim hard into the front of the car. He was already trying to get up and prepare to fight back. He growled in response to John. He was very angry with him, but more like an animal he fought for territory. John doesn't even allow Tim to stand up. It's too much for Tim to even get to his feet. John remembered everything, everything that happened to him, how all the survivors treated him. When he beat John, John remembered all this, and it greatly ate Tim's heart. John explains to Tim that he, having so many good friends, the one he loves, kind parents, received nothing but hatred. His beloved, who always refused him, called him arrogant, which is why she didn't love him. Meg always hides behind the backs of our beauty and her friend. For her, she is not a criminal back and for good reason. He did not receive any warmth from all those who praised him, all his faithful friends, loving parents, and so on. Tim ordered John to shut up. He was ready to kill him, but John's leg pressed him hard against the car. According to Tim, John does not understand anything. Everything he says is real nonsense for him, but he is right. Since John does not know his entire life, he does not know what kind of life fate has prepared for Tim. Yes, he had a loving mother who constantly played with him in his childhood. He received the warmth that John spoke about. And Tim had sunny days in his life, and he could feel it all, and his smile shone brighter than the sun in the sky. But no matter how hard Tim tried to hold on to these sensations, they went away and closed the door with a roar. All the good memories were shattered, like a photo in a frame. All these memories for Tim meant only pain, as if these pieces of glass were sitting deep in his head. Well, in the end, everything he tried to protect, everything he tried to hold on, left him. Everything was meaningless. A certain sheet fell, an important document that could mean a lot, but there was nothing good about it. Tim's mother was crying. That paper brought a lot of grief into her life. Tim understood this well. He approached his mother, collected all her tears with his finger. He tried to calm her down and keep her closer to him, so that she would not be completely desperate. She hugged him. Everything seemed to be fine. He tried to calm her down and she reciprocated. Moreover, tears from her cheeks flowed down onto his shoulders. But what she said completely killed Tim. She regretted that he was born into this world and these words hurt the most. That's why Tim became so cruel. John will never understand the pain of betrayal. He is nothing like Tim. Even if his family was powerful, there was nothing good about it. Tim makes it clear that John will never be able to find a common language with him. Since he was not betrayed, even the pain of loss will be weaker than betrayal. But even John was able to envy Tim in some ways, yet even John lacked something and had to resort to envy. Tim was amazed by his words. He couldn't believe that John didn't have what he had. 
As insufferable as Tim was, he had truly best friends who became real brothers to him. From John's words, Tim doesn't feel any better. Before his death, he has to remember the silhouettes of his brothers. They shone against a brilliant background. Their smiles were warmer than any sensations that Tim could get in his entire life. Will, who was the first to give his life for his elder, his younger brother, who made a promise that they would always be brothers. Tim was bursting. He was trembling after such warm memories, since he had lost everyone and all because of a harsh fate that took away a lot of valuable things from many people, from millions of people. John did not stop reminding Tim about his friends. He wanted to teach him something a second before his death. But John tried to convey to him that he himself killed his friends. All his brothers died through his fault, but it was also his fault that they lived to this day. He destroyed his brothers. Now his brothers will destroy him. He is destined to die one day with them, and apparently he cannot avoid this. They attacked him without any thought. They were ready to kill him, even if he was their best friend, older brother, and boss. The whole gang attacked Tim with shouts and screams. No one in front of them saw their own brother. Everyone saw prey that needed to be killed immediately. Tim tried to push them away, but the three of them would easily prevail over one exhausted dead man. He is again sent back to memories of warm days, of carefree times when they could create anything until their youth ended. One of the sixes did not progress and received friendly ridicule from friends. Their smiles shone brighter than the garlands on the holiday tree. That was the warmth that warmed Tim and gave him hope. They always smiled at him, were always happy to see him, and even when he was angry with them, the bros tried to please him. But Tim didn't hesitate to smile and was happy to smile back at his gang of hooligans. They promised each other that they would become stronger in their hobby. But Tim was worried about one thing. He thought that they hated him. Each of them made smiles that even then showed fangs. There was also a lot of unhappiness around Tim. Even the rich and wealthy can be unhappy. That's how harsh this world is. Tim's mother was sobbing and bowing to something. She complained that only the poor and weak could be unhappy, but everything turned out to be completely different. While she bowed to the majestic statue, Tim silently looked at it all. Everything around him betrayed Tim. His devoted friends are now devouring him. He was constantly hiding behind their backs, and now they are devouring him from behind. Pain enveloped Tim's eyes. He could not do anything with his emotions. Nothing. Everyone around him left him alone, no matter how hard he tried to protect him. The girl he loved, whom he compared to a spring field, the beauty to whom he was drawn also turned away from him. His eyes closed, but from Alice he only received coldness. Even the frosty winter did not bring him such frosty burns. Tim admired her. He always tried to get her attention. Even in a joint hobby, he craved her response. He stretched out his hands to her to ask for help to get to his feet, and she still offered her hand. He clearly lost more than once. She remembered this with an attempt to humiliate him and say that she would no longer train with him. In order to spend more time with her, he wanted a rematch, as he wanted to defeat her and prove that he was capable of something. He was very worried about such a conversation, since she is the true love of his life. He named it after the cherry tree, which meant its endless beauty, which must be preserved forever. Tim asked Alice to become his friend until he defeated her, and all only because he was given to his beloved with all his heart. His heart was captivated by her beauty. But besides... Her thorns did not allow him to approach her. Alice was outraged. She didn't like Tim's proposal, and she definitely didn't agree with him. Tim was very embarrassed. He expected responsiveness from her, but he clearly had very, very little chance. As expected from a non-criminal beauty, she asked him to be smarter and not ask such stupid questions anymore. He was afraid of being rejected, but time after time he tried to find a way to get close to her, but everything was in vain for him but she was too cruel with him. Her gaze cut deep holes in him, which was imprinted on his soul. Her next refusal hit him right in the heart, as if lightning had touched him and sent millions of volts through him. Alice left him and didn't even say goodbye. That's how harsh love can be, since a loved one can heal any wound, but also make it open even more. She looked at how Tim was being devoured. It is unknown whether she felt guilty for those actions. Her gaze was empty, she may have been struck by the cruelty with which they ate him, but she could not come up and help. Tim's pain knew no bounds. His mother betrayed him. His friends ate him. 
and his beloved did not even give him a chance to show himself. Tim was initially pushed into a corner. He was always lonely, and he lost all the loved ones to whom he devoted his soul. Now he too had fallen. Blood was dripping from his hands. He was to blame for what he had done, but he could not do otherwise. Everything around him stood against him. Everyone looked at such a spectacle. Everyone froze in place after Tim was torn to pieces by a crowd of his own bros. A real tragedy. Everything in the world was proportional. In appearance, he is a real villain. But what led him to this? Whether he wanted it or fate was so cruel that it did this to him. John grabbed Alice. He wanted to calm her down, as he probably felt anxiety on her part. He suggested that she get out of here and get ready to leave this damn place. She had no face, as if she was hiding something, and besides, she simply nodded her head with an air of agreement. Clint was about to climb inside the bus, but decided to turn his gaze in their direction. While he was glaring at them, someone growled from the entrance, which couldn't mean anything good. Clint turned towards the source of the sound. Something really bothered him. Had some of the passengers already transformed? The fears were confirmed. The same boy who suffered from the virus the most had already turned into a zombie and was ready to eat his first victim. Clint began to understand that the situation was very bad for him and no one knew whether anyone could save him. John immediately cast his gaze in their direction, whether he was ready to help Clint after everything he had done or whether there was no mercy for him. Another couple of centimeters and Clint is destined for death in the guise of a zombie. The baby monster is already flying at Clint and he can only fall down. His gaze reflected nothing but fear, sweat dripping from his face and a terrifying atmosphere of hopelessness that surrounded Clint. Incredibly, the mother still decides to help her son after so much time, the maternal instinct and conscience awoke in her. She grabs the child by the t-shirt and his short flight towards Clint ended unsuccessfully. Clint fell down. His mother managed to save him. At least once she somehow helped her son, pulled him out of trouble and put herself in danger of death. A trembling ran through him. Opening his eyes with heaviness, he turned his attention to the mother who first saved his life. Clint was greatly struck by the fact that no one except his mother rushed to his aid. Even John, who took the arrow upon himself, stood aside. Mother held this little demon with all her might. It is unknown what could have happened to Clint if his mother had not. Even the boy was amazed that someone could stop him. He opened his mouth wide and drooled while his mind grew cloudy. A real nightmare in the body of a child, he turned his head in the opposite direction, and with his smile instilled horror in his mother, his eyes burned with the flames of death and nightmare. This is no longer the baby as before. Now he is an insane machine for killing and spreading the virus. There is no longer any humanity left in him. Finally, it dawned on her. She saved him at the cost of her life. She was able to prove her love for her son. She tried to reach him with her bloody hand in order to get approval from him. She said Clint's name. Her hand reached out to him, but the shock enslaved Clint and could not release him from the bonds and leave him alone. Contradictions began to play in his head. He could not believe that his mother could save him, but before his eyes, everything was completely different. Mother was reaching out to him, but the boy hanging around her neck prevented her and Clint from getting close to each other. Blood flew in different directions. John tore the child from her neck, but it was unlikely that she could be saved. She fell straight onto the cold ground, and she didn't even have time to say goodbye to her son and apologize for everything she didn't have time to do. John grabbed the child's neck tightly. He whined and floundered, but nothing would stand against him. John began to push harder to stop this little monster from infecting even bigger people. Clint helped his mother, but it's unlikely that anyone will help her. Only seeing her off to the next world with all honors will be real help. She tried to say something to Clint, but he couldn't understand a word, and silently stood opposite the future corpse of his mother, and now he was very afraid for her death. Mother apologized to him, it took her a lot of time to prove her love and care. It was not easy for her when her son was wounded before her eyes, when they tried to cut out his dignity. Clint wasn't cold or scared, but his trembling. It was due to a misunderstanding how his mother saved him. When she became so kind, all these questions made his head spin. Clint made the biggest mistake, but he wanted to correct John's mistakes. But now he has to keep the burden of guilt on his irresponsible shoulders until the end of time. His hands were shaking. 
but he still tried to close the bleeding wound, yet he couldn't help her. All his hopes were in vain. He puts a lot of pressure on the wound. Will this help her? Of course not. The virus will soon spread throughout the body and enslave it. Otherwise, she will die the death of a mother who was able to atone for her debt, was able to protect her son from inevitable death. She said goodbye to him for a reason. She thus said goodbye to Clint once and for all, but he no longer wanted this. The soul was already leaving her body. The tears were drying on her cheeks, but now she was able to repay the debt that had been returning for too long. Clint was ordering her to stop acting like she was before. Again, she wants to just walk away and leave him all alone. She was bleeding. Death was already looking her straight in the eyes. All that remained was to cut off her head with a swing of her scythe. Fifteen years ago, Clint extended his hand in the same way when he asked for help, but no one gave him a ladder to rise from this abyss. The pain was insane, but the mother did not even touch her child then, yet both parents are guilty of what they did. She languidly said his name as if she wanted the trash father not to hear anything unnecessary, and she could save her son while he was not looking. The hands were almost joined, but the scum of society decided to intervene even at this moment when his son needed help. The trash wanted to drink after everything that this freak had done, and he also incited his mother to run him for another bottle, which she was not happy about. He is a real psycho, because even now he accuses the innocent Clint of nothing, who became a victim of the unfortunate torture of the perverted ruler. The mother did not have her say in this house what kept her from taking and driving this scum and spendthrift out the door. Why couldn't she help her only son? So she left him again. He was left alone again. While the blood dried on his outfit, his mother ran for a drink. He remembered how she didn't even touch him back then and was very angry with her, but today he can finally forgive her. She had already completely reincarnated and continued to apologize to him, but still she died with pride that she was able to atone for her sins. Then she didn't understand what it felt like when you needed help, and a loved one ran away in fear in order to survive. Now her son abandoned her, left her at the mercy of Fatim and gave her to the dead to die, but now she extended her hand and expected help. Her hands were shaking and bleeding. She tried to reach her son, but it was too late for an apology and everything else, only death awaited her. Clint shouted at the top of his voice that no one would have wanted to die for his place then. No one would have stood up for him and covered his back. She was still sobbing. The pupils disappeared from her eyes, only terrifying bloody streaks and an empty look. Even her mind was leaving her. Then Clint just needed a warm hand just to grab hold of support, just to give that warmth that was taken from him, but even then he didn't get it. Clint's tears flowed like a river. It was impossible to describe the emptiness in his soul, how many seas of tears he had accumulated. He could have cried days and nights to pour out every drop. He wanted her to simply learn from other mothers, become like them, so that he could boast to his friends what a good mother he had. Now he cannot let her die. His heart does not give such an opportunity. He cannot lose the one with whom he just established contact. He could not say goodbye to the one who saved his life in exchange for her own. John sees how much bad weather Clint has endured. Only his parents are to blame for his character. Not only did they not give him enough, they shed his blood before his eyes. They left in his head the image of his parents as maniacs. The boy greatly bothered John. Even his sighs did not frighten the boy. As he attacked thoughtlessly, all his actions were based on the virus, strong aggression and insane rage, the virus was to blame. John has already decided to kill him, but otherwise his recovery cannot be achieved, there is no way to save him. He finally squeezed his neck, the boy is dead, now his soul can calmly go to the heavenly nursery. It can't be, the dead man was not alone on the bus. Apparently all the passengers had already turned into zombies and became slaves to the virus. John threw the imp at another dead man, and he should do something before everything reaches the point of absurdity. He ordered everyone not to approach and stay away from the bus. John was very angry at the whole situation and was ready to vent his anger on everyone. He tore the bumper off the bus and was probably preparing it for a severe thrashing by the walking dead. The others shouted after him, but out of anger, John didn't even hear a single voice. No one could reach him. A certain plan crept into John's head on how to finish everyone off at once, so that the dead would not have a chance to get out of the bus alive. Fuel and short circuit, everything is ready for mass arson. The genocide of a bus full of the dead is ready for action. 
The flame blazed. Now all the sinners who sold their souls for a piece of dead man's meat are burning in the hellish flames of Inferno. Everyone looked at the fire and regretted that they had relatives and friends there, whom everyone treasured greatly. One can only envy John's ingenuity, but still they lost two vehicles, and yet they still need to get to the city. Some had their mothers burned before their eyes, others had their wives and acquaintances. It's a pretty terrible sight when your mother burns alive in agony. They shouted the names of the dead, and in the fire only their ashen silhouettes were visible, burning before the eyes of their loved ones, relatives, and significant others. John began to be accused of burning their relatives. The survivors considered him a madman who decided to commit genocide, but they did not understand one thing that they were to blame for all this. John pointed out to them that they are the madmen. They are the ones who do not understand what they have done, since the entire bus is filled with the dead, and the only way out for John is to burn everyone in the flames. It seems that he understood what John was talking about. He understood his guilt, which was hidden precisely in him. There and only their guilt lies like a stone on their souls. It is the survivors who are guilty of destroying each other. Everyone here killed their relatives. He understood what his fault was. He knew that zombies could not be eaten. He knew that he could not feed anyone. He saw how Tim and his gang collected zombie meat and could not resist the temptation. The guy said that he gave his mother very little, a small piece, because he thought that she would die. But John listened to everything with a saddened face. They began to understand their guilt. They grabbed their heads and began to sob. No one could hold back their tears. Some lost too many relatives. Many lost children, mothers, wives, and many other relatives. No one could believe their death. Everyone apologized to their relatives for their mistake. The bus was blazing with an orange flame. All the dead were burning to the bones, smoldering in the wind like a cigarette. Their loved ones were burning, and with every second their despair became stronger. It devastated them from the inside and made them hollow. John and the girls were already leaving. They no longer had transport. They had nothing else. They only had each other. John approached Clint. He was killed in all plans. He made a bunch of mistakes. Although with the desire to correct them, he took the lives of half the crew, killed his own mother in order to save his life. The zombie friend looked at Clint with pity. He was silent and watched as his mother choked on blood, and Clint shed one tear after another. He finished her off with an umbrella and sent her to another world, where she would be destined to meet her beloved husband. Clint's gaze was indifferent to everything. There was nothing in his eyes. He understood that John could easily abandon him, leave him alone to fend for himself. But still he asked this question. Clint clearly wanted to stay with John. He asked him if John would continue to be with him, if they would continue their journey. John was very angry with Clint. His intention was not to kill him, but he definitely deserved punishment. John grabbed Clint by the collar but was silent. He was silent for a long time. He had no words to describe his action, to explain to this fool what and how. Clint couldn't stand his silence. He stopped when John pushed him. All his actions were aimed only at getting an answer. Will he leave him or will he take him and ask him for all the mistakes? All these questions were circling in his head. There was no limit to his desire. John remained silent and silent, and Clint made the situation worse and worse with his annoying questions, but still tried to get answers out of him. John was already on the edge. His teeth were bearing at him. He was ready to growl at him and swallow him so that there would be no sound from him, so that he could not create unnecessary problems with his childish head. Our zombie friend yelled at Clint so that he should finally stand up and stop acting like a child, so that he would stop considering himself so special that everyone should bow to him. Clint's stupidity continued as he cried and tried to force an answer out of John, refusing to follow him. Clint has already fallen too low. He cannot let John go. He begged and whined on his knees for him to forgive everything. He banged his head against John and poured out his endless reserves of tears. His prayers had no end, and all just for the sake of John taking him with him. Clint killed his mother even if he blamed himself. It doesn't change anything because of his fault many people died. If he had not distracted John, if he had not gone so far, they could still have been saved. He blamed his entire behavior on his fear, the fear that made him run away from his mother, the fear that made him take the lives of those people. Someday John will get tired of all this. Someday he will send Clint far away where he won't have to look after people and lead them. 
Meanwhile, the bus went out. Ashes and smoke rose into the sky along with the ashes of the victims who died the death of the Vikings. The terrifying silhouettes of some still looked out the windows and left a shiver on the skin, as if a nightmare had escaped into the real world. People stopped crying and sobbing. Their tears would not put out the fire, would not bring everything back, and at least these tears would not even reach their relatives. John was already tired of listening to Clint's nonsense. He understood his motives, but earlier he had already helped people become more useful. They stopped being a burden, but Clint was itching for something. John had no face, no reason to rejoice. It was the most painful thing for him to lose so many people, since he had sacrificed too much to save them. He pulled his hand away from Clint. He had become a real burden for him today. All of John's efforts were in vain, and all because of one mistake Clint made. The zombie's friend explains to Clint that no matter how much he tries to understand him, they are completely different. No matter how much effort John puts in, Clint doesn't care about them. He was very angry. He understood that Clint didn't trust him, but he didn't understand why, why he couldn't trust him, why he couldn't be patient. Now John's patience has come to an end. He is already at the limit. Since Clint speaks only about his problems, only they worried him. Everyone around him did not matter to him. He didn't understand why Clint was doing all this. John made a promise that he would protect everyone. He made a promise that he would take them to the city. But why did everything have to be ruined after going such a long way? And then Alice entered the conversation. Now it's clear why she was silent when Clint conceived this plan, and all because the city did not exist in the first place. Alice's words completely killed Clint. She clearly said too much. She began to reveal Clint's real intentions. She began to show the dark side of Clint's coin. Alice told John everything, all her hidden intentions. He came up with everything in advance that he would take everyone to the city. But it was all misinformation. John was struck by Alice's words. He could not have expected this from Clint, since he trusted him with all his heart, and he had already bypassed him twice and everyone at once. From his reaction, everything was clear. She said everything straight to the point, but he himself trusted her and told her all his intentions. And he planned all this in order to take everyone not to the city, but to the enemy's lair, so that more people would gather around him who could cover him. Alice angered him so much that he expressed everything he thought about her. He made fun of her mother and even brought up her family in conversation, which John definitely would not tolerate. Clint is also not going to remain silent. He pointed out that Alice behaved in the same way. She was silent in order to stay with John more often. Even her beloved fell for this offer. Even her greed took over her mind and forced her to go for it, to go for falsehood and carry out Clint's plan. She also began to feel guilty. Clint revealed her intentions. Everyone around turned out to be liars. Clint didn't expect such a betrayal, since they were both at a disadvantage to talk about their intentions, but Alice was still faster than him. He is already crossing the boundaries of what is permitted, and soon John will join the conversation and throw in a couple of affectionate words for Clint to keep his mouth shut. Still, John couldn't stand it, and now Clint will also receive the benefits of which he has already acquired enough. Really, Brother Zombie was able to give one easy answer to Clint, one blow in silence, what could be better? John's blow struck Clint with such force he had never received from his only friend, but still without force he does not understand anything. John's clap was so strong that it sent Clint flying and gave him a less than soft landing. John understood that in his rage he also exerted extra force. It seemed that he didn't even want to create a conflict but Clint himself forced it. The brother did not stand aside. He felt guilty and decided to help Clint, since he was truly wrong. Clint threw away his helping hand. Now after this, he doesn't need anyone. John doesn't mean anything to him anymore. The slap was really strong. Blood was flowing from his mouth, and there was a noticeable dent on his cheek. Who is this impudence? Clint can boast of his fearlessness to anyone, since no one dared to spit in John's face in the guise of a dead man. Clint now speaks completely differently. He already hates him more than anyone. What is the parallel in his attitude towards people, when he whines and asks to stay and when he spits in the face and hates with all his heart? He cried but laughed in response to John. From the outside, Clint is two-faced. All his actions are unpredictable. He constantly does whatever he wants. In Clint's opinion, John had achieved nothing except a loving woman and a child to look after. 
Despite John, he says that he has nothing to talk to him about. He believes that no one would ever want to deal with John. Clint thinks correctly, but skeptically, he believes that everyone in this world is trying to get ahead of the other. In pursuit of the dead, you just need to be faster than your friend. John didn't like Clint's thoughts, but he remained silent. He did not interrupt Clint, since he had probably already prepared his answer. But still, Clint didn't understand why he hangs out with weaklings, having such strength. Why doesn't he leave everyone to their fate? John's answer was quite short and clear. Everything he does is because his parents were ordinary people. Clint was amazed by the answer, but he didn't fully understand what John meant, what kind of family he was talking about, what it meant to him. John's parents were ordinary people, like the answer of a small child, but what this answer carries is of real value. Clint will never understand what John tells him about his family, ordinary people who had sincere love, sincere warmth and joy. And Alice was hurt by these words, for John, the death of his parents was a turning point in his life and she understood it well. Still, John's parents became zombies before his eyes. They ate him while he felt everything. But once they smiled brighter than the sun, he could feel their warmth. And the younger sister is also ordinary. How can he abandon such a cutie, even if she is ordinary? How his conscience will allow him to deprive her of attention? Alice, his beloved, is also an ordinary person. What could make John leave her halfway? All those people whom he has protected so far are also ordinary people. Each of them is ordinary. And now how to come to terms with the fact that they will no longer exist, as well as with the death of their parents, will regret it for the rest of their lives. That includes Clint himself, who himself made John feel special. Aren't they all simple people? Each of them is ordinary, but John, by the call of his conscience, cannot leave them. He is the only person among them all. Everyone understands that in order to live in comfort, one must become stronger, but still the strongest bear the most responsibility. In the first half of my life, when everything was normal, when the end of the world did not come, John was constantly beaten until he bled by Tim and his gang. He could never fight back even one of them, and he never had a chance to compete with the crowd. While he was being beaten, he could not respond with anything, and the only way to emerge victorious was an insidious trick. His eyelids opened with heaviness, his strength left him, and any minute he could find himself in the world of dreams. Tim and his six were truly cruel. As they beat him until his fists bled, it was clear that this brought them incomparable pleasure. Tim's smile was very sinister, but John couldn't do anything to him. It was all because of his connection and his father. Even Tim himself said that John should not come up with anything unnecessary and keep his mouth shut, Otherwise, his family would be in serious trouble. John understood the situation he was in. He could not answer anything, since his parents were ordinary people who could not defend themselves in any way. Brother Zombie points out to Clint that he can't even contemplate the idea of leaving someone. The point is not that he can live in complete peace, not that he is destined for an easy and measured life alone. Throughout John's life, there were bright moments. There was happiness and joy, but grief despair and tragedy also found their places. John suppresses anger for a reason. His whole character has its own catch. He endures all this not in vain, but for one purpose. The reason for all this is incredibly simple. There is nothing difficult to understand that John is doing everything for a bright future. After another bullying, interrogations awaited him at home. His parents were eager to find an answer. His little sister constantly looked at all his wounds. They were worried about him. But he couldn't tell the truth. He had to constantly lie and avoid answering so that Tim wouldn't touch them. He was always silent in response to them, but someday they would have suspected something and would have definitely gone out to investigate. Still, they decided to go to school to find out if he was being beaten there, which is exactly the truth. The parents smiled again and wished John all the best, even offering him dinner like real parents. He always wanted to protect them. His lies were a way of protecting them. He always did everything for their benefit. John wanted to protect their warm smiles, their joy and happiness, to watch and even admire their sincere kindness and humanity. All John needs is to protect ordinary and inconspicuous people who, together, like a puzzle, put together a harmonious picture. His words amazed everyone. Everyone was touched by these words. Since the survivors could not hear anything better, everyone expected John to demand benefits from them. These are the values that drive John. 
This is what John sought in order to hammer this into the head of Clint, who always wants to be alone. These bright images for Brother Zombie were the most valuable in his life, and they are truly beautiful. Every smile warmed him more than the hot sun. John simply must see all this again. These bright smiles must flash before him again, which warm to the depths of his soul. Even if he cannot go back to the past, even if everything cannot be returned as before, but happy people who will walk along the alleys and give sunny smiles to this world. Every survivor burst into tears at John's words. No matter how simple they were, they truly touched and warmed everyone around them. John still has hope that there will be a person like him in the world who can find true happiness. People survive only so that the world is ruled not by the dead, but by ordinary people. For John, there is no choice, since wandering around the world completely alone is not at all in his mind. John points out that the death of his mother was very scary for Clint, since they only managed to make peace. This kind of thing kills you inside. Clint won't be able to come to terms with his mother's death after what she did. Finally, Clint's memories began to bring him warmth, and his mother's smile was no exception. It was no longer possible for him to hold back his tears, since he was wrong from the very beginning, but John should have explained this much earlier. The brother fell silent. He was finally able to convey to Clint about real values. Clint refused his words, but his face spoke of something completely different. He was sobbing and well aware of his guilt before everyone. Even if John's words are truth, truth, dogma, it's all meaningless in Clint's opinion. After her death, Mother did not think that she would be able to repent for everything she had done. What is the value after such salvation when you die, having only recently atoned for your debt to your son? John now listened to Clint about how he was alone all the time and never felt any warmth from someone's side. Throughout his entire thorny path, Clint had never experienced such precious happiness. He wiped his tears and said that it would not be difficult for him to continue to remain lonely without any happiness. John grabbed Clint's head between his hair and prepared him for a man's embrace to soothe his soul. A masculine act on John's part, even after everything he had done, he accepted and forgave his mistakes. Even the men were moved to tears, each one poured out streams, rivers, seas of salt water, and yet there was only one serious conversation. Even Leo, an adult doctor, did not stand aside and could not help but shed a tear from such warm words towards all people from one intelligent zombie who has much more humanity. But something suddenly distracted him from all the misfortunes, from everything that happened and from all the warm words. Incredibly, a military helicopter flew over the tops of the mountains. Does this mean that the city is very close? Leo immediately changed his expression. He was very surprised by the sudden appearance of a helicopter on the horizon. Clint and John also paid attention to him. Apparently salvation had overtaken them. They would finally be able to avoid the next bad weather. No zombie could fly a military helicopter. Only a human could save them. The helicopter driver reported to his headquarters that no people were found within a radius of 10 kilometers. Really, a real person who can pull everyone out of this abyss of failure. He requested permission from headquarters for a return flight in order to return to the city. John looked after him to find out in which direction the city and the people who were saved in the same way. No joy was visible on the brother. As if he was already ready for this, he simply calmly dragged his beloved towards the helicopter flight. The survivors immediately forgot about their affairs. They hurried towards the city in order to finally escape. They had traveled too long to get here, lost too many, and finally got there. This is exactly what happiness looks like for survivors of the apocalypse, an oasis in the middle of the desert, real civilization. All roads led to it, and even more so the air route of a helicopter, and now you can breathe a sigh of relief. Everyone got out to the road and were already running, headlong in order to quickly get protection from the city. Everyone rejoiced. Everyone was able to go through this difficult path with blood and sweat. Many left behind the lives of relatives and significant others, but were still able to get closer to salvation. They decided to settle down in a clearing before heading into the city and began to prepare to enter it. Sam pointed to something that struck him so much, he literally began to shine, because in front of him was something that can only give joy. He saw survivors making their way into the city through crowds of military personnel, and everyone was allowed inside. They were screened by the military before entering to ensure they were not infected. Everything around began to shine. All misfortunes were behind us, which means we can celebrate and rejoice with all our hearts. 
Only Clint was not happy about his arrival, and there was only one reason that made him uncomfortable. The ruler of the city was a real freak, and nothing could be expected from him. For an unknown reason, they set fire to the torch, which motivated them even if night fell, it is always possible to find a better source of light. Now everything is clear. A torch is different from a dead man. Zombies are afraid of fire, and this makes it easier for the military to understand who is dead and who is human. And the connection started working. You can immediately see that it is not far from civilization, which means salvation is not far away. The phone caught the signal and it wasn't even a moment's joy, since a smartphone is already an irreplaceable thing in the world. Everything in this world is not just a coincidence. It was not just that he was able to find a phone and this helped him a lot. The guy changed the SIM card in it and it started working again like a Swiss watch. Since the boy did not save anything and even deleted the photographs, he did not have a single photo and not a single memory left. This upset him very much since he had lost everyone and he couldn't remember anything. The zombie brother could understand the survivor since relatives and memories of them are all the most valuable. Joy gave way to sadness. What a fine line there is before these states and how terrible the pain of the absence of memories. John doesn't know why he needed this guy's phone. There is no one to call him. All his relatives are right at his fingertips. The boy could not expect such a request from him, but his conscience would not allow him to refuse. John was ashamed to ask him for something, although he could ask anyone here, but his sense of justice does not allow him to do so. But the young man is not so pitiful and without any pity or greed, this is sincere gratitude. John didn't even expect such a kind reaction from him, since he was sure that it would be much harder to beg for a smartphone from him. But still, the smile indicated that he understood that it was not all over for these people and that future generations could be safe. After such travels, people truly begin to value their own life, and the one who saved it will be a kind of deity for them. The stars shone between the trees and John, who knows why, needed Clint, who probably wasn't expecting him very much. Clint finally noticed his presence and was able to pay attention to him. Clint pointed out to him that he would be going into town, and John knew that better than anyone. John also knows what kind of person was really hiding behind Clint's mask, what his nature was and who he was. From the very beginning, John was right. He was almost always right in any situation. His every word meant the truth, which must be believed without evidence. Clint made it clear to John that he realized that they were completely different. Initially, there was nothing similar about them, and this was not at all pleasing. But John doesn't need boring conversations at all now. In the middle of the conversation, he called Clint's number, and that's why he needs that guy's phone number. Clint was surprised by John's suddenness, Maybe he couldn't have expected John to know his phone number. He asked him to save the number, since now he has a phone and he can call him at any time or report danger. John was alarmed by something in the city. He asked to contact him if something suddenly happened, and this city was the real lair of the main enemy. If Clint ever forgets his number, he can ask the person he was traveling with for it. Clint didn't stop screaming at John's back, but he was unlikely to respond to even one scream. Clint wasn't sure that the city existed, and he couldn't be sure of the safety of all the survivors while they were in the city. He asked to leave him alone and never appear in his life again, but all his emotions spoke of the opposite. He thought completely differently. He understood that John would no longer want to see a man like Clint, would not want to deal with him under any circumstances. Alice and Meg were waiting for John and wanted to get out of here as quickly as possible, so as not to meet again with this pathetic child in the body of an adult. Alice partly felt guilty and that she was also to blame for their separation, since it would be difficult for John to recover from such a betrayal. Clint screamed and screamed, but John did not pay attention to him, like a parent who, when offended, begins to remain silent, giving him the opportunity to understand his guilt himself. John was about to leave without exchanging a few words with Clint. He picked up Alice in order to carry her away from here. Clint kept shouting to attract attention to himself, which could not be won in any way. The brother took his sister by the arm, carried Alice in his arms, and silently left, leaving the horizon. If suddenly the city didn't exist, Clint asked John to take him with him on a big trip where everyone would finally become friends. He stood there for a long time and waited for an answer from Brother Zombie, but he didn't get anything. With each step, they got closer to the horizon and left Clint's horizon without saying anything. Alice decided to turn her gaze to Clint. He was filled with curiosity about what she wanted to see there. 
Suddenly, John stopped. Did he really dare to find the strength to reciprocate Clint's feelings, which means only one thing. They can have many new adventures. Incredibly, John stepped over his pride and allowed himself to give Clint a chance. But will it be as bad as they think? There was some fear in Alice. She turned to him. But it is unknown what bothered her so much. John smiled sweetly back at her and said that they would go look for a new home, which for their entire little family meant only a happy future. Those words touched Alice very much. Salty water flowed down her cheeks. They did not stop flowing down, like a waterfall, the most beautiful waterfall of tears of happiness. She wiped away her tears and sweetly agreed with such an excellent decision, since she was very scared that he might leave her at the end of this path. Meg's joy knew no bounds, and Alice did not know where to go after such a sweet confession. The beautiful moon shed its pale light on people, but the fact that it is full suggests that unexpected events await our heroes. The same wanderer with whom John is still obliged to meet and the one who is somehow connected with the city, and most importantly with the ruler, with Tim's father. That creature was truly terrifying, and it was exactly what Tim called a man. According to the stranger, this monster was very tired and was also badly damaged after some work for some family. The wanderer was looking for someone, and this search brought him a lot of problems, since he would be very angry if he did not find his goal. That creature had human faces on it. That's what scared Tim so much then. It was this monster that was hiding in that mysterious truck. The stranger could talk to this monster and even reacted to its aggression with laughter. If this creature is a side effect of the city's experiments, then what could be waiting for our heroes at the entrance inside? The wanderer noticed nearby that the dead were greedily eating someone but it took him a long time to realize what was going on under his nose. He decided to pay careful attention to them and even got up from his corpse car and rushed towards the zombies. It can't be how lucky he was to once meet a gang and even Tim himself whom they devoured. The wanderer again shows his gigantic strength and it amazes again as he throws two with one kick soaring in zero gravity. Still, he found what he had been looking for for so long. Everything was written before his eyes, like an open book, you can read everything about him. It's not for nothing that the eyes are the mirror of the soul. It seems that even signs of intelligence were able to remain in Tim. Since his eyes were not empty like those of the dead, he could still think. The stranger looked at him clearly and examined him completely from head to toe. The chains and handcuffs in which he is shackled haunt him, and the bandages with which his entire body is tied are even worse. From his cloak he began to pull out a certain photograph, Surely that family would be Tim's family. He brought up the photo and compared the dead man's body with the photo of the one he was looking for, and it would be really bad if Tim was the one he was looking for. All fears were confirmed. The wanderer is directly connected with the ruler, and it is for his family that he works. He still found it, which means Tim still won this battle with John, since he was able to get out of this situation unscathed. It turns out that the stranger had previously known Tim, and yet they had not seen each other for a long time, which is why he almost did not recognize him. They were supposed to see each other for the last time before his birthday. It can't be that the wanderer called Tim his older brother, but Will had been killed a long time ago, and that's exactly what Tim couldn't believe. The younger one asked him to shut up and not piss him off by saying that his brother had been dead for a long time, and that he no longer had any brothers. He didn't want to spoil his good mood, which is why he shut Tim's mouth in advance so that he wouldn't say too much. Good treatment from the Wanderer still needs to be won, so Tim will have to be a good boy to win his love. He pulled the gloves onto his bound hands and confirmed everything by saying that they were still one family. You can't quarrel from the very beginning. First you need to make friends, and later you can quarrel like a child. Initially it is necessary to break off relations with Tim, but for what and why does he need the needle— Will Tim really become part of this united creature? Suddenly, the monster began a dialogue with the Wanderer, and he immediately noticed their intervention. They said something incomprehensible that only this strange stranger could understand, who was unusually strong and had a character unlike anything else. Everyone's faces became too conversational. They seemed to be humming something like an orchestra. The stranger pulled out a thread and a needle, as if he had not prepared them for knitting, or Tim would become his new material. He threaded the needle, which could not mean anything good for Tim, since he would be the next product. He was very scared for his life. 
He didn't even manage to save himself. His father is a real psycho, since he even allows such things to happen to his son. The survivors were already approaching the gates and each had torches, which together shone much better than any lantern. The military man noticed a crowd of people in the darkness in front of him, but torches really helped to see them in such darkness. Leo was responsible for everyone and led and in front, and also accounted for them all. The military man does not lose his vigilance and takes a stance to react to an attack or enemy. The people here are unusual, each equipped with different technologies to analyze their enemies or allies. Apparently they were able to pass the selection, and the passage will be open to them. After all, doctors are very valuable at such a time. Everything in this city is very serious, and at such times you always need to be on alert, and so are the military in the city. The man forwards all the received data and asks for permission to enter to these people. His look is very tired. Could this indicate something bad that is happening in the city? Finally, the gates to the city are open to them and they will be able to escape from the crowds of the dead. Everyone froze in front of the gates, as if they had entered the afterlife, and the guardian of the scales gave them passage to heaven. The watchman let them inside, which would have been real happiness, but something haunted them that creature that worked for the ruler of the city. The survivors did not expect such a simple entrance to the city and froze a little in surprise, since they had experienced a lot during the time they got here. The watchman was tense at this reaction, but Leo calmly decided to finally enter the city. Some were jubilant, others were happy, and some were grateful for the warm welcome. Clint felt uneasy entering the city of someone who mocked him 15 years ago and brought everything to a terrible absurdity. No matter how hard his legs walked, with every step he was closer and closer to the entrance. Still, he could not walk without one zombie friend and constantly turned back to suddenly see him. The others called out to Clint to hurry up and enter the gate faster, otherwise it might be too late. Still, he hoped that he and John would still be able to meet. But would everything be so bright and colorful in such a civilization? It was very difficult for Clint to enter this place, and every step was harder as if he were chained to the car and dragging it on his hump. The full moon did not say anything good. There was complete distrust of the city due to strange incidents with the wanderer and the ruler. Transferred to John and the girls, John still cannot forget Clint, and from time to time he remembered him and everyone else. Alice made the right point. If Clint doesn't write, that means everything is fine, for now. Meg understood that John was lonely without Clint, and just asked him a question on this topic. There was never a drop of self-interest visible in her eyes, and her smile was always the most sincere. She hit the bull's eye with her question. John missed Clint greatly, his whining and everything that was in him. Even if the question was a tricky one, John was not angry with Meg. If another person had been in her place, he would have reacted the same way. He pointed out that Clint had already chosen his future path, which meant only one thing, everything would be fine. Our zombie brother was worried that he might have taken his girls with him in vain, since the city could have been much better. And suddenly John turned his attention to Alice, and still understood that she had no other choice but to lie so that John would not leave them in the city. Alice will not allow John to leave them, even if he is not eager to take them with him. They will not care about his decision or who he is. Stupid John was still conflicted about this, and it bothered him greatly. Alice is much stronger than all of John's enemies, since she can stop John with one movement of her finger, which she often uses so that John does not say too much. In her opinion, people long for a new life in order to lose and forget about the old sufferings that torment with their presence at the present time. Alice's words amazed John, now both are able to throw around beautiful words. Having lost a loved one, people begin to look for a replacement in order to lose the pain of loss but they have not yet been able to lose John, so they are not going to look for a replacement. Her sincere smile is much more pleasing than her absence, and until this moment John may not have realized this. Appearance is not important to her. What is important to her is that, having become so strong and powerful, John remained himself, without changing his priorities. She pointed out to him that he couldn't forget the past, so why should they forget about it? They should continue to cherish happy moments and come to terms with the bad ones and throw them out of their heads so that they don't interfere with their life now. Our brother couldn't say a word. He was amazed by Alice's kindness. He froze like a stone, and she caressed him so that he would calm down and live as he is. 
Eli was confident in her abilities and could definitely protect him from all dangers, John was behind a stone wall. Together they made plans to raise Meg as if they were their daughter, which she was very, very happy about. Even if they can't have children because of John's body, our beauty doesn't see anything wrong with that. John was confident in his abilities, and everything would have worked out for him, and everyone believed in him that way. Any minute now she will laugh with all her soul like a child. As expected, John has become himself. She is good at calming him down and distracting him from unnecessary thoughts. After such a shame, John felt ashamed for a long time, and the girls added fuel to the fire with their laughter. Still, we were transported to a majestic city with an ill-fated ruler. The survivor set foot somewhere, and nothing foreshadowed trouble. Everything even turned out very well. Still, someone was watching them, and it turned out that there were two people missing from that crowd, and it was Alice and Meg. Incredibly, the ruler and his subordinate discuss all this and remember that those people will be food for some livestock. Everything was terrible. Tim's father was a real madman and his son was not far off. Even such a businessman was forced by something to get up from his chair and go to the cameras to look at one handsome man whom they had not seen for a long time. Even after so much time, he did not forget about him and waited a long time to admire his beloved boy again. Even now he considered him handsome. His mad love for children was terrible. It was not for nothing that he did such vile things as his son. The ruler saw a lot of energy and sensitivity in his eyes. All this made his animal instincts awaken. Clint is like a barrel of wine, only becoming sweeter over the years, and only this pervert has such feelings for him. He wanted to see something, to see something that over time interested him even more. He wanted to know the reaction of the weak animal who had lived in the darkness for a long time, and he would plunge it there again. The guard opens the gate for the survivors, and apparently the feeding has already begun. The worst is for dessert. The crack in the gate emitted a strong light, and it was this light that Tim's father was talking about. The gap became wider and wider. The light became very strong, what was stored behind these doors. All the people were blinded to the point of burning in their eyes, and no one could see anything in the rays of this radiance. Smoke dispersed throughout the room. According to the ruler, the people's reaction would be darker than he could have thought. They had broken through all his perverted expectations. Leo was in shock for a reason. He was scared. He didn't understand what was looking out of that door. It was a real nightmare, the likes of which they had never seen before, one that could destroy all hope for the further development of civilization. This is the real horror in everyone's life. The white chalk circle on the floor will not save you from this. Such evil spirits, which were kept locked up, will reap all the survivors any minute. Clint was petrified. Did he really not expect to see something like this? Although, yes, he had never seen anything like this. This is a real horror for him. The reaction was truly gloomy. This is what kind of cattle our ruler has. This madman turned out to be an experimenter, like Tim. This is exactly what he wanted to see. Such a reaction was priceless to him. He laughed evilly, like the main villain. Yet the city turned out to be the lair of the enemy of humanity, who wanted to achieve immense power through experiments. Millions of people had already fallen into his trap. Each one was given over to be devoured by the dead, and he considered each one a naive friend. At the same time, John was putting Meg to bed. She finally went to bed. Clint didn't call them. Everything was calm for them, but that creature that stuck its hand out of the gate gave no rest. While their friends and acquaintances are dying, they just want to have fun when their little sister lies very nearby. They have almost touched their lips. Finally, everything is fine with them. They are together, and everyone is happy. But suddenly they are already interrupted for the second time, but still John calls Clint and calls them to his place. The brother raises the smartphone closer to him and realizes that his fears have been confirmed. It can't be. Clint is in complete danger and he urgently needs help. John already needs to hurry. They were put into a cage and perhaps they will soon be experimented on or simply sent to feed the dead. They fell straight into a trap. John himself put everyone's lives at risk and also almost set up his girls. The dead were already greedily reaching for their future food. Their number was amazing. They had clearly been collecting them here for a long time. He is completely satisfied with his actions. A real villain who made everyone understand how harsh the world is in the apocalypse and how no one can be trusted. But it's too late to say anything. 
John and Alice were already preparing to flee without helping their comrades, since they promised them that they would get them out of any trouble. The shadow of the city, a cruel father, a tyrant ruler, a pervert with a terrible character and a madman when he was appointed to the post of ruler of the city, no one thought about anything. The saviors of this city have already arrived and are ready to administer their justice in it.